Good afternoon. In compliance with Chapter 551 of the Texas Government Code, I call to order an information session, board meeting, information board meeting, I should say, of the Board of Trustees of the Austin Independent School District for Thursday, April 14, 2022, at 5.38 p.m. A quorum of the board is physically present at AISD Central Office to conduct this meeting. Board, board meetings are open to the public based on space availability to ensure social distancing and the health and safety of our community and staff. This meeting is streaming live on AISD TV and Apple TV. It is also being broadcast on cable channel 22 through Spectrum Grande and on channel 99 through AT&T UVerse. Closed captioning in English is available on these platforms for individuals who are deaf or hard of hearing. To our audience tuning in remotely and here in person, welcome and thank you for joining us. We will move to the approval of the agenda. Secretary Singh, do you have a motion to approve the agenda? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Having a motion by Secretary Singh and a second by Trustee Anderson to approve the agenda, all those in favor, please raise your right hand. And the motion passes by all those on the dais. Secretary Singh, will you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance and the Pledge to the Texas Flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Honor the Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to thee, Texas, one state, under God, one and indivisible. Thank you, board members. Next is an opportunity for the public to share comments with the board. This time allows speakers to comment publicly on any topic of their choosing. We have time for up to 60 speakers. And as a reminder, the district continues to provide time during the regular voting meetings of the board to hear from the public about agenda items for consideration and vote. This is an opportunity for the board to take part in active listening. While we wish we could respond or provide feedback, we are required to limit our questions to requests for clarification or follow up directly to the administration. Members of the public wishing to participate in the public comment portion of our meeting called the dedicated AISD phone line in advance of the meeting to audio record their remarks. We will now play the recorded messages for public comment, so please listen carefully. Good evening, Dr. Ellis Alde and Board of Trustees. I'm a PE teacher here in Austin ISD. I'm calling about agenda item 4.2, the proposed changes to elementary planning time. I want to urge the board to consider the implications this would have on students' educational experience, especially in regards to space and safety. We've been told if there isn't space that we should get with our principals to find it. That is not a solution, especially for older and overcrowded campuses. Most campuses will have to utilize outdoor space. So what does that mean on days of the year when air quality is bad, it's raining, or too hot or too cold? That would mean 90 to 135 kids in the gym at the same time, and you can't have safe PE classes like that. Please listen to educator concerns about this proposed change as we are the ones who know how it may negatively affect student learning and safety. Thank you. Good evening, Dr. Elizalde and the Board of Trustees. My name is Megan Vasquez, and I am the proud PE teacher at Becker Elementary, a member of Education Austin, and a product of the district. I am calling about agenda item 4.2, the proposed changes to elementary planning time. I want to urge the board to consider the implications this would have on students' educational experience and their safety. Austin ISD has a phenomenal essential areas program that should be protected at all costs. Our values as a district are to provide a safe, equitable, inclusive, and high quality learning experience for all. 45 to 1 is not safe, not conducive to high quality learning, not appropriate for early childhood ages, and not feasible given our gym sizes. We are sounding the alarms because we are the educators who are on the ground and we know the damage that will inevitably occur if this proposal gets implemented. Our students will be the ones who ultimately will lose and they deserve better. Public education has the power to transform lives. Let's work together to create a more engaging, equitable, safe, and whole child educational experience for all AIC students by finding another solution for teacher planning. Thank you for your urgent attention to this matter. 
Hi, my name is Nicole. I am the parent of a Barton Hills third grader and kindergarten class. And um, I received a disturbing email that the art and music would be cut down to one day per week and PE could be combined with up to 60 kids. Um, obviously, that's concerning and very unsafe for a PE class to have a kindergartner with a fifth grader, um, even a third grader and fifth grader. I feel like the age and size difference is a little big and too much for one teacher to handle. Um, the art and music is very concerning to me because I'm an artist, a painter. My husband is a musician. Um, those are our children's two favorite classes in school and often is supposed to be focused around the arts and it's known for it. So um, if they want to introduce maybe some other extracurricular activities to ensure kids are doing things daily, obviously there's off-site, but um, maybe they introduce some team sports, which I find strange that they don't have. Maybe it's because it's elementary, but maybe some basketball, maybe some baseball program. My name is Bill McCamley. I'm a registered voter at and I would like to register a public comment for the meeting thanking the superintendent sincerely and deeply for the proposal to put $2 million in the budget for equity. It is so vitally important that every student in our community has the opportunity to participate in the wide, diverse amount of things available. And a lot of times, um, poor students just don't have it. So giving them the resources to be in a podcasting club or go on a field trip or any of the number of things available to them will lead to better students and, as a consequence, a better community overall. Thank you for listening, and thank you, Superintendent, for including this in the budget. Um, I think we can all agree that elementary teachers need more planning, but the problem is at what cost? The proposed cuts to art and music to just one weekly for just 60 minutes um, and also call for grade level PE every day is not the right answer. While daily PE would have great health benefits, ASE elementary gyms were not built to accommodate, were not built to accommodate such large sizes. At this point, they can accommodate only single class sizes, not an entire grade level. It's not a safe environment to engage in meaningful physical activity. Instead, the kids will just leave off and not get any physical activity done during that time. Our Austin ISD students deserve a well-balanced education that values overall safety and nurtures the whole child. That means getting art and music more than once a week. AISD needs to implement a solution that is equitable to all teachers, including essential area teachers and students. I really appreciate you listening to me and um, thank you for your urgent attention in this matter. Thank you. I, I'm in kindergarten, I'm a five years old. And I like the library because I have books and toys. Make sure to respect the library. My name is Lily Skillen and I'm an AISD librarian. Last week was National Library Week. Do you know what Austin ISD got our librarians for National Library Week? Job cuts at the Library and Media Center. Cuts at the LMC are much closer to students than we were expected when we were told that central office cuts would be made to balance the budget. The LMC positions cuts are not only our friends, colleagues, and mentors, but these positions provide direct support to all campus librarians, teachers, and academic departments. It allows for campus librarians to spend more time directly working with their students and school communities. Did you know school librarians are certified teachers with a master's degree in library and certification and have a minimum of two years teaching experience, but most have much more than that? Also, many in Austin ISD are nationally board certified. But did you also know that these teacher librarians are not included in PPFT salary increases and pathway opportunities and are not included in next year's proposed 2% raise? We no longer are allowed subs, so we must shut down the library and cancel classes when we must be absent. Austin ISD has always been a strong supporter of librarians and libraries but these cuts are changing are, these changes are cutting us at our roots there are countless studies that show that having a robust library program as a certified librarian leads to higher student outcomes and test scores the entire Austin ISD community demands a commitment from the board and superintendent that they will truly support school librarians by committing to keeping a full-time certified school librarian at every campus including librarians in the two percent race and reading stating lmc positions now the data supports it 
My name is Shelby Counts, and I've been a librarian in Austin ISD for 20 years. Successfully serving the students and staff of my Burnett and now Anderson communities has been possible because of the support of our central library staff, a staff that has recently been cut from 11 positions to four. No longer having a library director, a purchasing librarian for the entire district, or a professional librarian in our district's professional library, which supports the curriculum of all levels of all subjects, is devastating and will have immediate negative effects on the students of AISD. I know we are in a budget crunch, but these decisions are being made without adequate input on the ramifications. Asking campus librarians who are already tasked with device management, GT, telepass, and more, in addition to being teacher librarians, to do even more, how? And then to exclude librarians from pay raises is unacceptable. School librarians in Texas are certified teachers with master's degrees. We are professionals who deserve the same pay as a master degree teacher at the least as we support all subjects, all staff, and all students on our campuses. I ask the board and the superintendent to commit to keeping full-time certified librarians on every campus, to including librarians in pay raises, and to taking a closer look at the effects of cutting our central library staff. Thank you so much. Hi, my name is Minda Anderson. I'm a national board certified bilingual teacher librarian here in the district. And I'm calling tonight because I'm extremely concerned about the future of libraries in our district. I know that the Austin ISD community values libraries, and we know that research shows students perform better academically at schools with strong library programs. However, I'm concerned that we are failing our students with recent decisions regarding libraries. The fact that we have to close our libraries when librarians are out because we are no longer provided substitutes is failing our students. The recent cuts of the majority of our district library support staff will only negatively impact students. Also, the fact that human capital is considering changing the librarian pay scale and potentially not give us equal raises to that of classroom teachers is extremely troubling. I ask the board and central office to recommit and show that we know how powerful library programs can be when fully supported through upcoming budget and administrative decisions. Thank you. Lydia Vasquez, ISD parent. Good evening, Dr. Elizante and, our, and the Board of Trustees. My name is Lydia Vasquez. I'm a parent at AISD. I'm calling about agenda item 4.2, the proposed changes to elementary planning times. At this board meeting on March the 10th, district leadership shared an engagement and timeline for elementary stakeholders. This timeline publicized the district's plan to engage, respond, and receive fit feedback with all stakeholders. Why are P positions already posted before the timeline is engagement has been fully conducted. Admin still needs to share their plan with campus communities. We also haven't been informed of the district parameters through district communication. There has been zero transparency. We deserve to get feedback on all changes that will inevitably affect our children. Our children deserve a proposal that is safe, equitable, and inclusive, and that this plan is neither. These proposed changes are a top-down approach that do not seem to serve anyone. Teacher working conditions affect student learning conditions. Let our teach, give our teach, let our teachers feedback guide your solutions. Thank you for your urgent attention to this matter. Hi, I'm calling to thank the superintendent for their incredible leadership in getting the two million equity allotment in the preliminary AISD budget. Kids that go to Title I schools have access now to money for things like chess club, field trips, and other interesting um, opportunities. Um, it's been long overdue for this kind of equity, and we thank the superintendent for their leadership. Thank you. Have a great day. Hi, this is Steve Adler. Uh, I'm a, a parent of uh, three girls that have all attended public school and a grandfather of, of Asa and Remy headed toward uh, AISD. I just wanted to just to congratulate uh, Superintendent Alzalde uh, and uh, AISD for this $2 million equity allotment uh, that's in the preliminary budget. Uh, to, to really, for the first time, get some dollars to the kids who go to Title I schools to have access for things like chess club and other things. It's just a wonderful thing to do. Parents have always gathered in the more affluent schools to help provide these kind of programs. Uh, but to really be able to now provide them to, to, to the other schools that don't have uh, the same access to, to funds is just exciting, it's fair, it's just, it's the right thing to do. Uh, congratulations to, to AISD and, and the superintendent. 
Hi, my name is Heidi Keneally. I'm the mother of soon-to-be three students at AISD. Um, two will attend Mills Elementary. One is at Lively, and she'll be at LASA next year. And I'm calling because I am profoundly concerned about the cuts to the library support staff. Um, the libraries have been a lifeline for my children. We and, and for so many, our librarians work extremely hard. They deserve the same raises and the same pay scale as teachers. They are required to have master's degrees and, and they are professionals. They deserve support. And I've heard that more than half of the support staff have been cut. It's unacceptable. We are a first class school district and we need good libraries to be able to remain so. Um, it's it's just not where the money should be cut. So please reconsider this decision to not put librarians on the same pay scale as teachers. They deserve the same pay, and they deserve to have professionals. Thank you. Hi, my name is Tara Bowman. I'm an AISD parent and an employee, and I would like to request some kind of confirmation that all campuses are going to continue to have a dedicated, qualified librarian on each campus in the future. Also, I heard that elementary PE teachers may need to take on classes with a ratio of 45 to 1 this fall, and I'd like to find out if there's another way to make the coming changes work without increasing our PE class size. I'm really worried that it will be more dangerous for everyone if one coach is overseeing 45 children. Thank you for your time. Hi, my name is Rose Clouston. I am an Austin resident, and I was calling to support the $2 million equity allotment in the AARSD budget. Um, that the superintendent put forward, I think it's really important that kids at Title I schools have access to extracurricular activities and field trips and these important enriching activities for our kids so that they have a full and comprehensive education regardless of their parents' income and ability to pay for those things. So I really hope that the um, board moves that forward and continues to uh, and continues that in the final budget. Thank you. Good evening, Dr. Elizalde and the Board of Trustees. My name is Danny Coons, and I'm a PE teacher in Austin ISD. I am calling about agenda item 4.2, the proposed changes to elementary essential areas. Despite the valid concerns about safety, quality, and enjoyment of education for our students raised by many stakeholders in our district, and the fact that next year's budget has not been approved, it is clear the district intends to go forward with this plan. Job positions are already posted and jobs have been offered. District leadership thinks the solution to an Austin ISD problem is to make Austin like the rest of Texas, but that's not who we are and not why we live here. Please push for answers and encourage district leadership to fully think through their proposed solutions. How will our special needs students receive safe instruction? In what spaces will students be receiving safe PE classes on bad weather days? How will we adjust class sizes that are 45 students to one adult when one of those adults is out without a substitute, as has happened countless times this school year? And how will the high quality of education we currently provide be maintained? There must be a solution to our issues that can make more stakeholders happy and be better for our students, but it will take some work and innovation. Thank you very much. My name is Danielle Wright. I'm an AISD parent. I'm calling to express um, support for our particular school who is recommending against a uh, one physical education course being extended. Uh, we are concerned about the ratio of students in the area, and we have alternative um, health fitness programs that can be extended throughout the district, including the Austin Youth Fitness League, the Y. Um, and several additional soccer leagues, soccer leagues that offer opportunities for extended physical education for 60 to 90 minutes directly after the school time every day. Um, we also concerned about uh, the variety and diversity of um, offerings for our students in the form of art um, <clears throat> in addition to physical education and art and music in addition to physical education. So we thank you for the time to vote against the proposal took some physical education. Uh, good morning, Brandon Alderetti, uh, AISD taxpayer and parent. And I wanted to call to thank y'all, the superintendent specifically for the $2 million equity allotment uh, in the, the budget as presented. Um, I think it's about time this happened and uh, just real kudos to y'all for, for delivering on this. My name is Bryn Reinhardt and I am an AISD parent. 
I am calling to request that the current board does not vote to extend Superintendent Elizalde's contract prior to installing the future board. Elizalde was supposed to create a strategic plan, but hasn't. There have been several failures in leadership, which begin and end with Stephanie Elizalde. Please investigate possible conflicts of interest regarding district contracts with Maya Consulting, RE Consulting, Third Future, and Gramercy. The current lack of transparency with the district sometimes paying millions to these companies is disturbing, especially when AISD fired the threat interventionist without explanation. Do not approve a new budget until these issues are addressed. I feel as though Superintendent Elizalde has done an amazing job undermining the confidence the community teachers and staff once had in the future of AISD. She has been embarrassingly successful in getting families and teachers to leave the district. Please protect our school librarians from being replaced with clerks as she did in Dallas. This is what the board needs to do today. Dave. Hi, my name is Natalie Wilson. I have two kids that are elementary school age in AISD. I don't think we should make these drastic changes to the essential areas. I think this change is happening without um, transparency and input from parents. I also think it seems like a foregone conclusion, but I was told that the trustees can stop this by voting no on the budget. I would like to see why are we making these changes? It doesn't seem like our kids need more change with these past two years. They need more stability and we need more equitable distribution in our music arts and PE programs. I don't think we should. I think that they're saying teachers are going to get more planning time, but the details of that planning time are not independent planning time. It's more, it's going to be a burden on the teachers to attend more meetings and not necessarily have more planning time for their face-to-face -face classroom time with the students. I don't think, I think we're losing teachers and this could also hurt enrollment and cost the district money. So I think it could. Hi, my name is Sonia. Uh, I am an AISD former parent. Both of my kids uh, graduated from there recently and uh, still proud to be a supporter and taxpayer for AISD. Just wanted to say thank you so much uh, to AISD and to our incredible new superintendent, Stephanie Elizalde, for, uh, for the $2 million equity allotment. It's, it's a great idea and long overdue. And I'm really excited to know that all children in AISD, not just the ones who live in the, the nicer parts of town are going to have access to all kinds of incredible educational opportunities going forward. Thank you guys so much for, for doing this. Really proud to be an AISD parent. Hi, I'm Allison Thomason Bramley, and I'm the proud librarian of Wynn Elementary School, AISD's only Montessori school. Thank you, trustees, for your service to our school district. Your time and your work do not go unnoticed. Thank you for maintaining our district's existing instructional materials policy regarding selection and challenges to books. Thank you for supporting our students' right to read. Librarians are one of our most valuable assets in AISD. We are certified professionals with master's degrees. Please protect our positions and ensure that we are fairly compensated for our work. Somewhere in AISD today, there is a librarian building a giant cardboard airplane to take their students on a trip with a book. Librarians are connecting students with books about people that look like them, as well as reading books about new cultures and ideas. They are supporting social and emotional development, providing teachers with instructional materials, sitting in the principal's office analyzing data, collaborating with a PLC on lessons, allocating grant funds to purchase new library books, Hosting comic books. Good evening. My name is Candace Hunter, and I have a student in the district. I am deeply frustrated by the lack of transparency around the budget. Budget talk conversations have been postponed, rescheduled, and delayed for valid reasons. However, in the interim, no information has been shared with the community. This is unacceptable. The superintendent, CFO, and district administrators have undertaken to balance the budget by all appearances at the expense of students, families, teachers, and staff. I am asking that the Austin ISD Board of Trustees, the duly elected representative body, hold the administration accountable. 
uh, for today's article about Gramercy and attending a recent conversation facilitated by yet another consulting firm, I am very concerned about how we are using our funds to the advantage of our students. As we emerge from the pandemic, the expectation is that information is shared with trustees and the community, especially those that have been marginalized and underserved by the district. If there is not an accounting, there will most certainly be a reckoning. Thank you. Good evening, trustees and superintendent. This is former trustee Ann Teich. Thank you so much for your hard work and commitment to our students and staff. I urge you to continue engaging the community, both internally and externally, in your decision making. If people understand why you are making changes, and if they have time to process changes, they are more likely to support those changes. This is particularly important as you contemplate a bond election. I know that student achievement and equity are paramount in your decision making and that you have a sense of urgency to make changes that will promote this achievement and equity. Please remember that if staff, families, and community members are not informed about the why of changes and are not given enough time to provide input, they tend to oppose those changes. I wish you all a peaceful, restful Easter weekend. Hello, my name is Anita Sigler. I am the librarian at Pickle Elementary. I have learned from Mrs. E, the compensation department, that librarians will not be included in the pay raise for next year. They are going to put us in a different pay scale, which takes us out of the teacher's pay scale, and the compensation department is not going to announce these changes to the librarians before they take effect. We need to remind the board that librarians are the teachers in charge in the classroom. Our classroom is the library. We see all students, most of them weekly, and we prepare six different lesson plans a week, plus our additional duties of a librarian, which is ordering, repairing, and shelving, and shelving. And we also are often in charge of the technology department. This is in addition to our other non-librarian duties, lunch duty, after school duty, before school duty. I do all of those at my school. Please remember that librarians, we were teachers first in the state of Texas, and we also must have a master's degree. Please treat us as we are professionals along with our teachers and colleagues in the counseling department. I appreciate your effort and I hope that you will take this all into consideration. Hello, my name is Mindy Bass and I'm currently the teacher librarian at Maplewood Elementary School. I've been in education for 25 years and this is my 16th year with AISD. This is my first year in the library and I had to go through a rigorous and expensive training program at UT to become a librarian. I did this because I love kids, literacy and education, but the demands and stress being placed on teachers, classroom teachers were too high. I didn't want to leave teaching, but I felt like most of the joy was being sucked out of being a classroom teacher. I have my national board certification and my master's degree. It's a requirement to become a librarian. However, when I left the classroom, my salary went down because I lost my PPFT money. Now the board is saying librarians will be placed on a different salary scale from teachers and will not be getting the projected pay raise. As a single mother living with the same inflation and rising property taxes as teachers, it is just as hard as us for us to live in Austin. They say that libraries are the heart of the school. Shouldn't you be taking care of that heart too? Thank you very much for listening to me. Hello, this is Eric Ramos from Martin Middle School and I'm calling again just to ask when the district and the board will publicly acknowledge the wrongdoing and missteps they have taken in rolling out the decision in regards to sixth grade at Martin Middle School and if we can actually get a public apology for the complete lack of respect that we were treated with during the whole process. I'm also wondering why we never received any feedback from any of the meetings the district hosted. We only got feedback from the meeting that Austin Voices hosted. We never heard back on any meeting that the district hosted, which makes it feel like y'all just held the meetings to check off a box to say you met with us, but then never did anything with the information collected in that meeting. So I'd love to know when we're gonna get feedback and answers to the questions that were presented at that meeting. And I'd love to know when we're gonna have acknowledgement of the lack of an appropriate rollout of this decision. Thank you. My name is Sarah Stevenson and I was AISD's first librarian of the year in 2013. And I am calling to support the librarians. Um, I think they should be included in the 2% um, pay raise because in order to become a librarian, you have to have a master's degree, a teaching certificate, and at least two years of experience in the classroom. And the salary scale says librarian and teacher. 
So we are teachers. And um, the other thing I'd like to say, well, you know, librarians are feeling um, nervous about the cuts. They're not, they're not allowed to have substitutes anymore, which is really unfortunate because the library is the heart of the school. And if you care at all about literacy, you're going to support libraries because children improve their um, literacy skills through reading, and the libraries are the ones that support the literacy and provide the books so that students can practice and improve their literacy. Um, they teach information skills, how to evaluate a website in this age, in this age of misinformation and um, fake news. They learn how to um, really question the sources that they're seeing on the internet. There's so many things that libraries. Good evening, my name is Kelsey and I have three elementary children at AISD. I'd like to comment on agenda item 4.1 pertaining to elementary planning time. I support the goal of adding planning time to support student achievement and teacher well-being, but I don't agree with the proposed changes to make that happen, particularly reducing students' time in art and music or by sending an entire grade level to PE at the same time. On our campus, this could be approximately 145 students in PE at a time based on next year's projected enrollment. My daughters are particularly upset about the prospect of fewer art classes next year, and my daughter Parker would like to add a comment. Hi, my name is Parker, and, um, and I go to Dosso Elementary, and, um, and I'm a first grader, and art is my favorite subject. And I'm kind of disappointed that you're going to take away some art classes. Hello, I'm calling to express that the COVID protocols in regards to classroom spread in elementary school campuses. Recently, there were outbreaks at five known elementary schools, Hill, Allison, Patton, Mills, and Clayton. Likewise, the district has acknowledged cases are increasing once again. We understand masks are to remain optional per updated CDC guidance. What has layered was AIS to offer? Our requests call upon the AISD district and trustees to examine its current COVID communication strategies and COVID safety protocols for elementary school campuses. Specifically, request targeted communication from local campus administration in the event of classroom spread and improved air quality as achieved through simple measures such as opening the windows. Thank you, and we look forward to your feedback and improvements being made to existing COVID protocols. Thanks, bye. Hello, my name is Amber Welsh, a parent of multiple ARSD students, and I'm calling to respectfully ask you to schedule a board retreat post haste to finalize this scorecard metrics and district strategic plan. Um, you've come so far, but you're not done yet. Uh, don't give up before you cross the finish line, please. I know it won't be easy to get something on the calendar. Nobody likes scheduling, but these things must happen ASAP. And certainly before the $1.8 billion budget of taxpayer money comes up for approval. Um, as you know, it will need to happen prior to the May info session. If you want to improve it in May prior to finalizing the budget by June, um, if you're uncertain as to why this is necessary, please reach out. Happy to share more. I know you can do this. You've got this. Let's get this meeting on the calendar to finish the scorecard metrics and strategic plan. It can be done. I believe in you. Hi, my name is Kathleen Allen, and I'm a parent in AISD. And I appreciate that you guys are looking for solutions to provide teachers with more planning. Um, I do think a lot of them have to work long days to fit in planning. Um, However, I don't think it's uh, appropriate to cut um, music and art to once a week, which is what I'm, I understand would be the uh, consequence. And PE, um, I mean, I'm an athlete. I think PE is really important, but I also think that music and art are really important for the development of the whole child. And I think the uh, balanced approach that we have now to the special areas is um meaningful and important and I appreciate your attention in this urgent matter and AISD needs to implement a solution that is equitable to all teachers including essential area teachers and students um, and I know that you guys are trying to solve a problem and I do appreciate that thank you hello my name is Erica Bowden and I'm an AISD parent and I'm calling about the changes to essential areas and specifically PE um, I'm still really 
confused as to how the system will work. Um, my child is a fifth grader and really enjoys PE. It's their favorite um, special essential areas. And um, I just don't see that happening. I don't, see, I don't see them maintaining that being their favorite subject if that is going to be 45 students or more per class. Um, and I'm worried about it from a safety perspective as well. As someone that works with students with disabilities, I don't see how that's going to be beneficial for all of our students. Um, and I'm worried about the quality of art and music programs as well. Um, so please don't, please think of ways to get planning for teachers that doesn't involve PE and essential areas taking a hit. Thank you. My name is Megan Kite and I'm the librarian at Pleasant Hill Elementary. The motto for AIC this year is have it all, and the district prides itself on providing a well-rounded educational experience for our students. However, recent actions have called this into question, especially in regards to library programming. Our central library staff has been cut down to four positions, which is not enough to support over 100 schools. Our campus programming has suffered due to a compilation of extraneous job responsibilities, such as lunch duty, substituting, test administration, and device management, to name a few. Our lack of financial stability with proposed pay scale changes and exclusion from PPFT and pay raises has sadly forced many people to walk away from a job they love. I've been with AIC over 10 years. I'm bilingual. I have a master's degree, and I'm passionate about what I do. I am my campus's device manager, CIC, GT advocate, pride and social studies rep, and makerspace manager. My programming increases translittery and technology skills, boosts reading engagement, and provides memorable events, such as performances, author visits, and field trips for all grade levels. I am calling on the board and superintendent to prioritize school librarians in our programming by staffing each school with a certified school librarian, financially compensating librarians as teaching staff, and ensuring that librarians are able to perform their job duties and programming through adequate staffing at the campus and district levels. Thank you. Hi, my name is Matt Jeffy. I'm a parent of a kindergartner at Clayton Elementary, and I'm calling to express concern over the spread of the Omicron BA2 subvariant that is evidently incur occurring in classrooms. Um, about a third of my daughter's class uh, was out with COVID last week, and awareness of this doesn't seem to be making it up to the district level. Uh, and I think the current COVID protocols that are in place are leaving parents in the dark as to uh, how much spread is occurring and how, how much COVID is out there. Um, and I think those with um, immunosuppressed individuals at home or those that are particularly at risk um, don't have the tools they need to uh, make good decisions about how they want to react uh, to COVID currently. Um, so uh, that's, that's my concern right now. Thank you. Hi, my name is Frank Metcher. My wife is a teacher, and uh, we believe that uh, planning time for elementary school teachers is extremely vital, uh, and it, but it shouldn't come at the expense of student learning experiences in its central areas. There is a way to do both, and you should find it. Thank you. Goodbye. Hello, my name is Holly Edger, and I have a student at Keeling Middle School. I'd like to ask the board to hold our superintendent accountable for creating a strategic plan that connects the dots between our budget, scorecard, and the board and district values. I'd ask that the board vote to reverse the policy, giving staffing and other power to the superintendent so that this power remains with the board. I'd like to ask for a review of all contracts for conflicts, a review and amendment to the conflict of interest policy, and reporting on the contracts to provide transparency and accountability. I'd like to ask the board to review the plans for cutting positions in our district. How did we go from 250 central office positions to 632 across the district and campuses, many of whom are teachers and support staff that support student outcomes? This is an exchange for seemingly setting more and more top-level supervisory positions. I'm concerned about the move to huge PE classes daily at the expense of art and music education. I'm concerned about the future of our libraries and librarians. And finally, I'm concerned about teacher raises not keeping up with the cost of living increases, responsibilities, and increased testing requirements. Because of this, we are losing teachers at an alarming rate. In short, I'm concerned about the future of our schools in the ISD. Please take action now. Thank you. My name is Lainey Ingram, and I'm an Austin taxpayer. I am leaving a message in support of the $2 million equity allotment. I want to please encourage that that is spent on school districts in need of additional enriching activities, after-school activities, sports, et cetera. 
please vote in favor of the equity allotment. I'm calling today as a graduate, parent, and educator in Austin ISD to address the proposed essential area redesign. Every day I see AISD post on so social media about how they're using equity by design and long range planning for the future of the district. I have a hard time every time I come across that phrase because if AISD were truly concerned about equity, this essential area redesign would never have made it to this point. This plan is not equitable to teachers as it creates a tiered system of educators, those who are valued enough to get extra planning and those whose programs are cut to provide it. This plan is not equitable to campuses. A campus that has a a handful more students than mine will have an additional art music teacher and extra enrichment classes, while the students at a campus like mine will only have art music once a week. This doesn't even take into account the priorities of principals whose schedules re will reflect their support of the fine arts. It's not equitable to students who are the most important thing to consider. Some will have to compete for spots in fine arts magnet programs having received 35% less instruction unless their parents are able to provide them with private lessons. Where's the equity in programming? To quote a district official, we get it, change is hard, but respectfully, it's especially hard when there are better plans that are more equitable and will allow for extra time and those have been dismissed without explanation putting dismissal back at 245 will provide an extra two and a half planning hours of planning a week hiring monitors for wow and recess will cost considerably less money early release this is martha parada i'm a parent and a community member of austin isd i would like to see a pe offered every day to students i believe we're pressuring them too much and without a physical outlet we're setting them up to fail they are children, not adults. They need a mental break daily to be successful. I also want to give a shout out to the superintendent for standing up and putting her neck on the line when it came to protecting the kids by having them wear masks. We will never know how many lives were saved with her effort of doing this. I believe it was heroic. I believe it was something really special to have to stand up knowing full well that the governor was not on her side. I am a bit disappointed that we have not heard more gratitude from the board members in regard to this. I voted for the board members to be leaders in change, and it feels a bit ignored. I would like to see the board members more focused on progress. I think that we have the right team in place to do so. I just think we need to get refocused on the children, not on anything else but the children. My name is Debbie Clark. I live in District 7 and have two daughters at Goritsky. I have been a longtime public education advocate. But because of the district financial instability and a lack of plan or vision on how to improve student learning, my family is considering to move our children to Dripping Springs schools. The recent Statesman article talking about recapture shows the lack of a plan or metrics on how the administration or board of trustees will handle increasing recapture payments. In addition, the metrics do not exist on how the district will improve special education support per the Stetson report and the overall approach to learning loss for every student. When my daughters were in speech, there were always metrics they had to achieve to move on. Also, there has been little community involvement on any issue. I have repeatedly mentioned to you that parents are an untapped resource. Unless the community starts to see some transparency and targets on issues, this district will turn into a shell of its former self. My name is Becky Shaheen, and I'm a Becker parent, the school counselor, Galindo, and a taxpayer. I believe in public education and am a product of AISD schools, loyal forever. I wish I had time to state all the wonderful things our schools are doing, but I can't in this short phone call. I'm calling to demand transparency all around, to say no to a 45-1 ratio for PE, to say yes to more fine arts time, to support librarians in a pay raise, to give power back to the board and therefore the constituents, and for Dr. Elizalde to create a strategic plan that all stakeholders can stand behind. We must let our experts in the schools lead the way or we will continue to lose them to other industries. Trustees, I ask that you do not vote on the new budget until transparency has been achieved and the superintendent follows through on her contractual obligation to create a strategic plan that ties the scorecard to the budget and to the board and district values. Thank you for your time. Good morning. My name is Frank Spring. I'm an advocate for public education, and I just want to uh, leave a comment about the $2 million equity allotment in the, in the preliminary budget. Uh, this is this is really good policy. Um, this is a really smart idea. It strikes me as a really moral idea, uh, and I think it's it's long since time to recognize that uh, the that kids in Title One schools deserve access to uh, some of the same things that kids in, uh, in in richer districts get. And I think this is exactly the kind of 
uh, the kind of equity building uh, that we need to see in public education. So I applaud the superintendent. I applaud uh, the entire school district for this measure. Uh, this is smart. It's moral. Y'all are doing a great job. Keep it up. My name is Natalie Steinfeld Childre. I am the mother of two elementary students at AISD. I believe in the power of public education, and I support public education frontline workers, our teachers, librarians, counselors, and school office employees. That's why parents are calling for more transparency about contracts, funds, departments, and budgets. We need to make cuts, but where it least hurts teachers and students. We are losing assistant principals, librarians, security guards, and counselors. Is the latter really a smart move when child anxiety and suicidal ideation are on the rise? And music and art are being cut by more than 50%, which will probably diminish students' mental and emotional development more and undermine their creativity, social skills, and motivation. We are bleeding teachers and students. Now teachers are getting a salary raise, but have to sacrifice their support staff, which essentially puts more work on their plate. Will that really help retention? We ask for a review and report of contracts. ASD has, for instance, budgeted millions for grammar C, and nobody has heard of them since. Sounds like mismanaged funds. Thank you for listening to my comments. Hi, my name is Nancy Thompson, and I'm an AISD parent to three kids in grades second and tenth. I'm concerned about the AISD budget and the lack of raises for librarians. Librarians have carried us through the pandemic from managing devices to outdoor story times and story strolls. They, are, they filled in as subs when our schools needed them. They are the heart of the school and the place where students love to be, and they all have to have master's degrees for their roles. So why don't they get a pay raise? They deserve one too. We hope you will give them one. Thank you. Hello, my name is Marilyn Faulkner. I have two children at AISD at Be Becker Elementary. I would like to call and um, to voice my concern for the essential areas redesign. I believe that this plan needs more thought, more time, more consideration and input from parents, more presentation of data from the board to the trustees of why this area redesign is happening and uh, more time for parents to voice their ideas and teachers and administration to work together to come up with a collaborative plan. I would be in support of shortening the elementary school day, the dismissal time in order to allow for teachers to have more planning time, but I do not support reduction of art or music time within school or face-to-face uh, time with these teachers who lead these classes. I oppose large PE class sizes for safety and for connection, and I would like to see more of um, more integration with our um, administrator administration along with the parents and teachers in order to make a plan that works. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Stacy Smith and I am a Go Valley librarian here in AISD, former teacher, and I'm also a parent of a Go Valley fifth grader. I have three things to cover right now. Essential areas, can we please get clarification on why we dropped the early release day, Wednesdays? We can do it, we've done it before. If we're gonna stay till 310 each day, why not do early release for elementary only? Second, Martin Middle School. I still have not gotten, I've gotten a lot of responses, but not clarification on if this plan will build Martin enrollment back up to its current 500 students. You're gonna drop to about 200 and something next year. Is the plan, long range plan, gonna build them back to 500? Please, can we get clarification? And three librarians, are we getting a pay cut? What's up with this revised pay scale? And no pay raise. We take kids, Teachers drop them off, that's an extra planning time for them, and I have no problem with that. I teach lessons, I plan lessons, I'm the GT coordinator, I'm the green team coordinator, you better pay me. Thank you so much, I appreciate it. I love AISD, but can you answer our questions? Thank you, appreciate it. Good morning, my name is Ruth Tovar. I am calling today about item 5.3. Thank you, Dr. Elisa and the, your administration and the equity office for including for the first time ever in the general fund a line item for equity allotment for all campuses with economically disadvantaged children. These dollars will provide access to children like mine who have been historically underserved for many years due to the fact that they were born to parents who don't have hundreds of dollars in disposable income to give their local PTA or booster clubs. 
Now, this is a giant step toward educational equity that ensures children get what they need to develop to their full academic and social potential. We still have a lot of work to do, and I look forward to being a cohort in this process. Todavía comprobando que sí se puede. Viva la mujer mexicana. Hi, my name is Angela Pires. I'm a parent of a middle schooler uh, in ASD District 1. Um, before I talk about middle school, I would like to have just a brief um, support for the whole child approach, and please do not reduce finite time in elementary schools. Uh, regarding the budget, please do not cut teacher support jobs, including central office and instructional coach in schools. My daughter's school is about to cut three instructional coach jobs, and that is not what you should do right now when teachers are quitting in droves. So please support teachers, not the way they way around. Remove money from maybe the police budget that it seems to be untouchable. So think about the kids, please, okay? Um, no reducing fine arts time and not reducing uh, jobs that support teach, teachers, be in school or in central office. Thank you so much and have a great day. Hi, my name is April Clark. I'm an AISD parent and member of the EAC, LRP, and Bond Steering Committees. I have general comments and questions. First, I appreciate that the superintendent's scorecard has been improved, but I'm concerned that there is no way to see if those changes are being met or measured without quantitative targets for each scorecard goal prior to June of 2022. First, I'd like to request that those specific targets be developed and shared with the public as soon as possible. Second, I'd also like to express concern that student and teacher wellness are given less weight on the scorecards than academic achievement. I believe that if more importance is placed on student and teacher wellness, the better the academic achievement will be. Likewise, the annual budget is coming and we need to understand what specific strategic plan is that sets that budget. I would ask Dr. Elizalde, what is the detailed strategic plan on which the budget is based? Finally, the district announced big changes to the specials program, specifically art, music, and PE. First, how are these changes being planned for? What supports are being given to the principals and school staff to meet the challenges created? And what is the plan for implementation? This is a major stressor at our schools and in our communities. From an equity perspective, these broad changes will affect schools differently. How is that being taken into consideration? Thank you for your service to public education. This is Bonnie Knight, art educator and stakeholder at AISD to address the proposed essential areas redesign. This plan is far from equitable. It's unfair to teachers by creating a tiered system where some are more valued for extra planning time at the expense of your essentials areas, which are getting slashed. This plan is inequitable to campuses. Larger campuses get more teachers enrichment classes. Smaller campuses, one hour a week for art and music. Where's the equity in that? It's not fair to the students because those who would like to apply to fine art magnets have 35% less instruction. We get it, change is hard, but there's been plans offered which have been dismissed out of hand without explanation. Put dismissal back to 245, there's your two and a half hours of extra planning time. Power monitors for well and recess, considerably less expensive. Early release days, go for it. Let's redesign this pathetic redesign into something that's fair for all stakeholders. Thank you. My name is Marie and I'm a parent in AISD. I have four children. We're asking the board to hold accountable our superintendent to create a strategic plan that connects the dots between our budget scorecard and board and district values. We're asking this be reviewed as a contract violation for having not been completed. We ask the board to reverse the policy giving staffing another power to the superintendent for that to belong to the board in a contract revision and matching policy revision returning that policy to its prior state. We ask for transparency and accountability with contract funds, departments, and budgets. We ask for a review of contracts for conflicts, a review and amendment to the conflict of interest policy, and reporting on the contracts. How can we keep buying this reimagining of departments that never comes to fruition, such as the SPED department? Gramercy had millions allocated and nobody has heard of them since that time. How did we go from 250 central office positions to 632 across the district and campuses, many of which are teachers and support staff that impact student outcomes in exchange for adding more and more top-level supervisory positions? Please do not allow six million to go toward changing our essential areas with less art and music time. We do not believe the board is in a position to approve a new budget given the lack of transparency and missing information. We hope these issues can expeditiously be resolved 
with real transparency and honesty related to the district funds, contracts, and operations. We're sounding the alarm of concern for the future of our district. Uh, hi, my name's Eric, and um, I just wanted to leave a comment about the $2 million equity uh, allotment in the budget um, and praise the superintendent for having the courage to uh, deliver for all students to real equity in their schools. Um, you know, all children really deserve a full and complete school experience no matter which school they are at. Um, we know there's some differences in the extracurricular students are given, um, even though that's a great uh, and important part of them developing as a child. Um, and I really think that having great extracurricular activities at every school that are funded uh, properly is, uh, you know, critically important for the development of these children and also for uh, the culture around these schools. And uh, I'd like to just give thanks to the superintendent for fighting for this. Thank you. Hi, my name is Natasha Schmidt. I have a third, fourth, and fifth grader at Gallette Elementary. Um, I'm very concerned about the cuts in positions and teachers um, and the rate at which teachers will be leaving Austin ISD. I don't think there is any kind of plan as far as the recapture um, situation. I'm all about sending money to help other communities, uh, other communities that don't have funds. However, it seems like we are sending a gross amount of our income and our, our tax dollars to other communities. And I want, an un, I want to understand what the plan is for the future and for my children. Hello, this is Imani Simmons, mother of a child that attends AISD. I'm calling to ask you to please not cut children's time in the arts. Please understand that kids get burned out like the rest of us. And if all they're doing is their core academics, they're going to disengage. There have been numerous studies that show that art education and music education actually increase mathematics scores. So if your funding is dependent on getting high other tests, it is imperative that you do not cut children's access to the arts, which helps the entire child grow, and they actually get brain breaks which makes them furthermore the idea of sticking an entire grade or 45 students into PE is a horrible idea and increases AISD's liability because we all know that when you do that it's a bad idea because now there won't be anybody to supervise bullying which is already a huge issue for AISD and if children get hurt due to this choice you will now have AIS. My name is Sarah McKenna, and I'm the parent of a high school student. I am calling to request transparency to strengthen the school community and create a sense of understanding of the changes being made. We are asking the board for transparency and requiring the superintendent to create a publicly, publicly shared strategic plan that ties into the budget, the superintendent's report card, and the district's value and mission. Decisions being made for this district need to be clear under the strategic plan and transparent to the community rather than what's currently taking place. This is required of a contract and should be upheld. I would further request that a plan of repurposing the buildings closed in the School Changes 2.0 plan be developed so as to create a funding source for the district as a solution to the budget issues. During the decisions to close campuses, a promise was made to turn Brook Elementary into affordable teacher housing. This has not happened. Given the skyrocketing cost of housing for our teachers and teachers are being forced to move out of the community, let's honor that community and help retain the talented teachers we have in this district. Thank you. Page five, my name is Lisa Flotis, and I'm calling about 4.1 and 4.2. Page five of the board report about item 4.1 is composed of resources and supports that are aspirational at best. Any survey of any special education teacher would confirm the access to optional PD is not well published and not widely used. Claims that training around UDL, differentiation, specially designed instruction, inclusion strategies, accommodations, modifications, and collaboration strategies for general ed and SPED teachers should be ideally verified. Item 4.2 codifies a contradiction of what is claimed in item 4.1. Elementary planning time might be better coined as planning time for gen ed teachers. The word periodic is used when talking about PLC for SPED teachers. As evidenced in 4.1, collaboration strategies are key and cannot happen when special ed teachers are expected to conduct ARD meetings, plan alone, and only periodically be included in PLC planning. 
The lack of authentic strategic planning to improve outcomes for students with disabilities has not been provided. A department strategic plan with measurable objectives is much needed, and I hope this board can ask and require and uh, verify the information presented tonight as it really does impact the outcomes for students with disabilities and their families. Thank you. My name is Ellie Jacobs. I have friends in the district. I just wanted to call to congratulate Superintendent, Superintendent Alice Alday on the good work that she did in, uh, um, in getting additional money uh, allotted for school activities for Title I children. Uh, this is a great move in terms of equity. She should be congratulated across the board for the good work that she's doing. This is Katie Tokes, and I'm a retired teacher, and I'm calling to urge you to support our school librarians. It, as we all know, we're in this age of TikTok videos and computers in our pockets, and th so the librarian's role is more important than ever. Librarians are needed to help students find joy from reading books. And I long for the day when I catch a student hiding a book under their desk instead of their phones. Thank you, bye. Hi there, my name is Natasha Harper-Madison, council member for City of Austin, District 1, and I'm calling to express my appreciation for the $2 million equity allotment in the preliminary AISD budget. I'd like to commend Dr., I'm sorry, Superintendent Elizalde for your commitment to putting equity first. Um, I'm proud to know that Title I students are going to have access like every other student. Um, I'm proud to know that, you know, you're pushing in the right direction. This won't fix it all, but it's certainly a step in the right direction. And I'd like very much to, to commend you and your efforts and to also commend um, AISD for listening to the community and working with organizations like Black Leaders Collective to move forward and have kids and poor kids and kids of color in Austin being able to count on their school district, even when they can't count on their families having access to discretionary income. So that's my comment. I really appreciate the opportunity to call in. Keep pushing forward. Bye-bye. Thank you, tr trustees. This concludes public comment. Are there any questions or clarifications? And before I recognize board members, I just want to uh, make one clarification. For one of you or all of you who have been receiving text messages about uh, whether or not the board information session is posted on Facebook, it is not on Facebook Live. And for those of you that are technologically more savvy than I am, I'm just gonna give you the explanation here. So there is a decoder at the Performing Arts Center that streams to our Facebook. So it's not working. They asked the custodian to go and reset that um, decoder and it did not work. And so we don't have staff who are gonna be driving over there and troubleshooting that. But I will say that again, we are streaming this live on austinisd.org backslash board at AISD TV, channel 22 on Spectrum, Grande and AT&T U-verse on channel 99 for those of you that want or interested in that. So I just want to make sure I clarified that particular question. So trustees, I sorry, I looked over. Trustee Anderson, I don't. Couple of uh, clarifying questions, Dr. Elizalde. Uh, it's been uh, a lot, but I, I noticed a common theme. Um, so I'll start with the first clarifying question or um, some kind of future update or something. Um, I heard about the changes to librarians, their pay scale, and they're not included in the pay increase. So that is going to be part of um, what's covered under the, is that included in the budget component that you all are doing this evening? That will be part of the budget uh, with regard to the different categories and the challenges with including any categories beyond teachers. Uh, next one is, there was a mention from Mr. Ramos about feedback from the district about Martin. I'll have to get back with you. I'll work with Dr. Mays to see, I, I know Principal uh, Groton worked with her campus, but I wasn't um, directly involved, so I will get with Dr. Mays and we can provide you an update. 
Uh, next up is, uh, I also heard about COVID uh, protocols. I think there there had been some um, information that's not all of it has been obtained by the schools, and so I know we are looking to revamp some of the communication. We have not yet created a new plan. Our health director is working with the team and with Austin Public Health, and so we will have an update with regard to the not just the public comment, but the email communications that we have received and what the district's response will be to working to improve that communication with, while still staying within the HIPAA and FERPA requirements. Uh, next up, can you please provide feedback on if equ equity by design was used to make decisions related to a central area? And I know we, I think there's a discussion on it. So I'll save that one for then. But next is, I also heard about uh, budget meetings being canceled. Is there a plan to um, inform the community about what's gonna be going on with the budget? So there was a rescheduling due to the bad weather days, as I recall, um, in March. And so those were rescheduled and those are April 21st and 23rd, and the same form of communication announcing the first set of meetings was utilized to provide the update. And will this include anything, this is from another caller, related to our plans or efforts related to recapture? Perfect. And lastly, a comment is, a common theme I see in the comments is transparency, budget concerns, and I would ask that the administration, as you are making these changes, uh, you want to bring everyone along on the journey by communicating the why and over-communicating the why. So that's what I would ask. Just over-communicate the why. Thank you. Trustees, other questions? Trustee Lugel. Um, so I think some of the <clears throat> comments that I heard were regarding the uh, scorecard target and measurable goals. And I um, believe that there is a plan in place to um, have that available, not just to the board, but to the public. Um, is that something that, um, I feel like that's a clarifying question. Is that something that the superintendent can answer? Yes, ma'am. The goal will be to bring the recommended targets at the May information session. Um, team actually worked on those this week. As you may recall, we only had beginning of year um, data and we needed middle of year data so that we could um, see where students were and keeping in mind that all of 2020 um, for the 1920 school year star was, um, was not given and then last year you may recall we had a difference, significant difference in even the number of students that opted to take it as it was communicated from the state that it was optional. So many individuals said it was optional. So due to those reasons, we were still working on creating and bringing to you the recommended targets. The targets for the end of the five years are those targets that um, you all had discussed prior to my arrival even into the district, with the exception of um, some of the targets were, were re some of the goals were reworded upon your feedback, and so we had to recalculate some of those. Um, those will be part of the information session, and I believe we have to have those documents available for you to review the Friday prior to the information session, which I believe means a week from tomorrow. Thank you. And then um, probably for, uh, I'm not sure that it necessarily fits in tonight's meeting, but I do request um, additional information be made available to the public to address the safety concerns around PE, class sizes, and um, uh, physical space available at certain campuses and um, to the extent that solutions have been articulated 
from the campus to their staff, to families, to the district administration, and then from administration to the public and to the board, um, that, that is my request um, around those safety concerns for PE class sizes. I think some of that will already be addressed um, later today, and then the ones that are not, of course, we will follow up um, with those. Okay, and then my last um, uh, item is more of a comment. I was really impressed with all the folks that um, called in to speak directly to the equity allotment, including um, some familiar names, some uh, elected officials at the local level. And I just really appreciate that because it makes me think that, you know, that's right, we should be publicly commenting at city council meetings. There's so much crossover between affordable housing for families, affordable housing for workforce. Um, so I, I just really appreciate that, that intersection there. I might add there's some, there's some opportunity for fully funding pre-K programs with the city council, so I, I, I would add that. Um, I, I know I have one clarification question, Dr. Elisalde, and I know it's only been a little bit over four weeks since we have um, taken down our mask mandate, but continue our, our health and safety protocols. I'm just wondering, as, as your healthcare team works through the discernment of both FERPA and HIPAA, laws around some of these issues that are of concern of COVID, if you, if your team and yourself would consider providing information to the community about um, new uh, treatments like EvuShield that provide care, uh, protection to immunocompromised individuals, as we have gotten emails from a lot of individuals who have uh, individuals in their homes that are immunocompromised, I think given that it's only been four weeks, and that treatment is rather new that our community doesn't know too much about some of the other opportunities to protect themselves and their families uh, as we continue to have those layers of health and safety. But I just, I just hope that um, your team works with some of our health care officials around that. Yes, sir. Thank you for sharing that. And we will make sure that um, our health director, Elena Bejarano, works directly to get that information as we continue to work both specifically with cases on campuses, working with families, as well as putting out some general information. Um, I think you, you did receive notification earlier um, this week or last week. It's now becoming all one week with regard to one classroom that we did um, close at one of our schools where we did have documented um, cases and sometimes there are things of course that may be circulating on social media that a school or a school nurse may not have access to and so um, until we have that information we're we're certainly we, when it's brought to us we certainly immediately look into it but sometimes we don't have the information a parent may keep a child home they're not required um, we, we do ask that they tell us if it is related to COVID so that we can properly utilize the same communication processes that we've used the entire time. However, just because a parent kept someone home, we don't presume that it's COVID. So um, we know we need to ask our parents to please communicate and provide us that information because we want to keep, want to continue to keep all of our families as safe as possible. And then if necessary, um, if we do have a school that there are enough cases, we may need, as we said before, we could, we may need to require some masks um, in addition to the protocols to get through, you know, a week, 10 days, depending on the notification timeline. And with regard to error, uh, just as a reminder, every single classroom you all did approve, we were able to purchase every single classroom Every large area has air filters um, throughout the entire district um, because of this board, including large areas like libraries and um, spaces such as that. Thank you. Trustees, other trustees saying? 
Thank you. Um, I want to echo one of the comments I heard today about um, the masking, and I still do appreciate <laughs> you know, everything that we did. I just wanted to make that super clear in case it wasn't. Um, but I did have a couple of questions. There was one question about uh, Gramercy and our mental health um, provider. Uh, we approved that contract last year, I believe. And um, I wanted to know how many um, students are taking advantage of that and how many of those are students who are getting subsidized? That is, you know, they, they don't have the funds to actually pay for their therapy. That's kind of an equity question. I think I remember seeing that as a response to a tracker question um, that, that we did send out. Did you receive that? I received it, but I think because it was a public comment, I would like that to be answered publicly, please especially um, in light of an article that came out. I'm just trying, I'm getting lots of, of emails on that. Do you have the numbers in front of you, Elizabeth? Okay, thank you. So, I believe the numbers that we provided the board were 11 students with no insurance and 600 plus students that are insured. Okay, and um, I guess, I would love to have like a small group or some sort of follow up to get to explore this a little bit more um, to think about how um, our students are getting their mental health needs met. I think there might be a misunderstanding from the callers where they said we approved a contract for millions of dollars. Um, we've set aside a bucket of money to support students right. that are uninsured, so it's an up to amount, but they're not getting the dollars unless they're serving students that don't have insurance. Uh, because we have a fee-for-service model, they don't get money um, just for having a contract with the district. Understood. We'd be happy to add that if the board would like it to be in a, an agenda item. Thank you. Um, another question I had, I'm glad to hear that um, we'll be getting some target recommended targets at the May information session. Um, I did also want to ask if there were any plans for the superintendent to um, present a strategic plan um, to the board. I know we got an update, I think, in February or January, but um, we haven't actually seen the plan. Um, we did present it to you in um, January, and we'd be happy to re-present it and provide it, and if the board so chose to vote on it, um, we have no objection whatsoever, and all of those are connected back to the strategies that we have on our scorecard when we do present those to each of you, uh, to the board as a whole, twice a month. Um, and they are in alignment to the individual strategies. We even connected certain goal um, numbers to particular strategies within the strategic plan. We'd be more than happy to do that. Okay, I appreciate that, because I think what we got a couple of months ago was like a list of maybe nine or five different topics, but it wasn't the actual plan. So I would very much appreciate seeing that and having that as aligned um, to the budget as, as um, you know, so we can see the connection. Um, a caller also asked about uh, Martin Middle School, um, about the plan to build enrollment back up to 500 students. Is, can, is there a plan for that? The plan is to ensure the school is academically successful so that we can rebuild the enrollment. Okay. And <clears throat> I did hear for, about librarians. I think some of my other colleagues mentioned um, some questions about that. Um, I would like to request as part of an upcoming budget presentation or as a separate presentation, a comprehensive um, compensation and benefits review so that we, I know that's like the biggest part of our budget is our staff and want to make sure that I fully understand um, the implications for different categories of staff. I'll be happy to put that on the governance meeting as an uh, agenda item for the board. Yeah, we, we've had small group meet, if you talk about small group meet, well, we'll have mm -hmm. a conversation in governance about what to do in the past. We've had small group meetings around like compression and compensation issues before, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah I know previously yeah. we've had actual, like actually a budget meeting. Um, this was a couple years ago. 
um, it was an agenda item. We actually approved the compensation plan separately, like before we approved the full budget. I'm not saying necessarily we need to do that, but I would at least have, like to have a thorough understanding of it. And then um, the last question is kind of inspired by one of our um, value statements, which is a culture of respect and transparency. And um, I want to kind of second what Trustee Lugo said. I appreciated the callers um, commending the equity allotment. I'm excited to learn more about it. Um, but I have to ask if, um, was there a member of our, of our comm staff whose job is to get paid to make our district look good, ask or encourage their friends or colleagues to make comments tonight? We have all of our staff that we expect to ensure that we communicate good things that are happening in our district. That is something that I would hope all of us would want to do is to communicate great things that are happening and ask folks to communicate that across. I don't think it's unlike when um, some of you have asked the chamber to call in with regard to um, our college or career or military readiness when you've spoken with um, Gilbert Zavala from the chamber. So I think it's um, about all of us ensuring that we have all the positive information that we can have. I appreciate that. Um, I think the key difference here is, um, and this could be a, a longer discussion with the board, but I want to be very clear that um, we are not paid to make the district look good. <laughs> we are paid to advocate and organize, um, and that's the distinction. So I would like the board to consider the ethics, um, or, or you know, if, if my hunch is correct, um, I would like some more information on this. I think we can uh, talk to our council and make sure that we have the discussion, I think, Good appropriately in the executive session, closed session. Sure. Uh, trustee, I'm sorry, Trustee Senior. Sure. I'm done. Yeah, sorry. Trustee. Um, I have something that relates to the budget that we won't go deeply into, but I want to be sure we're talking about a scorecard piece of it um, as you guys are planning. Thank you so much for bringing those preliminary suggestions to us in May. I'm excited about the equity allotment and learning more, and I, f I think it aligns with our scorecard item number six. And um, when we talked about finding a way to measure a sense of belonging, a sense of continuity in an activity, in a, and, and um, the wording is the percent of students in grade 11 or 12 who successfully complete a third or fourth course in a CTE coherent sequence or an approved list of courses shall increase from, you know, we'll decide to we'll decide. Um, by August 2026, and, and we're going to look at student transcripts for that. And I know when we approved that measure, we talked about what that approved list would be. And when we talk about it in May, I would love for that to be part of our conversation as well. We had talked about an art sequence, uh, an athletic sequence, if you're in theater, if you're in band. Um, I know a lot of the CTE courses were, that we're trying to find a sense of belonging and a sense of connection there, so I would just love to make sure our scorecard conversation includes a conversation about what, how we find that and measure that. We'll be able to bring you the samples of what have been used up to this point to generate, because we went back in time mm -hmm. to go ahead and utilize those coherent sequences. As a matter of fact, our, Dr. Reach and I spoke about those today. So I think um, um, Carolyn Hanshin will be able to bring us actual here's what was used to say, here's what it looks like, so that if there's feedback or misalignment, we'd be able to look at that. And then, of course, the idea of providing um, schools an opportunity. I think um, a couple of Saturdays ago, we it was the first time elementary campuses as a whole, I think, participated in UIL at the elementary level, and they were our students and our teachers and our principals were and parents were very excited about that. So things like that out that include giving access to students. We know our PTAs in particular areas really do uh, focus on getting students so many of those, whether it's chess club or number sense or um, ex extemporaneous speaking and so on. And we wanna make sure that those are also provided, um, as we all know, the whole child, not just the traditional way in which reading, writing, math, science, social studies is being taught, but rather incorporating those in some of those activities. And so um, that's really the focus of that equitable, equitable distribution of our recommendation in the budget. And that would align, I, I think um, we have made notations on that particular goal, 
for you all to give us feedback about um, what specifically you want measured to determine whether that particular goal, does this meet what the intent of that goal is? And Perfect. so we'll, we'll be able to be flexible with that. Thank you, and I think those values are very much aligned that we wanna give our kids this rich experience and connect kids where they haven't always been connected. So thank you, and I'm excited to hear more about that allotment. Thank you. And the scorecard measures, thank you. Thank you, Trustee Boswell. Uh, trustees, any other questions or clarifications? If not, as a reminder to our public, please feel free to share any general comments or questions on non-voting items with the board by email at trustees at austinisd.org. Our next items are part of our commitment to discuss student achievement. And so tonight, for our first item, we will be discussing the special education map growth middle of the year uh, in reading and math. Dr. Elizalde. Thank you, President Rodriguez. Mm -hmm. Trustees, um, we are getting to a portion that also we've heard about quite some time with regard to special education. Um, this is an area that, as I turn it over uh, to Chief Casas, uh, there was particular attention on the growth progress measures that you all wanted to ensure we weren't just looking at absolute value in special education, but that in fact we were also calling out specifically for these students meeting growth and specifically growth targets. So there are gonna be some, um, I'm gonna say some differences from the goal itself because as you reread the goal, the goal is gonna be at the meets level because that is the state expectation and requirement. And that was also part of um, the initial data that you even saw earlier on. Um, it's also gonna be part of the special education Stetson report that we're going to um, be reviewing with you as well. And so given that, you're, we'll be able to talk today about those GPMs that are specifically focused on whether students individually, right, not as a whole, but whether this individual student is meeting their individual progress goals that would be determined um, as we move forward. And so we'll look at both reading and math, and I'm gonna turn it over to Chief Casas to introduce. Um, Go one. Good evening, trustees. It's great to see everybody tonight. Tonight we're talking about scorecard goal number one, students currently receiving special education services demonstrating achievement on state assessment on all grades, all subjects at the meets grade level uh, will increase from, on the posted document, I believe there was a typo, it had 36 and it's been corrected on the one on the screen, which should be 26. Um, to XX, which is the goals that we'll be talking about in May um, for um, by August of 2026. So for tonight, um, again, we're talking about the, the goal progress measures for students who receive special education services who meet or exceed their growth projection on reading, um, on map growth assessments for all grades, and for GPM 1.2 is for math of students meeting their growth projection on on the math map. So on page two, we will see that the, the first chart shows that as a district, we um, went from 26% to 21%. Um, from 2019 to 2021, we had a five point decline compared to the state that had a three point decline from 24 to 21. And then at the table at the bottom, um, shows the data for the goal progress measure. And again, in previous um, scorecard measures, we were looking at the percent of students that were on or above grade level. Um, but for this goal, we're looking at the percent of students that met their projected growth targets. And so you see that there's no data for the beginning of the year because in order for a student to meet their projected growth target, you have to have a beginning RIT score. So because last year for the end of the year, um, we were flexible because of everything that was going on still with COVID that we didn't require the end of the year assessment. So there is no beginning of the year projected growth target. 
but for the following year, we should be able to have one from end of the year to beginning of the year. So for this year, um, now that we have everybody that took the beginning of the year, the students who were with us at the beginning of the year received a growth target, and 45% of our students um, that received special education services met their growth target on reading. And for math, it was 56% of the students uh, met their growth target. And so if we move to the next page on page three, for comparison, we had all students broken down by demographics, including special education. So on the table, you will see the first table has at the all level broken down by all economically disadvantaged and non-economically disadvantaged. So at a very high level, you will see that at the all group, 45% of our students met their projected growth target compared to 53% of our non-special ed peers or all of the students collectively. So there is an eight point gap so interestingly, the gaps are a little bit smaller when you look at the percent of students meeting their growth target when we look at, um, compared to when we look at the percent of students on grade level. Um, and so you see that for students that are economically disadvantaged, there's a comparison of students who receive special education services, 43% of our economically disadvantaged students compared to the all at 48% and non-economically disadvantaged 49 compared to 57% on the reading. The second table shows the math comparison again for all students compared to our students who receive special education. And you'll see a similar um, for students at the all, 56% of our students receiving special ed compared to 61% of all students. And economically disadvantaged, there's a four point difference between the students who are receive special education services compared to um, the non or the group as a whole. So 53 compared to 57 and 59 compared to 63. Then we wanted to break it down to the next level, which is the goal progress measure. So on page four, you'll see the breakdown of that bottom line, which is the students who receive special ed, and then the breakdown by demographics of that population of, of students. So what we see here, if we compare at the all level, again, 45 compared to the 53 on the previous chart, and then for our demographics, for our students who are African American that receive special education services, um, in reading, they were at 43% compared to 48% on the previous chart. And for our students who are Hispanic, 42% compared to 49%. And for our white students, it's 52 compared to 60. And then for our emergent bilingual, it's 41 compared to 47. And then for our math on the second table, at the all, you see 56% of the students met their growth target compared to, on the previous table, 61% um, percent at the all level. And then when you break down the demographics, African American students who receive special education services, it's 52% compared to 56% on the previous table at a four point gap. And then our Hispanic students, 54% compared to 58%. And then 59% of our white students who receive special education services compared to 64% on the previous table. And a five point gap also with our emergent bilingual students of 53% compared to 58%. So what's interesting is that while we're focused on the goal progress measure of the percent of students that met their growth target, we went back and looked at, well, our end of the year goal is um, based on the percent of students that are at the meets or above. So we did dig a little bit deeper to see, well, where are these, we're, we're celebrating that our students made, met um, their projected growth target, but where were they in relation to being on grade level or above? And so when we did look at the data broken down that way for, our, for reading, students who receive special education services were at 19% on grade level or above, and for math, it was 14%. Um, on grade level or above. And so we still have um, some work to do there in terms of getting our numbers at the on grade level or above to mirror our projected growth numbers. Oh, sorry, and that I think we're gonna see, and you all will have, I'm sure, lots of questions around um, when we bring forward the Stetson report, because specifically it, what this data then begins to have us at least ask the question, are we setting the right progress 
measures for students. Because if they're meeting those targets, but they're not getting on grade level, then what do we need to do differently? Um, and so we just wanted to make sure we differentiated that we feel certainly the students are making progress. And then the question, how is it that we're arriving at those targets for each of these students? Because ultimately, the goal is for them to be just like the same gaps that we are working to eliminate between students of color and students not of color is the same that you all have asked uh, us to continue to value, which is also with regard to students receiving special education services. Okay. And so the next part of the report is a response to the data. And so we're gonna transition to um, the other PowerPoint, Jacob and Laura if you could pass out the folders. So we know that we've talked about it every month that the instruction is at the classroom level is what impacts you know, our student achievement. And so in response to the data, uh, we, um, everything that we do is to help improve the quality of instruction by ensuring daily instruction is differentiated. And for our students who receive special education services, we wanna make sure that the instruction is individualized based on their individualized education plans. And so tonight I have Dr. Cherry Lee here with me. Um, Dr. Gill is very sick at home and so she is joining me tonight. Um, Dr. Lee is a literacy and dyslexia expert and I'm super excited to have her here with us. And so before I turn it over to her, I just wanna set the stage a little bit. So every, you know, similar to in previous presentations where we demonstrate strategies from our strategic action plan on under academic excellence, uh, tonight we really wanna dig deeper into what does instruction look like for students who receive special education? We talk a lot about scaffolds, accommodations, and modifications, and so we really wanted to, to explain what does that mean, what does that look like, and the types of decisions that teachers have to make when they're planning for their class. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Lee. Thank you. Thank you for having me here tonight, and I appreciate this audience. So we'll go ahead and get started. So students receiving special education are general education students first and receive access to high quality core instructional supports that are available to all students. Our Austin ISD curriculum writers produce culturally proficient curriculum that promotes authentic learning experiences through collaboration, problem solving, and student voice as outlined in our Austin ISD strategic plan. The following slides show how a lesson can be adapted and or modified to meet the unique needs of students receiving special education. We'll use a real example from a sixth grade language arts lesson. The unit name is Seeking Comfort in Times of Hardship and the genre focus is informational text. Let's dive deeper and see what learning looks like in action in Ms. Garza's sixth grade language arts class. And Ms. Garza uses the gradual release of responsibility model that I'm gonna do it, we're gonna do it, you do model that Mr. Hicks talked earlier about. And she differenti differentiates instruction for students to promote student acceleration. She collaborates with a special education inclusion teacher during their planning period to support students receiving special education. Ms. Garza ensures learning objectives are clearly posted in student-friendly language along with the daily agenda. The learning agenda and objectives promote ownership of student learning, and students can refer to these throughout the lesson to ensure they're on target to reach the expected success criteria you see posted here in a real classroom. Ms. Garza knows all students benefit when classroom procedures and routines are consistently followed. Next slide. Here we see a variety of graphic organizers that Ms. Garza uses during core instruction to help students categorize and retain information. She uses these visual scaffolds to build and anchor student learning. The image on the left is a T-chart that the teacher and students completed together, while the image on the right shows student examples of graphic organizers used, doing re used during reading comprehension activities. So trustees and Dr. Elizalde, I now ask you to take a moment and review the back of your first handout in your packet. So if you'll go ahead and pull that out, and it's the back side that says definitions and examples. All right. 
A scaffold is a general support provided to students to help them achieve a learning goal. Both accommodations and modifications are instructional requirements documented within special education or 504 plans. An accommodation ensures students have access to grade level content by removing learning barriers. And a modification changes the actual content and learning expectations for students. You'll see some examples of these in the right hand column there. Yeah, on the next slide. Yeah. All right, now meet Tanisha, Marco, and Darcy, three students in Ms. Garza's fourth period class who receive special education services. Tanisha has a specific learning disability in reading with the condition of dyslexia. She's reading about three years below grade level. She receives dyslexia intervention during a supplemental reading elective and inclusion support within her language arts class. Her favorite core subject is science and she loves to doodle. Marco is a student with a learning disability in written expression and he also has ADHD. He receives inclusion support in language arts. He looks forward to trying out for the middle school soccer team in April and he reports his favorite core subject is math. Darcy has autism and a speech impairment. She receives resource and inclusion support along with occupational and speech therapy. She enjoys attending lunch bunch with a school counselor and an eighth grade peer buddy. Her favorite core subject is social studies and she uses technology to read books about animals. All right, you can go to the next slide. Thank you. Ms. Garza meets students where they are, and she makes adjustments to content as necessary based on assessment data, accommodations, and modifications outlined in the student's special education or 504 plans. We're gonna review these now on your handout. Again, the first handout on the first page, it says implementation of accommodations and modifications, a classroom example. All right, and let's review some of those accommodations and modifications that these three students receive. First of all, she uses, Ms. Garza uses scaffolds for all students in her classroom. All students benefit from instructional scaffolds there. A few of those are graphic organizers, which we've already seen and talked about. Additional ones include when Mrs. Garza front loads content knowledge, and then she activates prior knowledge by using visuals, manipulatives, and short video clips. Now, Tanisha receives accommodations. Some of those include the use of a text reader, learning ally, she also receives small group testing and oral testing administration, and then she receives extended time on assignments and assessments. Marco also receives and benefits from accommodation. He uses spell check, word prediction, voice dictation. He also receives preferential seating, and he uses a digital note-taking guide to assist him during lessons. Darcy receives modifications, and again, this is changing the level of the rigor based on her instructional needs. On reading passages, she receives simplified vocabulary. The reading passage itself is below grade level. She also receives modified assessments that have reduced answer choices. Let's take a peek at two of the articles here from News Ella. This is a resource that we use in Austin ISD. And one of the articles is at grade level. You'll notice the other article is identical, but it is three years below grade level. So students have access to the same concepts, but appropriate to meet their needs. So Tanisha and Marco are working with the grade level article. And then Darcy is using the grade level, or excuse me, the article that's below grade level to meet her needs. Let me interrupt just for a Absolutely. second because I want to make sure because sometimes you look at the title and you think that what we handed you is the exact same one. And so it, it's actually to ensure that our students can access the same level of rigor. We remember how many times we've heard from our community and from teachers and from parents that students can understand the content. They're struggling accessing that level of rigor. So we don't need to not have rigorous content, we just need to have it in a manner that a student can actually connect with it. And what happens when we do that is we accelerate the learning. And so I also am sitting next to um, Ms. Lugo in a classroom, and I may have a different one, but see when I look over, even though hers is at a much higher level than mine, it doesn't look different. And so I don't begin to feel like, well, wait a minute, how come this one, like, because normally what will happen, or what we used to do, is we'd actually have different selections. And I immediately, and some of you may remember, like, 
people say things like the bluebirds or the buzzards, and yeah, um, it actually ex existed at one point. And so our kids know that, and it doesn't reinforce high expectations. And in keeping with our board's courageous values of ensuring that we have high expectations for every children, every child, so that we end up producing high outcomes for every student. And so I just, sometimes you just look at it, and which is a good thing that if you looked at it and you thought it was the same, but as you read it, you recognize the content is, and I just, I know I'm emphasizing it, but it's really important because it's a key component when we talk about cultural uh, relevancy, when we talk about having kids have access to the same good stuff that every single student gets access to. Sorry about that. No, that's exactly right, and I'm really glad that you mentioned that. I also wanted to note that Tanisha, even though she is reading three levels below grade level, her decoding skills may prohibit her from accessing that sixth grade level text, but she actually reads this when she's um, uh, at her desk using a text reader. So she's accessing this digitally, and the text is actually read to her. So she still has access to all the concepts and all the rich vocabulary that she's building. So she's not you know, necessarily reading a third grade level passage. Darcy, on the other hand, needs a third grade level passage because she has difficulties with comprehension and vocabulary. So um, the teacher and the special education teacher have selected passages to meet both of their needs. And so we're, we're not going to make you read it, and we're not going to do a reading activity, but we did want to demonstrate and highlight, because we talk every month about scaffolds, accommodations, and modifications, so we wanted to bring that to life so that you can see how we have to modify and adjust depending on the needs of our students. And again, everything is driven by the IEP, the Individualized Education Plan, um, that the teachers have to use as they're planning daily lessons so that they can differentiate the instruction so that all students have access to the rigor. And that concludes our demonstration. Thank you. Thank you. Um, trustees, now is the time for us to ask questions on the current vision. Our goal tonight is monitoring and ensuring our reality matches the vision presented. So when asking questions, we should try to focus on the data presented, asking questions about who, what, why, and how. And trustees, anyone have a question? Trustee Boswell. Um, thank you both so much for this presentation. I appreciate it and for the data. And thank you for the news, Ella. It, uh, I'm a skeptic that technology is always the solution, but I think in this case, this is a brilliant um, solution for kids. And I really appreciate being able to see the same article, knowing that kids can have participate in the class conversation, um, inclusive in the best sense of that word. So thank you for showing us this example of this. I really appreciate that um, understanding. And as someone who doesn't have special education direct experience, I learned from you guys, and that, that was helpful to see. So thank you for that. Um, I have a question about the RIT score and the targets. And I heard you, Dr. Elizalde, talk about asking whether the targets are the right targets. Um, are the RIT scores normed by race, economic advantage, English language learner status, special education status? How personal to a student's individual situation are the RIT scores? The RIT scores are normed based on their starting point. So whether yeah. you're white, African American, Hispanic, if you're a 217, you're a 217. Yeah, okay. there's no, I want to be clear. The expectation on a RIT score has nothing to do with anyone's background, um, race, color, ethnicity, religion, gender identity. It has absolutely nothing to do. It's always going towards what's on grade level so that we purposely do not end up creating a different set of expectations that we might be putting limits on individual students due to uh, unconscious bias or something to that effect. So RIT scores are universal. It's where should a third grade student be at this time of the year in this in reading or mathematics. Perfect. Thank you. That's very helpful to understand that. I, I had not been clear on that in the past, so I'm very glad to know that. Um, I have also have a pattern in the data we have in front of us in um, a question about that. Are there patterns in who's 
included and who's not, because I see that the students reflected in the numbers we're talking about today were students who were tested in English present on the snapshot date and tested both on beginning of the year and middle of the year. And I'm curious about how many, you know, kind of what percentage of our students who re receive special education uh, services that leaves out and whether there are patterns in who that leaves out. So actually we are struggling because this is one that our team will have to, none of this exists in a data file with the Texas Education Agency to this granular level. We can get it, our team is working on it, but we're gonna have to go mm -hmm. individual student by individual student. Um, we were also even looking with regard to um, our other groups of students, we were able to tell you, like for instance in middle school, last year we had approximately 33% of the students that even took a state assessment and their attendance during last school year was even significantly lower than that. The difference with this is um, we actually had more students that received special education services coming to school, as you all may recall. That was a group of parents who really were recognized the need more for their students to ensure they were receiving gen ed and the special education services. And so it, it is one that uh, we're, we're having, our team will actually have to go individual student record by individual student record. It's going to take some time um, along with the day-to-day -day responsibilities. Um, at some point we will do our, our very best to give you what we'll be able to collect um, because you asked the same question we asked earlier and we um, found out that that's the difficulty level of that data. Okay. So, so we we'll don't work know yet, it. but we will. We don't okay, know. Thank we you. And we will do it, but since it will be a, a human calculation sure. and there won't be any way to do a, you know, check and verify, we're the only ones with the data. Mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll need to check our own work, so to speak, I don't want to mislead in that we'll be able to check against some other um, data source. It'll be all internal. Okay. The only Thank thing you. I would add is that in order for a student to have a projected growth target, they had to be here at the beginning of right. the year to test at the BOY. Um, so it would be looking at the number of students that enrolled after the after the testing window um, that wouldn't be included in this comparison. And in reference to the snapshot date, it would be students who enrolled after the October 31st PEAM snapshot date. Okay, thank you. That's mm -hmm. also very helpful. And then um, I find it interesting and, and, and now unsurprising because we've had the same pattern again with um, reading scores versus math scores. And we're seeing the same patterns we've seen again. And, and um, I am confident your explanation will probably be the same as it has been. Um, and, and I have a question looking at this. Uh, if, if a 50th percentile is what we would expect the average growth to be, again, we're achieving below the average we would expect for reading and above the average we would expect for math. And does that suggest to us that we're doing something, we're missing something in reading that's not even getting to students to where we would expect them to be based on the average? Our goal is to, to do even better than the average, obviously, to make up um, what students need to make up. So what does that say to you about the techniques we're using, you know, kind of beyond what we would expect from the pandemic, that it's different for decoding? You want me to start? And then, so I think it is, you know, I'm, we're going to sound like a broken record again, but the skill sets um, and reading is an extremely complex um, internal process. And um, actually, um, Dr. Lee's expertise starts in reading, as a matter of fact, before she went to get even more specialized with dyslexia and 504 and special education and so on. But reading itself is extremely complex and abstract. And, and it is not a new skill from year to year beyond third, fourth, and fifth grade for the most part. So being able to understand context clues, decoding, inferencing, summarization, main idea, drawing inferences, those same skills are the same skills, and you've heard us say this before, between pre-K through grade two, we are really 
wanting students to learn how to read. By third grade and beyond, we begin a shift of reading to learn. So the text, the T-E-X-T, -E that students are engaged in either in a classroom, whether I'm reading a book, a novel, a poem, um, an advertisement, a play, um, the complexity and the density of that particular text gets more complex. It's, it's got several themes with one overarching theme. So if I'm struggling as an early reader to do those things, then as the text become more complex, I'm going to have even more difficulty. So in order, which is again why we want to continue to focus on we only have 44% of all of our third grade students currently uh, reading on grade level. And if we disaggregate that from an economic perspective or by uh, race, color, ethnicity, it's even more concerning. So given that, we know that reading requires us to do things like accessing the content, allowing readers um, technology readers, if I read about this particular content, I have an understanding. Now I can be exposed to it at a higher level with, because now I know what they're talking about because I read it at a different level that I was able to understand. So those processes of increasing reading outcomes take a much longer period of time. They have to be consistent. You have to read every day. This is one of those where it may sound a, a kind of um, like that's simplistic, but the only way students get better at reading is by reading. Mm -hmm. But it's what are we giving them to read? How are we asking them to read? Who is reading with them? What questions are being asked? Mathematics, on the other hand, particularly post-COVID, students missed skill instruction specifically. So when they're provided that skill instruction, our teachers are so talented that what happens when they provide that skill, students learn it. And so they get it and they're able to continue and connect it. And the reading portion, um, as you see across the state and across the nation, continues. This exact same pattern exists. Um, some districts are, are really banking on tutoring as a means of improving reading. And, and that was part of um, the House bill that required us to do the additional hours. Is it 30 hours of additional um, for students that had not been successful on STAR? Um, mm -hmm. And the biggest challenge there, though, is so who do you get to do those additional 30 hours? Because that's at a 3 to 1 ratio unless a parent gives a particular permission. So as you start thinking about how many people that entails, what we've seen in the state of Texas, I, I'm sure it exists in the nation, though, if we only rely on tutoring as the mechanism, we're not going to have enough people to be able to provide that. Um, and so it's, it's a strategy, but if it's not accessible, it's not available, then how do our principals get students mm -hmm. those? So we've approached it from a different perspective, which is let's scaffold, let's provide access to this content in a variety of ways so that students can begin to understand the content and then improve their academics. But that is going to still take time and we want to be able to do that during the school day. We don't want students, I mean the least effective mechanism of our pullout programs. Every time we pull students out, we now take students out of the regular instruction that everybody else was getting. So now we create a new gap. So we know that there's a long road ahead of us, but we also see the same patterns again as well that um, we continue to see any category of student that is identified as white outperforming any other student group. And that's the same pattern we've observed before. Yes. So we know we need to continue to work on the cultural relevancy and proficiency and meaningfulness for our students in that relationship building. And I appreciate you calling that data out every time we talk about this. Thank you. 
Um, so I have a question about the understanding the differences between math and reading, whether there's a belief, I would assume that the RIT scores understand that, that NWEA, which I don't know what it stands for, but the company that makes the map test um, understands that reading takes more. Is the RIT, um, are the algorithms based on pre-COVID data? Have they not caught up? Kind of what are we seeing? Well, a RIT score is, is based on what a third grade student should be doing should what is considered on grade level that hasn't changed pre-pandemic or post-pandemic but the the anticipated growth um, based on where an individual student lands mm -hmm. it are basically what what the student and individual score gets mm. predicts the growth we expect from that student right are those predictions based on pre-covid data because it would still seem like even with all those conversations if those predictions were based on universal data 50 percent should be kind of the baseline we should expect and we should be concerned if it's less if it's based on pre-covid data then that concerns me less and i'm just trying to figure out but I'm, they're I'm probably not expressing it well so they're they renormed. Did renormed yes they are renormed they have i'm renormed sorry past yes COVID. now i understand where you're going thank they're you. renormed okay that's so me. every thank time you. they're looking for those writ scores and then projecting like here's the growth it's still about how do we get a student at least one year's growth mm -hmm. by the end of the year now we can ask them we need and so we'll look at it and say if we need a student to get 1.2 growth a, a year and two months what does that look like what would the you know what would the trajectory need to be in order for that to happen but initially they are they have been renormed and they do still allow us, essentially they're always at a minimum saying, in order to say this student got one year's growth, regardless of where they were, right? Mm -hmm. But to get one year's growth, obviously we need to get more. We have to have disproportionate gain. We have to have more than a year's growth because if students are behind and all we do is get one year's growth, then we're still not catching our students up. But we don't have to catch them up in one year. And so we think that that's the important component is ensuring that we are getting the growth and then we can begin to ask ourselves, how do we accelerate that growth? Okay, that's very helpful to me. Thank you for um, discerning what I was trying to say, not very clearly. I appreciate it. I'm glad we have communicated. Um, and then I have one more question about strategy. I know the special education department was investing and, and you guys have presented to us earlier this year work that you're doing with families and connections that you're doing to demystify the process, bring families into the process. And I don't see that listed in the strategies um, and it's possible that I've missed it. But how is work with families um, part of the strategy for helping to support our students more strongly, knowing that each of these students has um, adults somewhere in their lives that, that can be part of this and, and how does that fit into the plan? No, I'm really glad that you asked that. So I could speak about two different committees going on. We have an inclusion work group and an inclusion book study. We also have um, the SEAC, right, our special education advisory committee. And then we also have the dyslexia subcommittee. So there's lots of opportunities at the district level to meet with other district lead, uh, leaders and families um, that want to be a part of that. And then at the campus level, we also include or encourage, I should say, family engagement, right? We encourage strong partnerships between teachers, between special education teachers, between all of the related service providers like our occupational therapist, our speech and language pathologist, our physical therapist, and the families um, that they serve, right? And so that is a critical component of success for our special education students, right? The partnerships and that engagement between you know, campus and families, but also district and campus and families as well. Thank you for that. I would um, love to see, I know, you know, family is, is every student has adults in their lives um, that we're talking about, whichever, whether we're talking about middle school, third grade, wherever we are, um, enrollment. And I would love to see a family piece of that on our strategies, mm -hmm. just to have that really clear to the community, to share that work that is being done would be fantastic to see if that's something we could add in the future. Thank you all very much, I appreciate it. I'm sure that there's, we have lots of opportunities to improve with the, the family engagement component um, of all areas, but certainly with regard to special education. So we'll see as we go back and look at our strategic plan, we'll look and see where um, we would be the way in which to ensure that that voice is included um, and ask for some of our campuses to give us, I'm sure we have campuses that are doing some 
some really good ways in which they're doing that, and we don't need to reinvent the wheel. If some of our campuses are willing to share with our other principals, then we can incorporate that as part of the strategy. So absolutely, we will add that in as something to make some modifications. Thank you. Yeah, I know there's good work being done, and I would love to see that celebrated and highlighted and so we can discuss it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Trustee Boswell. Trustee Anderson. Hey, this is right up my alley. Thank y'all. Um, so I'm going to start mine off with a request. Um, I see all this wonderful stuff, but I would actually like to know what a teacher needs <laughs> to do their job successfully in, in trying to support a student in special education. So if I'm a teacher at, you know, so-and-so campus, can I see what that looks like? So just say, for example, um, dyslexia interventions. Can I go somewhere and see a teacher in action with the adjustments you've made as it relates to the dyslexia interventions for students? Can I go see that? I mean, I, I this all is wonderful, but I would like to see what it looks like for a teacher. You know, are we creating more of a burden? Are we giving time so that, you know, for those students, you know, my concern is always those students who have slipped through the cracks. Are we, is this so much where they can't provide the time for those students? So what does this look like for a teacher in District 1, District 3, and other, di I, this is what I, I would like to see. That's my request. I'm going to start off with I'm going to see what Dr. Lee is going to need to clean up for me after I, <laughs> I give what, what I've observed. So number one, I think first it's what setting is the student in? That's, so based on an IEP and based on an ARD, I think the first question is, what's the student's setting? We always want to work towards a more inclusive setting wherever possible, but just because inclusion is considered um, like a gold standard, it sometimes gets misnomered because it may not be what's best for a particular student. So we have to be careful that we're not doing either extreme that we're not saying these are students with special needs regardless of what they are and we're going to put them over here away from everybody else and they're not going to interact with anyone else versus these are students with special needs we're going to put them with everybody else and we're not going to have any supports for them we're just going to say they're going to go out so to me those are the two cautions that inclusion is considered the best setting with the proper supports and those proper supports. So first it's a setting. Second is what is the condition that is causing the student to have difficulty reaching their goals? And so from there, whether it's dyslexia or whether it's um, some specific special education modification, a particular reader or a particular um, intervention. Um, but lastly, Yes, I, you, you absolutely can come and visit. And there no, um, there is nothing you can remove off of my plate, said no teacher ever. There is always too much on a teacher's plate. And we do need to think differently about what we can remove so that the focus is on students. Now, there are going to be some interesting revelations in our Stetson report that are going to say we have some things and that we're not utilizing some things effectively. So sometimes it's not that we don't have enough. Sometimes it's that we're not effectively utilizing the resources that are there. In other cases, it is that we need more resources. So I would say first the setting, second, what is the condition that requires a student to get that assistance? And then are we providing the supports that are necessary? Um, and absolutely, we would continue to welcome and encourage any trustee. I know that Dr. Lee would be happy to facilitate a visit, um, Trustee Anderson, to any and several that you or any other trustee would like to attend.
my question. So I see AISD approved dyslexia interventions. When I first got on the board, it drove me absolutely mad because I felt that the district was putting dyslexia on a pedestal and, you know, as, as a parent who has struggled in this district with a child with autism, I'm like, hey, so does that mean that dyslexia gets the recognition and not? So my question is related to training. So will training be mandatory or optional? And the reason I say that, and it's to uh, Lynn's point, um, one struggle I have seen and I've experienced and I've seen with, with others is, you know, having a child on the spectrum and having someone who has never taught a child on the spectrum, then, you know, maybe not going to training. So how can you best support my child, say, in reading or math if you don't, if you've never supported a student on the spectrum. So maybe I am a visual learner, right? But instead, you say, Letitia, there's your stuff. This is what I need you to do. You run off 100 things to me, and I only catch like the first two things, and I'm just sitting there, and you're like, hey, why you're not doing your work? Well, this, is all, this all comes back to training, right? So what, what works best for me is if you, you know, sit by me and be like, hey, Letitia, this is what I need you to do. You read the first two things to me, circle back around. Hey, did you understand what I said? But my point is training. This has been a challenge. I have, <laughs> I have talked about this till I'm blue in the face long before I got on the board. It has been a struggle, a struggle in this district related to training and special education. I don't care what nobody say. This is my experience. So how with the training is it going to be you come in one time i see you have specialists that will go to campuses as needed but if i am someone maybe i'm interested in getting continual training what does that look like i'm so glad that you asked that question because i'm going to come from the point of my very first year here in austin isd as an educator I came right out of an alternative prep program, right? And I was placed in a special education classroom. I was so excited and I realized, oh my gosh, I didn't learn all I needed to learn, you know, in those nine months. And now I'm in the classroom and I need to be serving children and I did not have the skills that I needed, right? So I totally agree with you. We have to build teacher capacity, general education teacher capacity, special education teacher capacity. It's not only a one and done training, it's ongoing training and follow-up. So for me, the specialists, and we do have instructional specialists at the district level that support autism. They also support dyslexia um, and other learning disabilities as well. But those specialists are really for the ongoing coaching and the follow-up and the mentoring, right? Because that the training, it, 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 it's great. It's a one and done training, but it has to be follow-up, right? And I have to be coached to be able to improve. Um, so in Austin ISD, we do offer a pretty extensive and expansive uh, professional learning opportunities in the summer and then at the start of the school year. I will be honest, it has been challenging to get folks to training during this school year because we do have a lack of subs, right? So that has been a challenge for us. It's been a barrier, but it hasn't prevented from training. Our special education department is training teachers in the evenings and on Saturdays. But you're right, we can always look at improving, um, you know, specific um, professional opportunities, especially around the area of autism, because that is, as with all special education disabilities, that is a team approach, right? We want to train comprehensively and collaboratively with our speech language pathologists. They're the experts in, you know, communication, right? We want to work with our occupational therapists. We want to work with our physical therapists. We want to work with those teachers that are trained specifically to work with students with autism and bring all of those folks to the training so that we're all hearing the same thing at the same time and we're working together and collaboratively for these students. Um, one thing our department specifically, and I'm gonna speak specifically to dyslexia because that's the department that I direct, is 
we talk about an inclusive model. We're not only training our 123 dyslexia interventionists that we have at the elementary school and at the middle school level. We're training our special education teachers as well. And the expectation is that they are also able to provide high quality dyslexia intervention. So I just wanted to put that out there as well. But it's not just one group of teachers should receive the training. It's special education and general education and our related service providers and our evaluators as well. Because our diagnosticians and our school psychologists, yes, they're assessing children, but they're also making recommendations in those reports that are critical for helping teachers that are developing the IEPs to develop meaningful IEPs. So I completely agree with you. And I'll add just one other component, Trustee Anderson. It has been a challenge with the training just given all of the asks of teachers, right? Pre-pandemic, during pandemic, um, reading academies. Um, and, and so there's been a lot of mandates that have come beyond even just at the district level. We also have a lot of teachers that ask us for the training and need us to be more flexible and creative in how we provide that, which also goes to what Dr. Lee said, that it's really, it's, it's really incumbent to do uh, coaching in the moment because it's when I'm doing the work that for our industry, for the educators, we're most effective when it's in real time. When I'm working with students and someone who knows how to work with someone with autism sees for me, like you're trying to make eye contact and with this particular student, that isn't what I should be doing as I'm working with this individual. But if I haven't recognized what the tiering of those supports are supposed to look like, I think I'm, you know, and I'm not even having to do it in a way that may be seen as directive, right? It's not a, you need to look at me, but it's like, hey, you wanna look at me? And even though I'm doing it that way, that is not in this particular student's IEP, that may not actually be the way in which to engage. Eye contact may be very further down on this IEP. And so um, dyslexia has become, I think, an area that there has been a lot of investment because we recognize that early intervention and in dyslexia creates a whole lot more success for students. The later we are in identifying dyslexia, exacerbates the situation. Now with autism also being an increasingly, I mean, as I took just an administrator's training on autism, recognizing that every single one of us actually have those characteristics. The only difference is how far of those characteristics do I have that ultimately then get me considered to have this particular diagnosis that then I'll be more successful if I get some of those supports. So I think what Dr. Lee said about not just the autism uh, teachers receiving the training, but in fact, everyone receiving that training. But how do we do that in a way that says, we gotta get everybody dyslexia training, we gotta get everybody autism training, we gotta get everybody uh, sheltered instructional protocol training for students who are coming from a different language. How do we put that in a, in a manner that doesn't overwhelm? And so part of our conversation has been, which are the, that's the data are so important. Which are the students that we're identifying more of? And autism right now is now a new area of increases of identifiers and then then is that the area we need to start with? Now, it doesn't mean we stop what we're doing with dyslexia, because I think we're starting to see um, the last report, Ms. Casas, you brought me, we're lowering the number that it is to identify dyslexia. Before, um, and I don't remember the actual number, I just know it was higher, and that over this past year, teachers have been referring students to get screened, and it's, being, and it's happening at an earlier stage which means we should be able to do better with students. So I don't think we have a specific, like here's how we're gonna make sure it happens, and we hear you, and we do have to figure out how to do it in a way, I mean, PPFT should be part of a, um, a, an incentive for us to get teachers to do that so they can use that as part of their PPFT, but they may also have some other areas that they may also have of interest. So at the end of the year, I think it's a great way for a principal to connect with a teacher 
throughout their year and then say, here would be what would be best for you. And then for us to have, if you will, like a catalog or a menu of here are the, here are the trainings we have, knowing that we would actually create that based on the data that principals would give us, these are the things that we need. So using our district data, using campus level data, creating a menu for teachers to have summer, ongoing, and end job embedded training throughout the year. I know it's not a, this is exactly how we're gonna solve it, but it's a tiered approach. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Ashy. Um, thank you so much. Um, and I really, really do enjoy being able to see the lessons and being able to have them described. And, and um, I think it's really helpful for our community to see how based in the teaching and all, where all those decisions are coming from. So I very much enjoy these. Thank you so much for doing them. I'm, I am grateful. Um, and then, of course, as a um, special education teacher, I really, really appreciate this lovely chart and just think it should be kind of hanging everywhere, um, for, for especially for new parents. I think that that's so helpful for them to have as they're coming into understanding and uh, be in the art process that just seems very lovely and, and a wonderful explanation. Um, and speaking of coming into the process, I am uh, quite sure you guys are not going to be surprised that I have some questions about um, early childhood <laughs> and uh, the pre-K part, because I know that in, in the scores, um, when we look, it's K through eight. Um, however, of course, um, students that qualify for early childhood intervention um, can, can qualify for the day they turn three and can begin in our program. And so I was just curious, um, and it made me start to think, um, who's not in these numbers? Because I also know that there are some students where um, they're not, they don't take the STAR test. I know it's a very small number, um, and maybe maybe you all know that number. I'm, I, I, I hate to put you on the spot because that's a really um, specific question that you may not know. Is it is there our specific percentage? Well, I'm really glad that you asked that, Trustee Ashley, because you're right. Some students are not going to be reflected in this data because it is uh, documented in their IEP that the MAP testing or the STAR testing is not appropriate for that student. That's going to be documented in an IEP. As far as assessment of the younger students, we do use CIRCLE, um, CLI CIRCLE, which is actually required by the state. So pre cares are taking the CIRCLE assessment, and it's giving teachers rich data on um, their Spanish language development or their English language development. It's all those pre-literacy skills, right? Oral language, phonological awareness, vocabulary, listening comprehension. So we do have that data as a metric. But as far as assessment of the youngers, that would be like the one kind of universal metric that we're going to have. Yeah. Um, and then I had another question um, because uh, I know that it's not necessarily funded um, all of the time. But do we offer um, three pre-K three inclusion? I was just curious. Yeah, early childhood special ed would begin when a child, you know, turns three years old. And we do have inclusive programs all over the district. Now, Dr. Dimby and Mr. Rodolfo Rodriguez, um, Dr. Dimby supports early childhood, and Mr. Rodolfo Rodriguez supports special education campus supports, including that early childhood special ed program. So they're going to be um, the best folks to talk to, and we can definitely um, take that to them. That would be great. Yeah. I would enjoy that. Maybe yeah. that would be the classroom I would visit. Um, yes. That, that would be, that, that would be uh, my people. Um, and then the other question that I had is that when I went in and looked through the schools um, that you, you were kind enough to break it out by school performance, um, I noticed Rosedale wasn't in there. And I was wondering if anybody, if there was a reason why their information wasn't there. And the map data? Yes. It, it may be that there's very few students at that specific campus that are actually taking map. Um, and again, MAP is offered uh, kindergarten through eighth grade. So our high school students don't take MAP. Right, it's our uh, K through eight in Spanish and English. Okay, and even if they're developmentally on a lower level, maybe they're, they're eighth grade age, but developmentally, developmentally maybe working at a first grade level, would they still be considered like they would have to take the eighth grade map or like, does that make sense? Like I'm trying to it understand. It does and that is why, exactly, and they would. And that is why, you know, an IEP team could come together and our committee could come together and say, this isn't developmentally appropriate for this student based on their cognitive needs. And then they would be exempted from that. Okay. Yeah. Great. Mm -hmm. um, and and then as I know, I have no doubt that you're monitoring um, those those children that don't fit into these tables. Um, how What does that look like? 
Yeah, I'm really glad that you asked that. So again, students that are receiving special education have IEP goals and teachers are collecting data and providing those progress reports every nine weeks. So all of that data is dependent on what the goals are. If it's a reading goal, they might be looking at reading fluency. They may be looking at single word decoding. Um, if it's a social behavior goal, they may be looking you know, at um, appropriate behavior and expression um, with other students and communication, things like this. So it's really dependent on what the students' needs are. And that's all de you know, developed by that ARD committee um, and documented in that IEP. And then the goals will be listed in there as well. And that is the data that parents are going to receive based on their, you know, their students' needs. And that is the data that the district is watching as well in order to make sure that those students are making progress also. Exactly. Exactly. Okay, mm -hmm. great. Well, those but, are my But I don't want to shy away from the fact that the biggest challenge for our teachers with that, because you all have raised this across the dais many times, is the software that is being utilized um, to track that is the, I'm not a special ed teacher, but I'm paraphrasing from them. It is the most teacher unfriendly um, way in which to do that. So they are having to, when we think about what is one thing we could do. So someone might say, well, well let's just get rid of it overnight. Well, the challenge is you do have to have something else in place in order for us to be able to do that. So I think the team has been working through procurement mm -hmm. to try to see what can we, after getting teacher input, what can we actually implement that the teachers will actually feel will help them to keep track of it. So in some instances, teachers have like, you know what, this is so hard, I'm just gonna get, we're gonna go back to the days when I was in a classroom and I'm gonna do it on a piece of paper in order for me to keep track of that. And, and so I know the team is working as quickly as they can with obviously all of the priorities that we've heard even just in the first few hours that we've been in this meeting. That's also a priority in working to get teachers the kind of support just in a software that can make some teachers' life far more difficult mm -hmm. if they don't have the best um, way in which to keep track of that. But that would be something that we would be able to go in and, hey, how are they progressing? And right now, it's, it, it's making teachers' lives very difficult, which ultimately ends up affecting how we can report our students and keep track. And, and we are looking at moving to a new system. Mm -hmm. okay. um, do we anticipate when that transition will happen? I think we have to watch for our procurement laws as well as a contract agreement that was signed with the previous provider. So we're working in negotiation with how to do that. I understand. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you, Trustee. Uh, trustees, any other questions? Trustee Singh? So um, I always love looking at this level of data. I know it's not easy for y'all to put this together, but I can't tell you, um, sitting up here, it is so, um, I'm just super grateful that you guys are willing to go there and show us where we have needs. Um, so I'm, I, I find the, um, the chart that's on page four to be really interesting. Um, yes. It shows the growth um, for reading uh, and math broken down by demographics for special education students. So I just I'm, I have to ask, like, why are our African American and our Hispanic students in special who are receiving special education services showing like a 10 percentage point less growth than our white students? who are receiving special education uh, and reading. Yeah, I think that was the same observation we were making earlier, that that's the exact same pattern we see um, that we've pointed out in every area. Mm -hmm. um, if Specifically, if we even broke it down with economically disadvantaged. And so I think what we can, the one thing we can surmise is this, this has to do with um, since this is the same pattern we find even when we look not just within non within gen ed students that are not receiving special ed but even when we disaggregate that further and go to the economically disadvantaged 
versus non-economically disadvantaged and are white economically disadvantaged outperforming the non-economically disadvantaged yes. children of, of color. And so it's certainly uh, not something that we can say this is what is causing it. It's the same pattern, which I think reinforces the fact that cultural proficiency and unconscious bias and equity and us needing to drill down back to resources, campus level by campus level, plays a role because we see this exact same pattern regardless of what content, regardless of what student group we look at. So um, I appreciate that. And I just, I guess I wanted to ask also my, my usual question, which is related to um, staffing. So on April 1st, in, in our board update, we saw that I think there were 47 vacancies in special education. Then on April 8th, just a week later, we saw that there were 74. And I have, so I don't know how many students on average a SPED teacher sees, but it seems like a lot to me. <laughs> um, what is the relationship? I mean, is there a relationship between actually the existence of a staff person who is actually trained to provide these services and our student outcomes? So I'll answer the staffing numbers first, and then I can defer to the special education or academics for the other part. So in the system, how the system works is when we have vacancies, and I'm going to start from the beginning of the year, let's say August when school starts. If we have a vacancy, we track that vacancy until it's filled. And there are times where, you know, a vacancy will go off the list and a vacancy will come on the list. There comes a certain point of the year, and we, we set that date, and this year it was April 1st. So we had all of our vacancies, you know, for out, throughout this school year mm -hmm. on the list. When schools get their budgets for the following year, so they generally will get their budgets in February, we go through their budgets and what they are getting for the following year, whether, you know, like the ads or those, or like we move units or whatever it is, whatever those are, we start posting those and they count as vacancies. So on April 1st, we still had this year's vacancies posted and at the same time we were posting for next year so we didn't have 78 special ed classrooms we didn't go in a week from having 45 classrooms to 78 classrooms without a teacher we still have the 45 right now and we're posting and hiring for next year so there's just an overlap of what we're counting we're double counting those okay yeah so with yeah. regard to the numbers, there hasn't been 30 SPED teachers that left between when that report was written and today. Correct. And then Correct. with regard to the second part of the question on the training, with regard to that this is a result of, I, I want to make sure oh, I understood. Yeah. Wait, oh, yeah. yeah. It's, well, I've asked it six times probably <laughs> from this seat, right. which is what's the relationship between student outcomes? And having, a uh, and having an actual like qualified teacher yeah. in the classroom. Oh, well, I think so, we... Yeah, so I think it's a little bit more complicated with special education versus the core classroom because the core classroom does all the instruction. But for our students who receive special education, they get instruction and support from two teachers, their core instruction mm -hmm. teachers and these teachers with special education um, certification. Um, so depending on the vacancy, we would need to dig down and see where the vacancy is, if it's in a specialized classroom like a scores or a life skills, or if it's an inclusion teacher, and then identifying what grade levels and what students they're supporting, mm -hmm. um, because then the students are still in, 75% of our students are in the gen ed setting, getting core instruction from their teacher that has to be accommodated and modified based on the IEP where the inclusion teacher then supports. So it's a little bit, it's not as cut and dry, but definitely we know that having vacancies impacts student achievement. Yeah, and then the other thing on that, just to clarify, so we have various categories of substitutes as well, and we do have a category of someone that is working on their certification, 
but we hire them as a substitute and they they work on their certification throughout the year. So in some of those, when we fill them with a long-term substitute that's working on their certification, mm -hmm. then we'll also have that too, but we're still counting it as a vacancy because we have to wait until they pass their certification test. So we have some of those as well. Okay, I appreciate yeah. that. But there's no doubt um, that having a vacancy would have a negative impact on student academic performance. Thank you. Thank you. Trustees, any other questions? Well, Tr Trustee Lou. Thank you. I'll make it quick. Um, so help me understand, um, uh, Chief Gassas, oops. Uh, when I'm reading the uh, scorecard goal monitoring report on page six, next steps, um, and I'm sorry if the answer is embedded within the document. Um, I haven't been sleeping very well, so I'm firing on all cylinders just a little more slowly. Um, and so uh, the next steps, especially around um, imagine, or maybe it's, uh, no, it's got to be imagine Espanol, right? It's not imagine. Uh, <laughs> so imagine Espanol for pre-K through two, um, and then the other resources as well, but then the professional development offerings like um, Esperanza, uh, Spanish, mul Spanish multisensory structured language, and Wells II. Um, are those, um, kind of help me understand, like, are those resources and offerings that were previously provided, but now there's like gonna be uh, a leveling up, like encouraging use of the resources, or, or what's the difference? So I can start and then Dr. Lee can again clean it up a little. <laughs> so the, the, the resources that are listed are available for our students, and some of these are different than the example that we get with the Nuzella articles that are leveled based on the text, um, the Lexile level of students' readability. Systems similar to like the Imagine Learning and the um, uh, the Spanish version of it, it's a specific skill building. So when the teachers get their map data back, they know the specific skills that students are still developing and they can identify those on the software and then assign them to students as skill building to practice. Um, some of the other things, so those are currently available and will continue to be available um, using our blend platform um, so students have access to it. And then you did see the list of the professional development offerings that we're going to offer starting over the summer. Um, we've already started with our principals. Last month we did um, the first session with our Stetson step-by-step -step on master scheduling. And then this month, we're gonna go deeper into inclusion and um, the co-teaching model with between our gen ed teachers and our inclusion teachers. And that's at the principal level. And then the rest of this will be available moving forward. What would you add, Dr. Lee? I would say that uh, Goal Book and the Imagine Language and um, Imagine Espanol, uh, as well as Esperanza Wells Rewards, Reading by Design, those are you know the names of specific programs, and they're really instructional tools. So you know what I would say is it's you know the tool is great, but what's more important is that the teacher actually knows how to use the tool and the student feels comfortable on it as well. Now the Esperanza and the Wells and the Rewards, those are specific programs for dyslexia and reading intervention, and then Imagine is available for all students. So all students in pre-K through two, that is an instructional tool. It does provide supplemental and Instruction. It is available for all students, and we do provide district level training on that for you know teachers to learn how to get kids on there, and then kids to be able to access. Um, the same with Goal Book as well. And I, I think the one thing I'd also want to point out about Esperanza in particular is because we heard that for um, I, I wasn't here, but I heard from parents that there was a long time of parents feeling like they had to pick between special education services and bilingual services. Mm -hmm. And That's so right. as we were reviewing professional development that was available, this wasn't listed as one of those options. And so um, how we, we need to ensure that parents are entitled for their children to receive both. They should not have to pick, I'm either gonna get special education services for my child or I'm going to get bilingual services for my child. So there's still not a lot of those out there, 
but when they are out there, we want to make sure that they're at the forefront and availability for our staff. Absolutely. We actually have a TEA grant that pays for all teacher training and materials for Esperanza. So, um, yeah, we're definitely focusing on that, and we have multiple offerings this summer as well. Okay, great. And that was the, the piece that I was looking for, too, is like, this doesn't sound like what we offered, but that there was a concerted, really purposeful thinking about, okay, what do we have? What could we bring on? And then kind of doing that in an iterative um, process. So my next thing is, um, you know, m more of a request, I think, less than a question. Um, uh, thinking about communicating information to parents, whether they're incoming to AISD at whatever grade level their student is, um, or existing parents with students with um, students who receive special education services, thinking about you know how is this information communicated succinctly? You know, there's a, some diehards that watch board meetings. Um, but the average parent is just trying to keep food on the table and take care of their family. And there really is, I think one of the things that um, so many of us, um, well, on, on the board and you all as uh, executive leaders within the administration and of course the superintendent, you know, we often hear about what's lacking and what's not going right. Um, and that's pretty common anytime you work in the public sector. You very rarely ever get a call that says, hey, you did that really well. Um, and it's amazing when it happens. Um, but uh, take, take into account that oftentimes the, the um, um, more vocal uh, information that that we hear is how things aren't working how do we get some of these these pieces of information out to parents to say basically sending the message that you know whatever may or may not have happened in the past here's what we're doing now and you know making it simple making it easy making it appropriate so that the parent can read it and say oh wow I didn't know that you know imagine Espanol that's cool um, and really kind of I think it kind of goes back to Dr. Lizalda's comment earlier is like really thinking about how we get the word out you know I'm glad that you asked that question because we just started up the dyslexia subcommittee and um, we invited the parent su uh, support specialist coordinator to be a part of that because I think that person can be vital in um, disseminating information and actually giving the committee feedback and how we can improve parent engagement and family engagement, right? That's definitely a goal of the dyslexia subcommittee and I hope to take some of that information and share it with other groups as well because we're going to get some great feedback. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Lugo. Trustees, any other questions? If not, uh, Trustees, I'd ask you to raise your hand if you're ready to accept tonight's report. And if you're, and if you're not, um, would you like to briefly share your feedback? That would be me. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> um, I really do want to accept this report because there's so much I truly appreciate about it. Um, and, you know, this has nothing to do with the wonderful presentation, so I want you to know that. Um, but it's really, like, as I've asked many, many times um, from this seat, is I sometimes wonder we're not um, including enough in this report about the whole system. Um, you know, I know we can't put the whole system, right? It's just a two or three page report. But um, the fact is for most of the school year, about a third of our vacancies have been in special education. And so I, I hope to understand better what the district is doing to show real curiosity about why our teachers are leaving. You know, these are teachers we have invested so much time in and are really hard to replace um, and develop strategies that will make them want to stay. Um, and it doesn't, you know, what I hope to see going forward is a more clear connection between the outlier campuses, the Title I campuses that are, that are showing huge gains, um, and, and see what we might learn from them and include that in our strategies. So um, I, I really did want to accept this. This is not a criticism of any of the people <laughs> who are working. I know you guys are all working your tails off, um, but um, I hope to to see a fuller explanation next time. Thank you, Trustee Singh. Uh, Dr. Isale, any comments? 
Uh, no, sir. I definitely would like to engage in what the concrete examples would be so that we could do a better job of ensuring that we could get the support. So a fuller report, um, I think, would, would help us with a discussion later on of giving some tangible examples so that I don't lead the team in a direction that we're providing more, but it's not what is being asked for. Thank you. So for tonight, we're going to move on to our next item. We have five more items to go. The next item is the elementary planning time, 4.2. Dr. Isabel. So as we work towards um, hearing directly from people in the field, part of the conversation in preparation for this was that coming from a central office perspective rather than a campus-based perspective has a layer in between there. So we really thought the best way to do this would be to truly engage in a um, locus of control conversation between our board of trustees and our principals from a, um, I think, a, a very varied V-E-R-Y-V-A-R-I-E-D group of schools, communities, and principals. So I, I do want to just highlight a couple of things that I kind of heard in our, in our public comment that I want to make sure we are, like, that we make sure we're clear on. So in looking for the, the, the goal, the goal was always to ensure that we use student data as the driver. And so we currently have 44% of our students reading on grade level in our district, which means 56% of our students are not on grade level in our district. We know that one of the high leverage um, things we can provide to teachers is time not just to do data, but it's in creating, the data itself doesn't create the changes or the outcomes. It's the response to the data. But our teachers have to have time to analyze that and then work together collaboratively to create those responses to the data. And our principals need to be able to have time when they are all together to help them or their assistant principals lead them through asking questions, much like you all ask us, in working to meet these needs. So first and foremost, art, music, and PE had nothing whatsoever to do with the original conversation. Now in the process of evaluating how could we provide our teachers some additional time, um, I said, let's start with what do the specials rotation look like? Absolutely, because that is the area that um, can be more flexible. It was through those questions that we discovered that we were not in compliance with the Texas Education Agency code law requiring 135 minutes of PE. Now, they actually recommend their first statement was 30 minutes a day each day of the week, which would actually be 150 minutes. But they give us a little bit of wiggle room and say, if you can make 135 minutes work for the week, then we'll, we'll be OK. It doesn't have to be 30 minutes a day. Um, and then they went on to examine other schools throughout the state and recognized that, for the most part, um, 45 to 1 um, in a gym was what they would consider something that could be managed. Because at that time, there were school districts with 60 students in a gymnasium with the gym. Um, so they did think safety was a concern, and they did want to ensure that there were reasonable accommodations, and they did not want school districts putting 90 students in a gym with one adult. And so they gave us a 45 to 1 maximum um, ratio of an adult. They also did not specifically say, so if it's more than that, what do you have to do? They actually said, it's up to the school district, but you must find a way in which you are saying you are going to mitigate, should you go to 60 to 1 as an example, which we are not. But if we were going to go to 60 to 1, that we would actually have to dock anything above 45 to 1, we would have to document 
what is it that you're going to do to ensure that there's safety in um, during physical education? And I use the word gym, and physical education doesn't always have to take place in a gym, and you're gonna hear a variety of different approaches to that. So I wanna make sure, though, that this wasn't about cutting music or art. The first priority was recognizing that our student data um, needs some support. And the biggest lever for our student academic outcomes is our core content teacher. And they're the ones who don't have that additional planning time. They're the ones that when I drive by, I go by Cunningham and I still see cars out there. If I go Blazier, I still see cars out there as I do for all of the schools that are here, whether it's Langford or Blanton or Doss or Clayton. So um, we did want, it was a goal of ours to do that. And I do think there's a way for us to do that where it can be a yes, yes, and a yes. Um, I have asked our chief financial officer, I don't even think our principals know this because this came after analysis today, to look at reallocating um, 1.75 million to provide teacher assistance and actually go ahead and meet what was the original request from our physical education teachers of 30 to one. And so we will staff all campuses at the 30 to one um, with, with physical education um, as opposed to the 45 to one. So I'm hoping that also gives you all a little bit of relief in how you've been working to plan um, because we will be able to well, we have to be very careful because whenever we add money to staffing of any sort, those are recurring costs. So for instance, we can reallocate money that we were not expecting from the ADA adjustment that was done and instead of um, using that to free up more ESSER dollars so we could give you all some more ESSER dollars because we were using a lot of ESSER dollars in our district to supplant we'll be able to free up some of that ESSER dollars and use about 1.75 million to give each elementary campus the number of assistant principals needed to do a 30 to one for PE instead of the 45 to one. And I'm, I'm hopeful that that will, that will help alleviate some of the concerns that are certainly our PE teachers had and certainly that I heard from our, our community as well. Um, and so again, we need to ensure teachers have planning time. We need to stay focused on, we know that our students can be on grade level. We know we need to do it by third grade. We know it gets harder the further removed we get from the classroom. And then we wanted to allow each of our campus principals to work with their teams to actually create what would be best for those particular individual campuses. So providing parameters and then allowing you all as principals, our principals to provide those solutions, including getting their teachers and their staff and their community input. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Mays. So uh, good evening, President Rodriguez, Dr. Lozada and the trustee members. Uh, I often tell the team that, you know, on this uh, best day that being a principal is one of the hardest jobs that you can ever have uh, amongst any job that you can ever have. And so uh, today I did want to say thank you to uh, all of our principals um, and the educators and the work that they're doing within their respective communities to meet the needs of our students. Uh, at this time, I do want to turn it over to Mr. Hicks, our Associate Superintendent of Elementary Schools, and allow all of our principals to uh, introduce themselves and the fantastic work that they've been uh, engaging in uh, and the thoughtful and collaborative processes uh, within their local communities around their campus master schedule. So thank you all and thank you, Mr. Hicks. Yeah. Good evening, President Rodriguez, Superintendent Elizalde and board members. I too wanna to echo what Dr. Mays just said about the job of the principalship that I did for 13 years and absolutely loved. And um, I really, really respect each and every one of you for being up here and providing voice for the principals and the other educators in the district tonight. I don't want to take up any time. Um, so I'd like to just introduce, the, have them introduce them. I'll introduce them for you because that'll take longer for us to go around and have them ha each have a microphone. And just in case you don't know who's here, um, we have Victoria O'Neill from Blanton Element 
Annie Webb Lanton Elementary School. We have uh, Heather Petrozini from Mary Jane Cunningham Elementary School. We have Letty Pena from John C. Blazer Elementary School. We have Nathan, Dr. Nathan Steenport from Liana Doss Elementary School. We have Amy Gonzalez from Mary Luke, not Mary Lou Clayton, Nan Clayton. Um, Mary Lou Clayton was friends with Lee Elementary School. <laughs> Nan, Nan Clayton Elementary School, and I'm dating myself. <laughs> and Martha Castillo from Jane Langford Elementary School. And we're going to begin with uh, Dr. Steenport opening our presentation for us tonight. All right. Good evening, President Rodriguez, Dr. Elizalde, and Board of Trustees. Thank you again for having us here this evening to share with you the work of all of our elementary school principals and their staffs on changes to our master schedule. We want to begin with our why. Why are we implementing changes to our master schedule? This begins with the best interest of our students in mind. We are always striving to improve student outcomes. We, like you, want Austin ISD to be the premier te Texas school district that is known for the quality of education we provide to each and every student in our district. High expectations and equally high outcomes for all of our students are attainable. If we provide our teachers with time to dig, uh, excuse me, uh, dig deep into the understanding uh, our students examining student work and identifying the best next instructional steps in all instructional contexts, like whole group, small group, and indiv in individualized settings. Developing a master schedule that provides opportunities for teachers to work in professional learning communities during the school day with a focus on responding to student achievement data uh, will facilitate the realization of our goal to improve student outcomes for all students. One of the core ideas from Leverage Leadership states that effective instruction is not about whether we taught it, it's about whether the students learned it. Having the time to examine student work and analyze student outcome data through the dedicated PLC time will allow both teachers and principals to fully understand what our students have learned and where there are needs for additional instruction to support student mastery. The elementary uh, master schedule plan will promote equity by disrupting long-standing practices that have not resulted in substantial planning opportunities for elementary teachers and ensure that all students have the opportunity to be engaged in learning that is the result of deep planning. Lastly, we are certain that this change will support teacher retention at the elementary school level. Teachers are always in need of more time to plan with their colleagues, and this change will provide that time. One study within Support, Collaborate, Retain found that when teachers did not have access to collaborative relationships, that one out of every five of the prof left the profession. However, when schools provided ample opportunities for teachers to collaborate with one another, their teachers, the teacher retention rates increased. Next slide, please. The what of this change is summarized um, on the slide that compares our current master schedule with the planned master schedule at the elementary school level. Currently, uh, TEKS-based art, music, and phys physical education lessons are provided to all elementary students and delivered. Uh, delivery of this curriculum will continue with our planned master schedule. The 450 minutes of required planning time for teachers will be provided as it is currently. Board policy DL Legal explains that 450 minutes in each uh, two-week period, oh, excuse me, uh, the 450 minutes of required planning time for teachers will be provided as it is currently. Board legal policy, DL legal explains that 450 minutes of planning time must be provided within a two week period. So what's the difference about the planning master schedule? Most notably, there are two additional 45 minute planning periods each week for common planning across the grade level. Additionally, because of the increase in the number of minutes of PE, we will now meet the required 135 minutes of physical education through our instruction during PE, thereby eliminating the need for teachers to use instructional time for workout, for wellness, or WOW to meet the state requirements. Next slide, please. So how, how will we, how will all that was just described be accomplished? In developing our master schedules, there were specific parameters and considerations by all elementary principals and their staff worked within. They include 45 minutes of daily PE with a potential for one flex day, ensuring that all students receive between 180 and 225 minutes of physical education each week, 
and exceeding the required 135 minutes of minimum of structured activities. As mentioned earlier, continuing to meet the 450 required planning minutes within a two-week period, including additional 90 minutes each week for PLCs for teachers who are uh, with two 45-minute PLC days, ensuring a minimum of, of 180 minutes of music and art for students in a three-week period. And lastly, special education teachers will have required planning minutes and participate also in PLCs. We want to also note that the essential area teachers will continue to be provided daily planning time. Good evening, President Rodriguez, Dr. Lizalde, and Board of Trustees. I am Leti Peña, the very proud principal of John C. Blazier Elementary, and I'm going to be presenting on the planning process that the elementary stakeholders uh, engaged in. So since this process began in late February, we, had, we have had multiple opportunities to engage with leadership at the district level, campus level leadership, essential area teachers, and all teachers and staff. At the district level, the Office of School Leadership, Academics, and Human Capital worked together to plan for a principal think tank intended to help develop the parameters within which schedules would be created and to formulate guiding questions and a principal action plan that would keep everyone on pace for working closely with our school communities. On March 2nd, we participated in the principal think tank made up of 28 elementary principals. Our goals that day were to test and refine the parameters and considerations, learn from colleagues who had successfully developed sample schedules with their campus level team, and simply have the opportunity for a larger conversation with district level leadership and colleagues around both the challenges and the opportunities, the changes in the master schedule created. The initial think tank was followed by an all principal work, work group the next day on March 3rd. Since then, all elementary principals have, facil have facilitated campus level, level engagement with our essential areas teachers, campus leadership team, grade level leads, finally, and finally, with all teachers and staff. The aim of these engagement opportunities was to collaborate, create, collaboratively create a campus master schedule that would be the foundation for realizing our goal of improving student academic outcomes for all students, as well as to receive questions, feedback, and suggestions from our staff. After the engagement opportunities, we surveyed our students, our staff about the process, their role and their experience with the process, and their sentiments regarding the changes. We'll be sharing the results of the survey with you shortly. By March 25th, all principals had completed the action steps to collaboratively develop a, a draft master schedule with their staff. We're looking forward to sharing our final drafts with the larger community, including our PTAs and our CACs by April 29th. Lastly, upon completion of the dis district-wide process of campus engagement and communication, a team of principals and leadership from the Office of School, of School Leadership and Academics will convene to revise and rewrite the standards of service to be aligned with new parameters, proposals, and implementation plans. Good evening, President Rodriguez, Dr. Elizalde, and Board of Trustees. I'm Heather Petrozzini, the proud principal of Mary Cunningham Elementary. I'll be presenting on the staff survey results. After engaging our campus-based staff, we conducted a survey that posed five questions. Our survey elicited responses from 1,654 campus-based staff members with all elementary campuses represented. Responses came from a variety of positions, including classroom teachers, special education teachers, our essential area teachers, and other campus-based staff, with the largest percentage coming from our classroom teachers who made up approximately 64% of respondents. Next slide, please. When asked if we, their principals, had shared the draft campus master schedule, 98% of respondents answered yes. When asked if they, campus staff, had been given the opportunity to ask questions about the changes to our campus master schedule and its impact on our students, 97% of staff answered yes. From our perspective, this high rate of positive responses is reflective of the level of engagement that all principals facilitated at our individual schools. Next slide, please. When asked if staff had the opportunity to provide feedback on the draft schedules, 95% responded positively. 81% of staff who participated in this survey indicated that they supported the elementary teachers receiving additional planning time to support instruction. To dig deeper into that question, the survey asked to what degree respondents supported the camp, 
To what degree respondents supported the planned campus master schedule? We'll look at those results on the next slide. Next slide, please. Survey participants were asked to assess the degree to which they supported the changes to the master schedule on a scale from one to five. One represented strong disagreement, three was neutral, and five indicated strong agreement with the change. 54% of respondents chose either four or five on the five point scale, indicating their agreement or their strong agreement with this plan. 25% of respondents were neutral, and 21% expressed disagreement or strong disagreement. President Rodriguez, Dr. Elizalde, and Board of Trustees, we want to thank you again for the work that you do for all students in our district. Thank you also for your support of the hard work that all teachers and all principals do to ensure high academic outcomes for all students. Thank you. We do have two sample schedules, I believe, to, to share with the, the board members and the trustees uh, for the principals to walk through. I think, Ms. Petrozini, you have the first one if you want. Here, okay. Thank you all for being here. Uh, trustees, are there any questions for our principals? Trustee Rodriguez, is it okay yes. if they go through those samples? Oh, they, you want to go share? through these? Sure. Yes, sir, just to share. Oh, sorry. Before, before, we, uh, before I recognize Trustee Anderson, I just want to see if there was any other trustee who wanted to go first. Y'all can go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so the Blanton schedule was uh, created um, to meet the needs of the Blanton campus um, with the number of classroom homeroom teachers that we have, the number of allocations that were given to us for art, music, and PE uh, through our the regular budgeting process. And so what we have at Blanton as our draft schedule is PE every day um, for all of our grade levels. Um, and then we have a innovative and flexible schedule where um, every student will have 45 minutes of art two days a week and 45 minutes of music two days a week. That leaves uh, one day a week, which could be Friday, but isn't necessarily locked in, so we can call it Flexible Friday, uh, for those art and music teachers to support problem-based learning in the classroom or do special projects. Um, and that really gives us an opportunity to be very creative about the additional opportunities that we can give our students. And so um, this works for uh, Blanton, and it, but of course it is not the only possible schedule, and so Heather can also talk about her possible, um, her, the draft schedule for Cunningham. Thank you so much. So Cunningham has some unique programming on our campus where we have the Emerald Lagasse kitchen outside, um, and our students go to the farm one week and to the kitchen next week. So we have baked that into this schedule. So if you look vertically across from eight to nine on Monday, for example, first grade, one class of first grade will go to art, one, fir one first grade class will go to music, and then one class will also experience culinary arts all at the same time. This gives our teachers three additional hours per week as each classroom rotates through that schedule. So in addition to the 45 minutes daily of PE, three days a week, each grade level will have an additional hour to plan collaboratively as a team with special education there as well. So that's how, and that works through for every grade level for us. It gives our essential areas planning time at the end of the day, and it also increases instructional time on the days where you don't have the music, art, or culinary arts. Thank you, thank you. Trustee Anderson. Man, I'm jealous. Y'all got culinary arts? <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am, we do. You can come over anytime. I, yeah, you, I, I kind of, I per like I was over here, like I'm tired, but I kind of, when you said that, like I'm a cook, like I perked up, I'm like, what? Come on over. <laughs> okay. So, <clears throat> thank y'all for being here. Appreciate everything y'all do. Hey, Miss O'Neill, I miss y'all. <laughs> Um, so, what did your schedules look like prior to this um, 
possible change or change for music, art, and PE? Was PE, was it every other day? Was it every day? Was it once a week? What did it look like? So right now, PE is currently every third day. So it goes music, art, and then you have PE on the third day. Music, art, PE. So if you look at that over a three-week period, there's five. You have five PE classes in a three-week period that way. Um, the same with art. You have five within a three-week period. And because of this possible change, is there going to be a reduction? And because that's the what what I've been hearing, is there going to be a reduction in music, PE, art? Um, so every one of the, I think one of the benefits of this is that every campus has the ability to customize, and so um, you know we've talked about equity uh, as meaning that not everything needs to be exactly the same. And so previously what we had was a system where every single student in the district got the exact same thing. And this new planned schedule really gives each campus community the ability to customize. And so um, I believe that uh, definitely for the examples that Heather and I have shared, it is not a reduction. And um, I can't think of an example where it is um, a reduction, but I will also defer to the other principals if they want to add anything to, um, to that statement. When we were thinking about our planning, uh, absolutely, we, we invest in our music and art programs. Every year, we'll have two choir programs, a first and third grade program, and then our art teachers conduct a second grade art show and a fifth grade photography show, which is my favorite. Um, and so when we had that opportunity to confine within our parameters, we knew that we wanted to hold those still. And so the uh, sample schedule that we have planned um, at my campus does not reduce the music in our um, minutes that we currently have in our plan right now. Thank you so much for saying that. Thank you. <laughs> Trustee Wagner. Well, I apologize for joining you all late, but um, what happy surprise to walk in and see some of my favorite faces <laughs> sitting here. Thank you all. I know um, how hard you work um, every day running your campuses and to take this on in addition and to be here tonight to present to us is a lot of extra work for you all to take on and I very much appreciate you being here and being able to bring your expertise to this process as well. Um, I know that there are a lot of concerns that have kind of bubbled up um, from our community through this. I think Trustee Anderson touched on the instructional minutes in art and music as one. Another concern that I've been hearing is um, around capacity uh, in our gyms for our PE classes. And I just wanted to hear from the group if that was something that um, was a concern or how you guys are planning to mitigate that, um, particularly at some of the larger campuses like Blazier or Clayton moving forward. Hello. Uh, yeah, that was definitely a concern at our campus. Uh, we are a larger campus. We have two campus sites. Um, we are a campus of about a little over 1,100 students. So it definitely was a concern. Um, when our essential areas, my amazing team came together, um, we looked at various examples. We talked a lot about space. Um, we ended up at our campus creating a schedule where our students were going to PE every other day for 75 minutes at a time. Um, and so in our schedule at Blazier, uh, because we're such a large campus, because we're at two campuses, um, and we have anywhere between, you know, uh, 140 to 160 or 70 students at a grade level, we really had to think about that. Uh, we obviously are not going to put that many students into a gym uh, alone, even with for adults, uh, we're not gonna do that. So we looked at various scenarios. We looked, um, and actually my, uh, my essential, I kind of just at a certain point provided various different scenarios that I tried to create with my own brain um, and learned quite a bit about scheduling in just that moment, in those, in those moments, and then presented as many of those scenarios as possible to my essential areas and said, okay, let's pick them apart. Let's create copies of copies of copies and continue to work through it. Provided them some time to really think about it. Um, everybody had a variety of, of schedules. And it was actually my um, PE teachers that came together um, and really looked at the numbers and 
uh, with a combination of my other teachers as well, uh, but really my PE teachers came back and said, okay, wait, we can do this um, in, in this way where we can provide PE every other day. Um, we can spread the wealth a little, allow for all of our students uh, to be able to go to music, art, and PE for 75 minutes a day. This is at Blazier. This is a Blazier scenario. And provide up to 75 minutes of uninterrupted planning time for our teachers, which is was really great to be able to do at our campus. Um, I'm not able to speak to other campuses, but we were really, I was really excited to see that happen um, with um, all of the wonderful, all of our wonderful brains put together in that, in that session. And so um, what we have done is between three PE teachers and then looking at another PE teacher at, a, at the intermediate campus. So the idea of having additional t teacher assistance is great because I was already looking at my budget to see where I could fund additional teacher assistance to support that. Um, that larger group at the intermediate site. Uh, and so we're looking at an average of about 28 to 32 to 35 students per teacher in okay. PE. Um, and so that, that looks much better, obviously, than um, putting so many kids. And so we are going to have to be creative still with spaces, um, with our gym space, with our, how many can we put within one gym space with two teachers, using our cafeteria space, our outdoor blacktop, the track space, any other spaces that we have, um, we've gotten pretty good about looking at those, being creative. Great, thank you for that. And um, another question for you all, and um, then I will cede my time to my colleagues, but I wondered when you talk about um, grade level planning time, um, what does that look like in practice, and what do you see the benefits of that being versus the scenarios that you have in place right now for planning? So currently when I think about having those three additional hours a week, I think how can the team come together and collaboratively learn together by looking at our student work, by looking at our student data, and really creating focused plans and targeted plans together to meet the needs of students. So I see those three additional hours for Cunningham being one meeting where we come together, myself included, let's plan, we call it lesson tuning, let's tune our reading plans. You come with them ready, we're gonna fine tune them based on what we know about students. Doing the same with math, and then having a third time during the week to really focus on that data that we know we're gathering, we're inputting, teachers say they need time to be able to work on that, and it's not taking away in another area. So really making sure across the week that that's very focused and deliberate and intentional and follows a rhythm and a pattern throughout the day and the year. Thank you for that. And when you say data, what does that data analysis or that data reflection look like? Because I think I've heard from some parents, does this mean that we're putting even more attention on star scores and that sort of thing? So, so I think both qualitative mm -hmm. and quantitative data. Data can also be looking at student work and saying, where is Heather right now as a writer? Let me look at her writing and let me say, what craft moves can we teach her? What mechanics does she need to learn so that we can move her up and, and help her really understand? So both the looking at student work, but yes, there is the map data that we are looking at that we need to make sure, are you making the progress? Um, but people and individuals and teachers need time to do that and they need to be supported while they do that work as well. That's very helpful, thank you for that. Thank you, Trustee Wagner. Trustees, any other questions? Trustee Lou? <coughs> A couple of questions. Um, what level of support um, has already been provided or will be provided um, to campus principals or campus um, leadership where you know they may feel like they're walking a um, tightrope? Right, like we have amazing principals in front of us, and you know all of our campus have amazing principals, and we also know you know there's varying degrees of um, of uh, support that that campus leadership may need. So I just I is there anything you can say that would um, kind of address the reality that I think parents probably are sensing is that. If you're lucky enough to go to a campus who's figured out how to give your kids music, art, right, all of these things, and planning time for teachers, great. But if you're not as lucky to be at a campus where that was worked out, then what? 
Yes, um, in the presentation, we talked about the principal think tank that was held and the, sh the power of sharing and the fact that each one of these principals and the other 72 elementary principals all have a, a Google Doc that they can see what each other is working on at any given time. And it's the power of sharing and then the power of feedback as well. Each one of them has um, um, sort of formed a mini professional learning community around the development of the schedules. And they're also working with their executive directors and myself too. I've been working with them as well to help fine tune and hone the schedule so that we can make the best possible schedules we can for our kids and make the, the idea of responding to data in, in those extra hours uh, meaningful. I do want to, when we talk about PLCs, we also, have, like you said, PLCs for the adults, and I want to give Ms. Martha an opportunity to share because she led one of those groups because she's a, a creative genius who had some of this already taking place at our campus, and so quiet is kept. We have a dynamo here, and I want to give her an opportunity to share, so go ahead. <laughs> Oh, sorry. Good evening. Um, well, I just wanted to thank you, first of all, uh, for giving us the parameters that uh, gave us the opportunity to think uh, about the possible flexibility to add uh, opportunities for extended planning for our teachers. Uh, we really, really needed that extended planning. And uh, what my community really wanted was uh, opportunity for enrichment. Uh, a lot of our students uh, cannot participate in after school programming uh, because they either don't have uh, the, the way to be picked up or uh, it, it's only available for a certain number of students. We have uh, ACE 21st century after school. And so our parents really depend on the enrichment opportunities that we can provide it. So our community was really asking for that. So I was really thankful that we had the opportunity to provide that during the day so the students didn't have to uh, wait for after school to participate. And we tied it to our vision, which is to provide outdoor learning opportunities with a garden and uh, soccer. And uh, so it just really lended itself to what we were already thinking about and uh, so we thought about having uh, music and art uh, within the parameters, 180 minutes uh, in the three week period and PE every day and then flexible Fridays where they could participate in gardening, soccer, bike club uh, and uh, drama, you know, just things that the students are really looking forward to. And, uh, want to stay in the school. We have sixth grade next year. So 75% of our students decided to stay because of the possibilities of uh, enrichment for them. So uh, aside from the extended planning for teachers, which is really, really needed, uh, I've always heard our teachers uh, complain that they don't get the planning that middle school and high school gets. So I'm really excited about that piece. Uh, there's going to be kinks because change is always difficult for everyone, but I think our community, our staff is willing to uh, work together to problem solve uh, as we dive in. Uh, it always, you always have to take the first step uh, before you get used to it. So I think that uh, our, our community is going to surprise us and we're going to problem solve together anything, any kinks in the system. Thank you, that sounds really lovely. Um, I am wondering about the campuses that have lost staff or will lose staff, especially you know, art teachers, music teachers, um, because again, the, those, are the those are the schools and the campuses where it won't look like, in, in my line of work, oftentimes we would talk about the happy path, right? It's like, all right, some legislative mandate came down. How do we make a happy path? And there would inevitably be um, a not happy path because the world, right? Reality. That's what I'm wanting to hear about is what is it, what are those plant, whether it's continuing PLCs or whatever it is that y'all are talking about, think tanks or whatever, but like what's the actual plan if you don't have PE teachers in place, if you don't have art teachers in place and so on. And it's not from a staff recruitment, it's a 
we all know that there are gonna be campuses that start at the beginning of the year and we're not gonna have enough staff there. That's what I'm talking about. Okay, and I can speak to the numbers a little bit if that helps. Um, so when we did the allocations for staffing in terms of PE, art, and music across the district, there were 38 additional PE teachers added at the elementary level, eight additional art, and eight additional music. And so currently, on the system that we have, the art, music, and PE teachers rotate among schools. And this doesn't do that rotation. It puts that personnel on a campus. The only ones that we have sharing are campuses that are less than 250. So right now, through even like attrition and additional allocations that have been added, we, we're down to 30 vacancies for elementary PE for next year. And that one we do not think we'll have a difficult time filling because PE teacher certification, those are relatively easy to find. And we even have current staff right now who have PE certification that may not be in a PE position that want to take a PE position. So we don't have we don't have any worries about filling those teacher positions. Okay, so y'all talked about PE. What about the art and music? It, it's the same thing. Like, sc schools are allocated full positions unless the school is less than 250. Mm -hmm. And we have eight additional music to the whole bucket and eight additional art. Yeah. But, so I do appreciate, um, like, uh, getting information about well, how many FTEs, right, full-time employees, how many PTEs, right, part-time employees. Um, I think we might still be missing each other a little bit because I'm asking about actual people because a campus could have, right, a campus could have the uh, right amount of allocated FTEs, but they don't have the bodies. They don't have the people. Right, the actual people. Right. So right now, like I said, we know that PE is, we're not worried about filling PE at all. Um, and we already have, you know, those postings up and we're interviewing and those kind of things. So we can, you know, we'll keep an eye on like those additional ones. But right now with the, the current staff, like I'll give you an example. We had a campus where we have an employee that like, do you want to go to this campus or this campus? Because right now they're split. And so we're working through those situations now. But I, those are not the positions that we anticipate are the hard to fill positions. The art, <clears throat> the art and music. No, art and music won't be hard to fill. Okay. Not, yeah, not nearly as yeah, hard we as. We struggle with core, like okay. math, science, e yeah. Special education, so bilingual. It's definitely special education. And do yeah. y'all see any? Um, and I'm sorry, um, uh, Chief uh, Stevens. It's Leslie. I, I keep I keep thinking about like. Cool, not good on the numbers. I want to know, like, on the ground, what does that look like? Um, so I'm thinking about, like, are there clusters where you see the vacancies? Like, is it a certain uh, area of Austin? Is it spread out across the city? Because um, that also matters, too, in terms of not just recruitment, but making sure that you have a good uh, uh, fit between, you know, if, you ha if a campus has a vacancy and they're trying to do this magic um, to create a happy path, how do you find the right person with the right skills who's culturally proficient? I mean, that's, it's, yeah. I mean, talk about a Venn diagram, right? That's like a little sliver. Yeah. So I think that's what I'm not hearing is like, yeah. what, it, what do those campuses, is there a cluster, right, re geographically? Um, and how are those campuses trying to create solution so I say I was gonna say I you know I've not, I've not we've not put it out on a map or anything but I do know like we have our big huge job fair I want to say April 28th kind of thing and so that's where these guys come in <laughs> is because that's where they will be interviewing candidates and all of that and so you know they're gonna start they're looking now for next year like this is the the prime time to hire for the following year so I mean as far as like a specific candidate, it's going to be dependent upon their campus and what they see is a good fit for their campus. 
Yeah, and I can, we can allow one of the principals to answer that question because every campus does something different. I mean, some of them have, you have to actually teach a model lesson, some, but everybody has a team that may be supporting the hiring process, but I'll defer to the principals to support them. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> you know, when I, when I think you're asking the question about maybe retention or recruiting people to the campus, I, I really look at, you know, the process that we're doing right now. Like, we're working together as principals to be able to, to make this new schedule work for next year. And of course, there's complexities, there's things that we have to work out. Um, but one thing, at least I can, we can talk about my campus specifically, is that we involve people in that planning process to talk about what are some benefits of this, what are some things we need to be aware of, um, and that's the entire learning community. That's not just our staff, that's also maybe some of our students, but also maybe some of our parents as well. Um, so, so from a principal perspective, I, I certainly look at that as, you know, certainly my job is to make sure that um, I'm, I'm putting forth a, a very solid why, um, and of course talking about additional teacher planning uh, for next year, that is, a, that is definitely a solid why, but also trying to make it um, you know, known for our special area teachers and also support them on, okay, what can we do to support you as well um, in this exact plan right here? So that way they understand and it's like, okay, we're all in this together. We all, we all have consensus moving forward. All right, my last question on, on that particular front, um, and you'll probably notice I keep asking the same question from different angles. Um, so uh, a little, maybe the insight will, will help um, uh, help us have some mutual understanding about why I'm asking this. So in my um, paid daytime job, one of the things I get to do, which I actually really love, is business process redesign. Some people, their eyes roll and they're like, I don't even know what that is. But you go into an organization, you figure out what's wrong, what's broken, um, what's working well, you know, where are those uh, departments where it's like really low morale, where are the departments that have really high morale, right? And so, and Dr. Mays, I know you know this because we had that conversation when I did that walkthrough. I will always appreciate hearing like the amazing creative like backflips that our campuses do and that you all at, at uh, admin do here at, at headquarters. I will always also want to know where, where are the campuses where students aren't going to get the happy path? And we know that. Um, based on history. I'm not predicting the future, I'm basing it on history. And so that's where I wanna know, like how will those campuses be supported? How will families know, like, hey, my kid can get that too? So the goal is for every campus to provide the happy path, and we do hold our principals to the high standard of pro providing that happy path, uh, but we are here to support them. And so there is a quality control system that, you know, Mr. Hicks just talked about. You know, executive directors and the support for campus principals, it's not going anywhere. Uh, having, you know, thought partners in the work uh, or uh, the challenge that comes with us walking onto your campus looking for how are we addressing and meeting the needs of all of our students uh, and allowing for this creativity and these opportunities to, 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 to be provided for students. Dr. Lizalde is providing a, a, a nice bucket of money <laughs> for you know, principals to be able to leverage. Uh, but you know, again, those challenges are gonna be there, uh, but we're also gonna be there working together to challenge our principals and challenge ourselves to make sure that across our district that all of our principals are working to provide that happy Pad, uh, and we can talk more about your last walk in a little bit. <laughs> okay. And then the other question is, um, one thing I'll be looking forward to in the coming school year is, you know, what data is being used? How is it being used? How does it inform um, not just the um, elementary uh, planning time, but I think really looking at the um, speaking of redesign, the redesign that's taken place with the new administration and so many courageous changes and real um, intent to improve student outcomes. And so I think for me, that's the part that I'm really looking forward to is understanding, okay, we've got this plan in place. We've got campuses that have happy paths. You know, now, next year, is it working? Where, where could it work better, right? I never wanna say it's not working unless it's clearly not working, but um, yeah, where could it work better and how do we make those adjustments? So, thank you. Trustee Ashi. Um, thank you all for being here. Um, and I'm hoping y'all will get to enjoy a nice long weekend after being here this late this evening. So um, I'm, I'm wishing that for all of you. 
Um, my, I have two quick questions. My colleagues have asked excellent questions. Mine um, are around some of our larger campuses. So thank you, Ms. Pena, for offering some insight into that. Um, one of the questions I'm asked a lot, because you had mentioned you know, being outside, doing outdoor learning. So what do we do when it rains? And that's actually the most common question that I am getting is, if we know we're gonna have to use alternative spaces, what happens when those alternative spaces aren't available? So I'll just share a little bit uh, regarding that, that question. Uh, thank you to the commitment though of, of the reallocation. So a campus like mine sitting at approximately 700 students, we will have two full-time PE teachers, two full-time art, two full-time music. So in my nine years on the campus, this is the first time we've had six stationed special areas teachers every single day. So this is a, a huge win I feel for our students. So we already have a very collaborative PE program that we um, have both of our PE teachers will hold class together in our gym. So there's 22 to one assigned to one PE teacher, 22 to one assigned to the other PE teacher. So when they're starting a unit, they will typically come all together whole group and have up to 44 students in that gym with the two of them teaching the skills, going over um, some of the demonstrations and things like that. And then they can break off to blacktop outside for other classes. So um, when it comes to the larger campuses that have that capability of having the, the two PE teachers allocated already, uh, the concern for uh, the wet bad weather days is not something that is on our radar at all at this time because it's a way that we've been operating for several years now. Thank you. Um, and then I also just kind of, I think, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say something and then there's a question there. Um, one of the things that I know we have a board, as a board have been asking for is to see changes to our student outcomes. And so um, I'm sure that I'm gonna mess up the quote, but it, it was the definition of an intelligence is wanting something different but doing the same thing over and over again. So I do want to um, say how much I appreciate the administration not doing the same thing over and over again, which is exactly what we've asked, is to, to change something so that we can see a different outcome. Now my question to you as principals is, how do you feel about the planning time as the change? And, and what is it about the planning time that you see as impactful? You guys have touched on it, but I'm hoping we can kind of have like a layman's terms conversation about it for the average parent who, who doesn't have the educational um, acronyms that we all love and we all sit around and talk about and it's super fun because that's what teachers like to do. Um, and, and really just kind of what, is, what does that mean? Why will it make a difference? Um, so I'd like to actually uh, just go back just a minute because I would love to give another example of like uh, how to solve that rain problem. <laughs> um, and so uh, at Blanton, we do have um, a gym and then we have also structured the schedule so that way um, the cafeteria, there's no PE during lunch times. And so we will be able on days that are inclement to have a group in the cafeteria, which is um, also a large space uh, and all of our tables, you know, go up and down quite easily. Uh, and so, and then in in addition, we have um, uh, we ha we are attempting. We we're going to see how everything works out to set aside a classroom, so that way for health lessons um, and uh, smaller activities, then students with the staff that we are allocated would be able to move in smaller groups. And so we're really thinking um, about a station model where there might be an adult on the track who's doing kind of a marathon kids type program. There's a station inside the gym where the PE teacher is doing like targeted lessons, and then we also have several green spaces uh, in addition to the covered blacktop where there might be uh, you know, a third adult who's able to be in that space. Um, and so that's uh, ideal for, for um, good weather days. And then for bad weather days, we do have the plan for the gym, the cafeteria, and a classroom as well. Um, and then in terms... <laughs> um, and then in terms of the question about, um, you know, what, what is going to come out of the planning or like what are we planning for the planning time, I guess, is that an appropriate rephrase of... I think it's hard for the parents to make the connection to the, what, the planning time piece. Now, um, I, I know that I, my, my um, husband used to laugh when he would say I would go to work and I went to work at 6 in the morning and came home at 6 mm -hmm. at night. Mm -hmm. And he was like, yes, I love your 7.30 to 3.30 job. It's awesome. Right. <laughs> um, so I know that teachers have done that for a long time. 
And I know that that's, that's my understanding. I, I don't know that like our average parent understands mm -hmm. why it's important to have it during the day and how is that going to make a difference right. for our students? Because if our, our teachers are already doing it after school and right. other times, what, what is it about this planning time that makes it like we feel like this is going to be the difference speaker? For sure. So I actually um, heard a kind of a corporate analogy, right? So if you imagine that you're kind of have a, an office job um, and your job is to lead a six hour meeting um, every single day, but not only in addition to that, so you have to plan and set up for that six hour meeting during the other hours of the day, right? And so that's exactly what our teachers do. They are on stage, they are leading the activities, they are um, essentially like leading a, you know, a session um, for all of the time that they're in that academic time. And then they have to get ready for that academic time um, on their own personal time. Uh, and so, you know, it, um, and we also know that collaboration uh, builds strength. And so if everybody is scrambling and everybody is swimming and, um, and then they, then you kind of get out of alignment and things get a little more disorganized because everybody's just trying to do their best with what they've got. But when we actually can set aside time for really focused collaboration, uh, then the whole um, the whole system will get better, right? The or the or the rowers on the oars will be able to pull in the same direction, um, and uh, and so that is really what's going to improve student outcomes. But then we're also acknowledging the um, you know programming their lessons into blend, or making copies, or making parent phone calls, and keeping up those relationships with parents, and having conferences, and collaborating with special education teachers so all of the we will also be we will be able to do both for the first time and like ever maybe so <laughs> that's what we're hoping for right and I, I mean I again and I, I apologize for the personal story but it does it does make a difference is I have a very vivid memory of a good friend of my, my co-teacher who we were able to stay after school until she had a baby and then we she couldn't stay after school anymore and so it made it really hard to do the collaborative model and I think sometimes um, that, that to me is also a, um, a form of a professional courtesy for us to be able to, to treat our teachers like the professionals that they are to give them that time. So um, that's a personal statement. I apologize for, th for taking that moment. Um, um, and then the, the last question that I had was um, how, uh, because I think this is also a big change for parents, right? And, and I, I love the autonomy, and yet um, what, what, will, what will you maybe try to do to be able to to show people, because I actually believe most adults are visual learners. So how do we, how do we show parents what this looks like, if that makes sense, so so that they can understand? I seem to be hearing from everyone we're not losing time for art and music, and in some cases maybe even adding an additional enrichment um, that maybe wasn't there before. I'm right there with you, Trustee Anderson, on the culinary class. Um, that sounds amazing. Um, so I just was wondering, like what. How will you, if you could give a couple examples of what the communication or how the demonstration is going to go for that for families? I can start. So I think that um, I know that many of us have already engaged with our uh, PTAs or CACs. Um, and we're just at the beginning stages even of that. So now that we have submitted drafts, now that we've done some of the problem solving with our essential areas, we're moving forward to the next stage in the process. And it's still going, and it's not going to end on April 29th. We're going to have to continue to give that information. So we will meet with our CACs, we will meet with our PTAs, we'll go through the actual schedule, um, be able to project it, whether it be on a Zoom or whether it be in person, let them ask questions, give them paper copies. I'm just, that's how I'm envisioning what I'm gonna do with my, with my families. Provide opportunity for them to ask questions. Um, also allow for uh, just conversation, because I think all of us, the, the schedule does allow for some creativity, especially on flex days, mm -hmm. because for example, at my campus, we're doing every other day, and then our Friday, students will go to PE, they're gonna rotate PE, so classes will get up to three 75 minute blocks of PE one week, and then the next week, they'll go to a music or an art, and that can be flex time as well, because I know that when I spoke with my essential areas team, several were very um, intrigued and excited about that part um, about the idea of having opportunities for, um, like you said, we can't always get all of our third through fifth grade choir to stay after school, but perhaps this is an opportunity to have our third through fifth grade choir have enrichment and actually have opportunity because many of my, I, for example, my music teachers stay after school several days to train or to 
teach their students the music that they want to perform for end of the year musicals. And oftentimes we don't have the funding to even pay them for that. They're volunteering that time. But because that musical means so much, same thing with the yearbook. I talked to an art teacher who said, you know, I was thinking that that might be a great time to put a yearbook committee together. My counselors mentioned that would be a great time to bring our No Place for Hate student leadership team together on that Friday and work with the music and art teacher as well. So we're looking still at ways to be collaborative, to be creative and be able to provide those opportunities and get those ideas also from parents um, while also meeting the parameters and the, you know, at, that we've been given and considerations we've been given. But it's not gonna end, like I said, in April on April 29th, it's not gonna end in May. We're gonna continue on when we go in to even meet the teacher back to school night. We're gonna have to go over that because it's going to look different. People are gonna ask questions and we wanna provide that platform. Thank you. Trustee Foster. So I'm gonna ask uh, the tech gods in the control room to hopefully get this particular meeting up as quickly as possible. I have 50 students whose assignment for today, their homework was to be watching this issue. Um, I'm not at all joking. Um, that prop rate is going up. That, that, that's right, the 12th day, they're, they're locked into the class, they can't quit now. Um, but the, the reason was because I see this as a, a, a really fine example of the complexity uh, of circumstances where you have to manage a master schedule, getting in hours in this area and this area, your staffing, there's so much that you all have to do. So first of all, just as principals, I appreciate you and, and I appreciate the complexity of your work and the thoughtfulness. So, you know, I, I, I chatted up your chief of schools here uh, and you know, with some questions. And um, one of the first things I wanted to hear about was, all right, more planning time. Is that just time? Or is there thoughtfulness in terms of the investment in time? And what brought that up for me was seeing two 45 minute blocks of PLC and knowing that there's transition times, there's lost minutes. So how quickly 45 minutes becomes 30? And a PLC, like we're gonna do some deep dives and some data, y'all. Okay, time to go. And like, does it really happen? So this goes to the complexity, making that time meaningful. And the question that I hope you would answer honestly is, you know, can you make it work? Can you get the the out of this master schedule complexity? Can you get the meaningful blocks of time that you need? So it's like a it's a wondering for me. Um, I see this as short-term, enormously disruptive. And I could be wrong, but my just kind of outside optics, this is potentially enormously disruptive. So the payoff absolutely has to be there. And the payoff comes with your thoughtfulness, your visionary leadership. I would even offer that it comes with your listening to your teachers and, and their sense of the needs. And then these state regs and laws and being in compliance with that. So all that stuff's going on. Superintendent or Mays or whoever, my first question, what's the price tag? It's six million. Still six million or did it go up 1.75 million? Uh, yeah, we would we would do the the six million is for the teachers and 1.7, 1 1.75 we're overestimating because we want to make sure we have it not be over, not under, so 7.75. So, so I'm scared because we have a budget deficit. So we are making a huge choice here to go in a specific direction. And by the way, when you're going towards teachers, I'm, I'm like, you're kind of going to be able to get me probably with good planning and good argumentation and good results. But I do have, have concerns that we are making a, an enormous choice here to go in this particular um, direction. Um, uh, I do have questions about um, sort of campus acceptance and buy-in. Um, and, and, and I always try to, I really try to respect the administration because I know, I know the hard work you all do. So when I have critiques, I always try to hit them up early 
and say, I'm going to be asking these questions or I'm going to be bringing these up. I didn't really love the survey instrument. Um, I saw a likelihood of high reliability and perhaps low validity, that the right questions might not have been asked. And the indicator of that comes when I see your fifth question, whoever constructed this, to what degree do you support your proposed campus master schedule, including additional planning time? And there was a like it, there was a there was a gradation, and you were able to capture nuance that said, okay, 54% of your teachers are, are with you. But the, you had some uh, I don't knows, and you do have a, a critical mass, a small group who were like, I'm not with it. I compare that to survey questions that re re produce 98 percent said yes. When I see that kind of skew, I'm going to ask questions of the survey questions that, that are being constructed. And I think it's always super important to really operate with clarity that the surveys are designed to really capture where folks are and get actionable feedback. And I saw one question where I saw that and others that kind of worried me. And that even, and as a person who has to, and I love that it was only like five questions, by the way. And I love that you could get through it quickly because people I don't want to sit there and do this stuff, you know. But as, as, as someone that has to answer, you know, questions here and there, I get annoyed if I have a suspicion of the survey. Does that make sense? Like, why are you really asking me this? Do you really want to know? And, and I felt like the survey, and I, I'm, I'm sorry to get nitty gritty. But I think it's really important because our relationship with our campus folk are so important. And, and having them feel really in included. And I do think the district's going, we're going in the right direction in this. But I did have that slight critique. Um, the, the last area um, was around the hiring. And the hiring of teaching assistants in particular and specifically teaching assistants in the PE area. And whether we have job descriptions that, are, that go beyond teaching assistant as this like big broad thing and have actually taken into account whatever the specific requirements and needs are of being effective in a PE space where there's more likelihood of, of injury, CP, you know, like, you know, so, so have we done the work yet that as we are creating more positions for teaching assistants, that we are clear that they, that, that we are gonna be able to ask the questions to get the right people in place and to set everyone up for success. And on that one, I guess it's a question. The rest was a soliloquy, I apologize. <laughs> well, I can take full ownership for the, the, the survey. Uh, I think that it was, you know, again, one of those pieces where we were talking about uh, everybody having the opportunity to part participate, and uh, Trustee Lugo was ref referring to that uh, process. We wanted to make sure that everybody had a chance to participate and engage in the process. So it was more or less that accountability piece uh, for all of our leaders. Uh, but certainly we're open to feedback and can always get better. Uh, I know that the component that you just mentioned uh, about the TAs, I think that's work that we're going to be engaged in. Uh, Ms. Costas and I have already kind of started those conversations, along with uh, Chief Stevens, about what that particular you know profile would look like. Uh, with regard to the campus and buy-in, I will defer to the principals to kind of share their insight, given that question. I guess the microphone's coming over here. That's okay. Um, and more to your question, Trustee Foster, about um, the, I guess, loss of instructional time or just, you know, transition times and actually having enough time for teachers to sit down and actually have a, a good PLC meeting. So um, specifically at our campus, what we were able to do for the majority of our grade levels was actually give back-to-back -back time. So for example, they'll go to art and music uh, two times a week, sometimes three times a week, and backing that up with their daily um, PE time. So having 45 minutes for art, and then 45 minutes for PE, and then having potentially, what we'd like to see, is for our special area teachers to transition those students over here. So that way now we've got 90 minutes of a full block where our teachers can actually sit and have a conversation um, and talk about student data and then actually plan for that student data of what they're going to do for the next week or the next day or, or whatever it is. So 
Um, that was just one way that we've been creative to be able to do that. Um, the additional thing I thought about as well from our, our campus perspective is that we have a 45 minute uh, flexible instructional time that we utilize um, throughout the day to provide enrichment and interventions for our students. Um, and so that's where we put in the art music time in there as well. So that way our math and our ELA blocks um, are undisturbed throughout the entire week. Because sometimes you're going to art, sometimes you're going to music, sometimes you're not. We wanted a time to where, hey, our ELA time and our math time was undisturbed, so that way it's, it's untouched. So it just allows for more flexibility. Nice. I'd like to speak to the TAs. So I think it, with respect to your question about the TAs, it's absolutely something we're gonna have to think about. Um, but just the same as I have to think about that individual that's going to cover a life skills teacher assistant position, a scores teacher position, okay. teacher PTA position. We're always looking for the right fit. I'm not just looking for a body. Um, because that's easier to hire. You can certainly just find anybody that's looking for a, for a job, um, but you have to find the right fit that can um, handle the, the, um, that environment, you know, the stress of the environment, because there's, it looks different in every, in every environment. Excuse me, I don't want to start to cough. Um, so we're gonna have to think the same way about PE. Okay. Like you said, the safety, it's something we, we are, we've talked about with our colleagues. Um, we'll talk about with our PE um, essential areas teachers. Um, and even just reaching out, I've already started thinking about it only because um, my own son is going to school to become, you know, he's now thinking he wants to be a PE teacher. So I'm thinking, wow, this is a great opportunity to look into potential, I mean, he's going to be going to school full time, so he won't be able to cover a full time teacher assistant <laughs> position. But this is a great opportunity to tap into people that are looking into that kind of career path that are maybe going to school full t uh, part time or going to school in the evening or available during the day. But people that are interested in that field, there are individuals that are interested in that field. Um, and so just tapping into that, even tapping into our own community, I just had a conversation. Um, I have conversations often, I'm sure as many of you do with parents and people in the community say, are you looking for teacher assistance? And I'm always asking, well, what, what are you interested in? What are you looking into? And I already had somebody that was like, can you just put me in the gym? That's what he's always asking for. Can I just, can I just go into the gym? And you, so you just start to think about the, the conversations you've had with people that have that interest. And those might be people that we can bring in, we can train, we can look to see if they're a good fit for our campus in terms of teacher assistance in, in PE and in any other area. Well, what, I, what I'm hearing uh, again and again is um, the importance your, of your particular, well, of everyone in the system, but your role uh, as principals. And both the visionary work you have to do, but also the, the nuanced work. So to my understanding, I don't think we have like great complexity in the description of a teacher assistant, but what you're lifting up is that as this exact recognition that not every position is the same and that you are gonna have to attend to that when you, um, when you hire, when you interview, when you get through the process. Gotcha. Um, well, thank you. Um, I, I, I like this uh, approach, by the way, uh, and I would love to see, well, just like I'm always bugging the superintendent that I wanna see students here, <laughs> I wanna see teachers here, I love seeing principals here. Um, and with apologies for how late you have to be here, but thank you. Thank you, uh, Trustee Foster. Any other questions, Trustee Boswell? Um, I wanna say thank you to all of you for being here and for sharing what you've shared. Um, I also want to say that if the six plans I'm hearing tonight are representative of the other 72, I feel a lot better coming out of this meeting than I felt going into it. Um, we have been hearing from our community since late February um, an uproar about this, and I really appreciate the chance to talk about it publicly. And uh, I believe that process matters. I'm hearing that there was some good process on campuses, but I feel like our process could have and should have been better um, within the community and, and bringing people along, and I, I hope that the results will will um, people will start hearing what's happening on their campuses and that what we're hearing is really representative. So thank you for sharing details about what you're doing, how you're doing it, all of that. Um, I'm really glad to hear Ms. Gonzalez about Clayton and the arts and, and um, would love to know a report to the board about whether any campus is losing the arts. I know the three-day rotation was created to bring equity in arts to the district many, many, many years ago. 
Um, and I want to be sure we're still doing that. So I would love, there are many paths to get there. That's not the only path, but we are a city that cares about that, as you have said. Um, and it sounds like it's reflected in all of your plans. So I would love to be sure that, you know, where that isn't happening, where it isn't happening and why, and how that particular community feels about that. Um, so I would love to know about that. I, I appreciate greatly the focus on helping kids get what they need, on making sure that we really are talking about who we haven't served and how we do better. Um, and I wanna do that in a way that aligns with our values of, of engaging and building our community, of honoring our staff, and, and I'm excited about what's coming. Um, and I wanna say thank you, Dr. Elizalde, for hearing the PE teachers and looking for a way to bring that ratio down to 30. I think a lot of people did have deep concerns about safety, I was one of them. A lot of our campuses in the middle of town, I couldn't imagine. So I think that will make a di big difference. I share the concerns about hiring and along with information about whether we're losing art anywhere, I would love to have a hiring update on how that's going for the TAs and the PE teachers. Um, I also wanna say for anyone who hasn't visited Langford recently, I got to visit um, Literacy First and saw the outdoor education that you're talking about, Ms. Castillo, firsthand. Um, kids were riding bikes. It's like a mini bike park over at 12th Street. I held an earthworm. Um, it was really <laughs> joyful and lively, and the kids, um, it was fantastic to see. So I think the idea of more of that and, and genius on your part to put it where people can see it so they know why to come um, was genius. So I think the idea of more of that, whatever that looks like, I'm very excited about. Um, I do have a couple of questions. One is about recess. Does every campus still have 30 minutes a day? Is that still the system we've always had? Okay, thank you, I appreciate that, important, and I'm happy to hear that, you won't be surprised. Um, I'm also a little bit worried about reduced instructional time in other areas, whether less time with teachers and students will impact things like science, um, social studies that may not be tested as heavily, and whether um, that's something we need to be aware of. Well, I'll certainly defer to them because I want them to say what's happening on campuses. But I know that um, just utilizing the schedule itself, you know, it's a it's a a double edge in which we do we take time to ensure that we're getting better at the quality of the instructional delivery by giving teachers opportunities mm -hmm. to be able to have more small group instruction, be more focused, be collaborative with others. I know as a principal long, long ago, there were practically dinosaurs around when I was a principal, but um, we would share students. Some of my students would go to a, um, some of my teachers would have students go to a different classroom and vice versa based on what the needs were. And so, by, but I couldn't do that. As a principal, I wasn't able to allow teachers to do that if they didn't have time to do the planning for that to happen. Because it can't be a, hey, today I'm sending my kids over here and you bring your kids over here. And again, that was all after school time. Um, and so I think also our teachers in the classroom, the core content teachers that are carry the biggest burden, not the only, but they do carry the biggest burden of our students being on grade level that are teaching reading, writing, math, science, social studies, were also being asked to do WOW. They were also being asked to do health. Um, those are opportunities that they were also missing out on. So this, as you can see from the variety of all of very different approaches to accomplishing um, the focus on students, ensuring teachers also their needs are also part of the process i think is a great way of ensuring that we continue to share each one of these principles could be connected to 12 or 13 more principles uh, in our plcs and and they could share their designs to compare with what other principles have um, because as I, I think I heard Principal Castillo say, it's not gonna be perfect. They're, they're still gonna, but nothing we're doing right now, I don't think we're ever saying we're perfect and we'll continue to work on that. So um, 
I don't think there's loss of instructional time, um, but that's based on what the parameters were. So please correct me if I'm wrong. Anyone here? So uh, in, in my schedule, we uh, worked out the minutes to where there will be no instruction lost whatsoever. Uh, when, the, when our students go to art or music, uh, one day they will go to art and music and they will not have social studies, but the next day they will double block social studies and so that they don't have to touch uh, language arts or science or math and they will not lose social studies in the long run. So it'll just be uh, that one hour will be double blocked. So it's a shuffling, not a shifting mm -hmm. of the focus. And I know the teaks are the teaks and all of that, but I also know there's so many teaks that you can't really get to all of those. And, and that's, I think, an area where the district has to carry a bigger weight of also embedding the social studies and the science teaks or texts into the ELA and into the math. And actually, even with art and music, our, our creative uh, lear um, CLI. Learning, learning initiative. initiative. Um, it suddenly didn't sound right in my head. I'm like, no, that is what it is. We need to really work on expanding that, that intersectionality. I think, if anything, one of the things we've learned throughout this entire process that I think got exacerbated with COVID is the less compartmentalized we are, the more authentic the teaching and learning becomes for our students. And so utilizing more, which again, principals and teachers can do that embeddedness, but it takes their time to do it. That's something where we need to come in as support, definitely getting their feedback in the processes, but we need to do that initial work for them to then say, yeah, this is really helpful to have some of the social studies standards while we're doing whatever it is that we're studying, turning more towards a humanities and less of an isolation. Um, and, and we do have some opportunities to do that. Thank you. Um, so if I could add yeah, one, please. Uh, you may not know that I was a long time math teacher. Uh, and so on the Blanton document, um, off to the side, there's some little like cryptic numbers and things, and that actually breaks yes. out the 450 minutes of the school day. Oh, um, and so uh, there definitely are places where um, we will be in building in that integration. Um, and where it says extra, that should have said music and art because it's not extra. It was just accounting for those minutes. Um, but you can see it there. Uh, and then also definitely, uh, like Superintendent Elizalde was saying, those points of integration. So for example, Blanton has a dual language Spanish program. And so, you know, that uh, with Spanish, uh, with science being taught in Spanish, that also is our, uh, a, bit, a big addition to our Spanish literacy time as well. Um, and social studies in English and, and math and English as well. And so really tying together those curricular pieces to make sure that literacy is infused throughout the curriculum is um, a big way that we can uh, make that effective as well. Thank you for that. And I would just say the level of specificity that can happen in direct instruction when teachers are given that really rich time to collaborate together with the you know, backing PE up to some of these blocks as well. The, the lessons that teachers can co-create and really say, this is what is given to us and this is how we're gonna fine tune that for this group of students, I think it will pay off. So while it may look on paper like, but wait, you lost 20 minutes here, the level of specificity is going to be there. Um, that right now teachers don't always have the time. They're saying till 6.30 in the evening and then going home and cooking dinner and doing the laundry, and I'm right there with you. I was the same way. Um, and, and doing all their other responsibilities as well. So I think the payoff is quite great. Great, thank you for that. Um, and planning time for essential areas, teachers and special education teachers, there will not be parity? With classroom teachers, there will be parity with classroom teachers. So on my schedule that I believe you have in front of you, um, the, there is planning time at the end of the day. I need some translation. Yes. yes. Um, there'll be planning time at the end of the day um, for both PE and for music and art. And then we have set the expectation this year, or moving into next year, that um, whatever special educators are assigned to certain grade levels, 
they, they will be also in this planning time because the TAs will go with students to special areas, to okay. essential areas. And so that could look different campus to campus, yes. but there are plans that have the parity mm -hmm. and plans that don't. Trustee Boswell, I would say, just tying into the presentation that was done here previously with uh, Ms. Casas and her team, all of that stuff that they just shared with you takes time, especially when you're talking about building and accommodations for individual students, right. and they lack that time now. This will allow them the time to really, you know, again, give some specificity, like she said, to those unique needs that you were describing uh, and that they see throughout the classrooms on a day-to-day -day basis. Okay, including for special education teachers? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, and then I would love um, just a couple of things. I would love to have a conversation at some future meeting um, just as an agenda item to see if people care to join. Just really talking about what our philosophy is about our student experience with arts and PE and extracurriculars as an enrollment strategy. Would love to really look at that as kind of what we're, the richness of what we're offering as, as something kind of where that fits into our, our strategies. Um, and then just really want to encourage more, more processes that make people feel like they're being done with people, not to people, and really engaging our community very deeply. So thank you all for this. I appreciate it. And um, I will look forward to seeing um, how it works and how people respond. And, and as Dr. Foster said, um, you know, big changes promise big payoffs. And I hope we see what we expect to see. So thank you. Thank you, Trustee Boswell. Trustees, any other questions? Trustee Singh. Um, thank you, principals, um, for presenting tonight and for just all the work, the hard work that you've been doing over the last two years. <laughs> uh, it's it's a lot. Um, and I've, I've really heard a lot of good and exciting things tonight, and I'm excited to see your excitement. So thank you for sharing that. Um, and I... One of the things I, I believe is driving all this is the scorecard that we unanimously adopted. That was really, I think that was the big change um, to kind of borrow what Kristen Ashe, what Trustee Ashley was kind of saying is, yeah, you gotta do things differently. And the first step is the board setting that expectation, um, uh, the high expectation for all students. Um, and so, and so I, I see this as like a, a response to that. Um, I think, for me, like where there's a little hesitation is the devil's in the details with this. Um, and until I see like that all of our campuses are gonna be having enough time for instruction, you know, actual instructional time for art, for music, and for high quality PE as well, um, it's gonna be really hard for me to really get my you know, to be able to embrace this because that's the equity, the equity piece of this. So I'm just really curious, and I'm not sure I got a clear answer. But on your, with your master plans that y'all have developed, um, are your kiddos going to get more or less music than they had before? Like, are they going to have more music with this new master schedule? I can say yes. Yes. I mean, I can say yes. So, for example. Um, the current schedule they have are, you know, with the art, music, PE, so they might have music two days a week or um, one day. There, there's, there's one week out of every three they would only have music one day a week. Okay. Right? So that's the current schedule. And this one has a regular schedule of twice a week. Okay. So it eliminates so that, get more. One day, that one week that they were lacking in our current schedule. Okay. They, it's, it's in there. Okay. Is anybody else going to be getting more music? at any of your other campuses. It doesn't sound like that. Um, how about uh, art? Is anyone going to be getting more art per week on average? It's the same. I mean, so same. art and music would be the same at Blanton. OK, how about for the other campuses? It'll be the same. OK, is anybody getting less art per week on average? OK. OK, sorry to just put you all on the spot. But like that's how my mind goes. It's like, you know, because when you want to think about, um, you know, our kids getting what, because this is a big concern we've been hearing, is our kids are going to get less art and music. And so I'm just trying to validate that um, just from this small sample. But I have asked the district, 
generally speaking, what is this going to look like, especially for the, the not happy paths that Trusty Lugo was talking about? And to me, I, I really want to be able to, to be comfortable with this and be able to support it as it shows up in the budget. I really am going to have to see that all of our campuses, particularly the ones that are struggling academically, that we're not sacrificing um, art and music and quality PE. Um, to get an extra hour of looking at data or, you know, you know what I mean? And so like, um, because the other piece of the, the two big documents that we as, as trustees um, have adopted recently, um, well, there's many, but two ones that come to mind are that scorecard, but the other one is our statement of values, um, which I think I should have memorized by now, but this is supposed to be like how we get to the scorecard outcomes and this has things in there like innovation and academic excellence caring for every child to be healthy and safe so like the things about when you know i think about pe sounds great but are they really going to be healthy and safe you know you have and so i, I do appreciate reducing that ratio um to have one to um, 30 instead of one to 45 just and i would like more reassurance that we are going to be able to hire for all those positions and they are going to be high quality positions because PE is one of those subjects we know that has some inherent risks to it and we have campuses with all different space um, situations and I just hate the idea of a kid you know class of students having PE in a like <coughs> remote part of the school with a TA not even a fully certified PE teacher nearby. You know, something, there's an accident, you know, like obviously like I'm a mom, so these are the things that I, you know, we all, those of us who are parents especially, we think about the worst case scenario all the time. <laughs> and so these are, to me, there's still a lot of question marks here, not for your campuses, because it seems like you've really worked it out. Um, and I really congratulate you because that seems like a huge effort. But again, like as, as I've been on this board for three years, the devil is always in the detail and say, like digging down. Okay, while well, those campuses that always seem to get shortchanged, how are they going to get more music and art? You know, are they going to still get high quality PE? Are they going to be able to attract the staff? Um, it's like, what are we doing as a district? Because we know we have some schools that are always going to be harder to staff. So are we going to, what are we going to do to incentivize people to fill those positions? So that's, uh, those are the big question marks for me. Um, I do want to ask a question. As Trustee Boswell mentioned, and we all have seen the emails, this has created a bit of an uproar. Um, the idea has merit. It's, you know, but how could, you know, again, when I look at our, our values, one of them is engaging our employees and inviting their collaboration to make AISD a great place to work. So I have to ask, is there anything in this process that could have done differently or that's going to be done going forward to help ensure that, yeah, we, we are doing that? Well, I, there's never going to be a time that I'm not going to say that we can't that I can't be reflective in terms of how to improve on a process. Um, I would hope all of us would be able to do that. And I think uh, some of this was just information that was disseminated while we were still in an incubation stage. So part of that is how do we ensure that we balance out how much information we put forward, because we want people to know and at the same time not put out information that's not ready because people haven't engaged in the process and haven't been a part of the process and even what that process looked like. And this one was absolutely an iteration of something that I began by thinking it was extremely simple. I thought we've got not enough time in PE, first of all, that was accidentally discovered. And that's not a negotiable area. Like, we need to do that. And we know how much um, physical health is connected to mental health with Bruce Perry's work and all of the studies we've, we've recently really connected with that um, mental health is much more than just relaxation. And that, in fact, all of the things that happen during physical activity are also a part of mental health. And 
so trying to ensure that you you asked a question about parity, um, I think Trustee Boswell, which that was part of what we were trying to do was also to bring parity to the elementary campus planning as we have with the secondary planning. And, and so um, can we get better? Absolutely, I can absolutely get better. These folks uh, just made it happen because that's who they are and, and they're gonna take the information and they're gonna tell us when we first say, oh, this should be pretty easy, right? Y'all can figure this out. And it's like, no, it's not that easy. We need to get more people involved and it's gonna take us longer and we're going to need to retool it. And then here are some of the obstacles that have arisen. And so it's been a lot of their time investment and my learning in how to continue to improve I also hope we don't get uh, to a point where we do forget the why. And this was about ensuring that what we're doing, again, we have 44% of our third graders are on grade level. And so it is absolutely vital that we provide our campuses every tool that we can think of that we can provide for them to be able to have access to ensure that those students, um, that their teachers get that. And if we disaggregate that data, white students perform 46% on grade level and children of color are at 35%. And if I look at that from an economically disadvantaged perspective, that's a 39% gap between economically disadvantaged students compared to non-economically disadvantaged students. And I know how important that is to each and every one of you. And so at no time was this an effort to sacrifice something, but we also cannot ignore that if we don't give our campuses something different and allow them to make it the way it is, that's why all of these are so different, is because each of them created something from their own team. I think of it much like, um, I think a basketball coach whether they're gonna be a, um, a fast break team because they've got really fast players or whether they're gonna be a setup team because mm -hmm. they've got a post and they've got different variety of individuals. So our principals created a plan around the talent that they have, which was far more effective. This is a perfect example of doing it exactly the same way would not have been equity. It would have been equality Sometimes equality is fair, sometimes it's not. In this instance, I don't think it would have been fair and just. I think they needed equity. And we'll continue to work with them and I'll continue to take ownership and reflect on how um, I can improve the, the processes. I appreciate that. Um, I will just say from my, my perspective as a trustee, one. I think you know you're in a difficult position, Dr. Elizade, because you've got to bring so many different people along with your ideas, and it, and it's a challenge. Um, for me, one of the things that I always get really sensitive about is surveys that I feel like are designed to get a predetermined outcome, and that was, in my opinion, clearly the case here. My grad school professors would have given me an F if I had created a survey like that. I'll be real honest. So like to build trust and buy-in, at least for me, I need to see the whole picture. There's no reason to silence or to get skewed results or whatever. Um, it's um, because I think that undermines the good intent behind some of the things. Um, and, and so I know there was good intent here, but to me that was just like a red flag. And when you see one red flag, you wonder, okay, what else what else is, are they hiding? And so that's um, just a little feedback. Um, and um, so, so the F is to me then. Um, this team, this team doesn't. Dr. Mays doesn't. Uh, the, that that F then goes to me. So I. Well, I, I was I actually talking about myself. If if I had done that, and so um, I think that we can do a lot better with that, but I do want to, again, appreciate the principals who took the time to share, and I'm really glad that you found a way to work it out for your campus, and I hope that we can do that for all of our campuses. Thank you, principals, so very much. Thank you, trustees. Um, any other, Trustee Foster? No, I just, I just want to uh, express gratitude for this uh, 
conversation. I think this is nitty gritty, really complicated stuff, but and it's the area. It's it's the type of work we have to be doing, um, and and it's just really challenging. And I, I just really appreciate this conversation. I want to. Um, I don't have a question for you all. I just want to make one comment because I'd be remiss if I didn't if I didn't say this. We have not seen you all in person, a lot of you all, for two years. We just took off our masks four weeks ago. So I just want to say thank you for your leadership, your change leadership and bringing people to where we are right now, but also for taking care of our team, our staff, and our children over the last two years. And I just haven't had a chance to see you. And I know we have a great goal in our scorecard, and we have the right team to get us there and overcome the challenges, and we're right there with you. And Kevin said, you know, we're in the nitty gritty. That's because we all care about making sure that our system is not about exceptions to the rule, but that those of us that have been able to navigate the system, even with those kinds of statistics that Dr. Elisalde said, that our experiences are the rules for this entire district and high outcomes for every single one of us. So thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Trustees, we're gonna, just a little time check for us. We're about an hour and a half behind. Um, the third item tonight out of six, for discussion is under our student achievement items. I think this is a physical education stamina test for us. Uh, the third item a is marathon. to, a marathon, a marathon. The third item to discuss under our student achievement items is scorecard indicator 17 under fiscal stewardship and prioritization equity. And Dr. Isada, will you please present our last scorecard item of the night? Yes, sir. Happy to uh, reintroduce Mr. Alejandro Delgado, who has just been keeping us on our toes with all of the different ways in which we can look at where pre-K students are, getting and collecting heat maps, ensuring that when we're out there communicating and focusing that we're not thinking there's three-year-olds or four-year-olds there, that we actually have data that tells us where they are, and not just where they are, but students that qualify already, so that we can even begin to ensure that we're focused on those students, along with then identifying three and four-year-olds who may be interested in a tuition-based pre-K program. Um, the numbers are amazing that he has already initially put together, primarily um, just with like a skeleton crew of individuals who are just working um, their tails off. And the really good news in addition to all of that is how our community, our new parents have received this information in terms of how excited they are about knowing about all of these programs and how this will impact our overall um, enrollment and how we're gonna continue. There are gonna be some things that I did not even know that um, like birth rates and things like that that have, have appear, they, they play into some of the numbers. And so in some instances, you're gonna see some things that may look like, no, that can't be. And there are some really important statistics that um, Mr. Delgado is going to lead us through. So with that, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here tonight. Uh, thank you, President Rodriguez, Trustees, Dr. Azalde, uh, for another opportunity to present to you all tonight about uh, student enrollment. So I recognize there's a lot of important items tonight on the board agenda, and I'm just really grateful for, for you all's support. So before we get started, I do want to highlight again uh, that there's no one data point that encapsulates uh, really everything that's related to enrollment. There's also no silver bullet on how we're going to address our, our issues related to enrollment. Uh, but instead, uh, you know, we have multiple strategies that we've started or have planned, and I'm excited to run through our plan 
uh, together with you all tonight to gather your feedback and perspective. So first, let's start with our scorecard uh, data as I'm here tonight because I'm reporting on scorecard indicator number 17 uh, related to student market share. So if we go to the next slide. Uh, the big goal is that uh, the district will increase its student share within its boundaries to choose AISD. Guys, the good news, it's green. Uh, th that's, that's a good sign. Uh, the, the, the good news is that after steady declines in AISD's market share uh, between 2011 and 2018, market shares have been roughly level uh, since 2018 and actually increased this past year from 80, from, uh, to 80, to 82, to 82% from 81%. So, uh, you know, sometimes these are hard to change and I was actually thinking that they might have gone down uh, but we actually increased our market share uh, in Austin ISD. Uh, that said, so that we are we are in the green, which is good since 2020-21. Uh, that said, I do want to highlight a really important dynamic that Dr. Elizalde alluded to. Uh, that's that's impacting our enrollment. So, the the then that's the eight percent decrease, about 7,000 kids, uh, that a number of students living in the city uh, attending a public school since 2015. So we've seen about 7,000 fewer students living in our, our ASD boundaries. Uh, and like when I was here in January, uh, I just want to remind y'all some of the three three primary factors contributing to those to that data. Uh, so sky high, uh, sky high housing and rental prices, declining birth rates, so 20% in the past 10 years, uh, and population increases that are happening, but they're happening outside of our city limits. Um, and another interesting data point that I wanted to share, it's not reflected on the slide, but I think it encapsulates this, is that in 2016, 57% of students living in AISD boundaries attended charters. This number has gone down to 49%. So what that means is that districts such as Maynard, Elgin, Bastrop are actually now being more impacted by charters as a result. So it's just kind of interesting to see the eastward, uh, the eastward movement of our of the of, you know families needing more affordable housing, and now uh, that's that's those are the big larger shares of who make up charters. Uh, while there's some sobering elements to the data, of course, uh, I'm hopeful because we have a vision and plan for the work. So y'all have seen. Uh, this next slide, uh, which is, uh, and I'll share with you the vision for the work. If you can change the slide, uh, please. Uh, and I'm calling this our student enrollment roadmap, uh, which is our multi-year system of systemic approach to addressing our enrollment issues. So, and it's really built on the theory of action of if we authentically engage uh, prospective families to demonstrate the value of our schools and how they meet the specific needs of our current students, of our current and prospective families, and we design uh, and implement family and student-centered enrollment and registration processes in response to family feedback, uh, and are true partners with our school leaders, those principals that you've seen, uh, and staff in engaging with our, uh, in engaging with and meeting our families' diverse and specific needs, then we will earn the trust uh, of AISD families so they choose and persist, which means remain uh, in AISD schools that best meet the, their needs. So that is kind of the, what we're trying to accomplish here. And I'll show you in the next few slides how this is represented in our strategy or in our plan in the short term and long term. So in the near term, really over the next uh, few months, we have, uh, you know, we have, we've got to hit our projected enrollment. That is very important that we do. So what you'll see here, if you can click, uh, our enrollment strategy really falls under two big buckets. So engaging families uh, and improving systems. So we are executing multiple initiatives right now uh, under those buckets. So to start out with, we're actually building off the success uh, of last year, Dr. Mays' team that, that launched the work uh, with, with Operation Reconnect. Uh, and it reinforced, I think for all of us, uh, the importance of authentically engaging with our, with our families. So specifically, we're doing the following over the next few months. We're engaging families that have not chosen AISD through targeted marketing uh, and, and a communications campaign, or multiple campaigns actually. Uh, we're engaging current AISD families that have yet to register for the next school year, including we're bringing back our summer enrollment clinics so that we offer summer opportunities uh, when our schools are closed uh, so that families can register. So we'll be, uh, we'll be throughout the city beginning in June. Uh, intensive outreach to the, to the, to the lots of kids that have left during the school year. So we have some strategies planned for that. And, and, and we're starting with the beginning point of operationalizing a street team uh, to increase our presence at community events and just be everywhere. Uh, and, and so we're figuring out the right ways to do that and, and you should see some increases there uh, in the short term. 
the next image, and if you can click on the PowerPoint, shows an image from our registration toolkit uh, that we rolled out to campuses a few weeks ago. And I'm showing this image because it's, repre it's, it's, it's representative of our, of our near-term enrollment strategy for a few reasons. So one, uh, of course, I have to take the opportunity right now to remind all of our families that are still watching online that do not forget to register. We want to welcome you back. So that's my like <laughs> PSA for today. I have to take advantage. Uh, two, we are uh, executing right now against our priority of the importance of our current families staying in our system. So, uh, and, and ensuring they persist in our system. And, and that includes, actually, Ms. Petrozini sent me a screenshot of a flyer that she sent just yesterday where she thanked her, her, her uh, Cunningham Cobras for choosing to return next year. Like, it's that, the, the, those nuances and those details and language that matter a lot. And we're starting to coach and starting to get there around with our campuses. And guys, this is a cultural shift where we're not telling families, hey, come register. We're saying, you have options. Thank you for choosing us. How can we keep you? Uh, and that is happening with this toolkit. And then finally, you know, what this registration campaign really encompasses is our focus on providing comprehensive resources. So this was a document that we sent to our campuses that including a communications plan, including turnkey language, literally like copy paste this into your newsletters so you can get the communication out. Uh, we are offering supplemental pay to any and all staff that are working extra time. Because guys, we had, we have, we have campuses putting on events, evenings, Saturdays, after hours, and we have to honor them for that time, so we're paying for them. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm thankful for uh, uh, Dr. Mays and, and Chief Stevens. They, they put a lot of effort into uh, co-creating data trackers so that we're breaking down our internal silos and we're working from a single source of data, which is really important for our campuses, uh, which we haven't done before. So I'm excited about that, and that's just in, that encapsulates that. Uh, going on to continuing our strategy in the medium term, so what you'll see here, uh, our medium term strategy is focused on, and if you want to click on the slide, you see this really cool funnel, really cool upside down pyramid. And the reason I included that is because uh, this conversion funnel is, uh, the essence of it is the need to create a strategic courting process for our prospective families. So I'll be honest, school districts are at a structural disadvantage compared to charters. Uh, because of the lack of an application process to solicit families' information. We, and, the, and the traditional approach in school districts is that we ask families to enroll with, when, they not, when they might not be ready, or uh, we just assume they're going to show up. And so what we're going to start to do uh, to attract prospective families to AISD, we need to be really thoughtful and, and, and uh, aggressive about how we raise awareness about the district. This starts at the top of the funnel, the awareness. And actually, I just included that you have a, you can meet Joy. Uh, this is Joy. She's actually a real life child who goes to Menchaca Elementary. And um, this postcard was sent to 5,000 families this week, actually. It dropped. And uh, you'll notice a couple things. One is our new pre-K branding that's more aligned to the AISD brand. It also, we have brand new messaging that we have. Uh, and you'll see also a word that you don't see here, which is enroll. We're just raising awareness. Learn more about AISD. We're not telling families. We're not moving from awareness to enrollment. We're saying just learn about us. That is, that is strategic. Uh, and, and, and really, like, what I also wanted to add here, the blue section here, the big game, game changer here that we're going to work towards operationalizing as a district is uh, the interest portion of it. Uh, because once we have prospective family information, then our campuses, then our district can follow up relentlessly and help move them down the funnel to register and then finally to show up or enroll in our schools. So, and I want to end with this, with this section because it, the, the essence of the conversion funnel is it's all about building relationships with our families over time. So I, we want to move away from come register today to, hey, come check out our school. Tell me more about yourself. Come to a tour. Come meet the principal. Come watch, see our curriculum in action. Come see our academic results. Um, and then we say, hey, are you ready? How can we help you? Uh, but that takes time. People, our families have options, which is one of the things that we are, are trying to uh, just bring culturally up to the front. 
And then finally, building capacity in our campuses to do this work. So we've learned a lot, speaking of that, we learned a lot from our pilot this spring with our, uh, our TUP schools, our lowest enrolled schools, uh, over the past few months. So what you'll see here on the next, if you click, uh, is a, uh, an ad, uh, an advertisement uh, that's going, it's gonna be on school buses actually, uh, in the next probably 30 to 45 days. And uh, this was, this was a Campbell Elementary. Uh, at Media and Performing Arts Institute. So we coached Mr. Moore, in, uh, and, and he has a strong he has a strong perspective around enrollment, but we coached him on, uh, on creating his value proposition as a campus, which is the line in the yellow. And because we got his, Mr. Moore, like we know you wanna talk about technology and arts integration, but what does that mean to a prospective family? And, and another word, you know, word, a word that you don't, again, see on this slide, on this image, what is it? Enroll. Just discover Campbell. And if you click on that, if you go to the website, you'll see a big button that says interest, show interest. And that information goes to Campbell, they will follow up with you. So we're practicing our processes uh, and we hope to see results in this. So finally, the last part of our long-term enrollment strategy, I wanted to share some of our long-term aspects. You'll see here a, a, a visual. Uh, it's one of, one of, been one of my favorites of a massive highway interchange. Uh, that's really a, a, a visual representation of our current enrollment processes. Uh, this is the experience both internally, organizationally, and for our families. Uh, and one of the things actually I'm grateful for this past year that I've been here, it's almost been a year, is, is really reflecting on the root causes of, of some of our enrollment issues. And, and, and I think this is one of them actually. And, and really what I'm trying to visually represent is uh, our enrollment processes in and of themselves separately. So the transfer process, the pre-K dual language, pre-K process, the dual language are relatively smooth, but added on top of each other are very confusing and hard and accessible for our families to engage with. And, and, and that's, and so we've created a cumbersome process for our families to use. So it's, it has to change. And one of the big wins of this past year is simply bringing our internal teams together uh, to spark discussions and really hard discussions about how we streamline processes. And, 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 and the reason why this is a long-term play is that the, the technical processes behind the, the scenes are very complex. Um, and and you, real, you realize if you take something away, something else breaks in the system. So we're working through that. I think you'll see some changes in the next probably six to eight to 12 months, but it is, it is, it is starting and it's critical that we include this. And then click it again one more time on the slide. The, the next part I wanna remind you as part of our longer term strategy in working with you all in the city of Austin uh, is we have to figure out a way to address our, our, our macro factors that are contributing to the thousands of kids that are just leaving the district, leaving our city limits because it's too expensive. Uh, you know, and ultimately we could execute all of the previous strategies that you saw at a super, super high level, but if it's too expensive for our families to live, just because a family's looking for an extra bedroom or an extra bathroom, which is all normal, uh, that's gonna have a significant impact on our, on our district's enrollment. So we need to be clear-eyed about this, I think as a district, uh, and develop an advocacy strategy to help address this. And you'll see here, even, I mean, for the city of Austin, after four years, only 12% towards their affordable housing goal. Like, that's, that's not helpful to, to our district's enrollment. So, but, and then I'll end with this. Uh, and and uh, this is, uh, some of you have met him. Um, if you can click on the slide. Uh, this is my son, Javi, who's in pre-K. And I, I show him, he's gonna hate me in 13 years when he's a teenager. Uh, which I don't, you know, well, maybe, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not okay with that, but that might happen. Uh, but, but I included this because that picture that you see in the bottom corner, uh, his teacher, his pre-K teacher at St. Elmo last year, gave that to him as a graduation gift. And he sleeps with it almost every night. And, uh, and it's awesome. And by the way, uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Mack at St. Elmo was uh, nominated for HEB Excellence in, in Education Award, which is amazing. And he absolutely deserves it. But, I, but really, like back to the picture, I'm ending with this because I, I do believe, I think we all believe, that you know, our most powerful enrollment driver, you know, no marketing communications, no po you know, awesome postcard as it is, is going to, to drive kids to come to AISD. 
uh, in and of itself. Like it is the it is the experience that our families have, whether it's high quality PE or you know they feel like their kid is learning, they get the special needs support that they get. Like that's what keeps our families in our schools. And I mean, it is the five principles that are here that actually keep our families in our schools. And I could tell you they're working their butts off. And so, uh, and I just wanted to end with that because that is actually the true driver of our enrollment is 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 the the really nuanced, complex, hard conversations that the rest of tonight's meeting is about. So that that's all I have for tonight. And thank you, and happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Alejandro. Uh, first of all, I did send you a picture of Javi and you so that you'd have proof. <laughs> When he graduates from high school, that you actually used him as a as a prop, <laughs> a, ver a very effective, one, I should say, a very cute. I appreciate that. I uh, appreciate uh, that. I love that. <laughs> uh, Trustee Anderson. Talking something else right up my alley. <laughs> so, enrollment. I I have long said that. You know, for far too long we have set back. Students have came to us, and now we have to actually go to the, the students and the families. And so now we're reactive because we're scrambling. So in, in, your, in, in your enrollment process of trying to recruit, like that, that piece with the city of Austin is, is going to be huge. So my suggestion, and this is just from what I've, what I've seen when I was on the uh, Quality of Life Commission, is their marketing, right? So their, their marketing, from what I saw, is not uh, geared toward families. It's, it's more towards singles, at mm. least from what I saw. So, you know, start there. What does their marketing look like if we're talking about you know, recruiting families back into to Austin ISD, you know, I do realize, you know, we have the surrounding districts, but it would be good if the families actually lived in Austin. So to me, that, that starts with the city of Austin's marketing. Yeah. And, you know, if, if we're not in those constant conversations when they talk about affordable housing, I have a whole little spill about that too, but. I'll say that for another time. But if we're not in those conversations, like we're, we're really missing out on how we can, you know, have a positive impact. It's a missed opportunity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, that's fair. Uh, what I will say, actually, we're learning from uh, Dr. Mays' early college program teams. I mean, they, they actually have been the exemplars for hitting the streets. I mean, they're at, they're at, um, uh, at, at rec centers almost every day trying to get those, because what they've realized is that a lot of the middle schoolers that they're trying to learn from are trying to like get into ECP programs, early college pro or hanging out afterwards at the rec centers. So we've actually starting weekly check-ins to figure out how we learn from them. Boots on the ground. Boots like on the you ground. Gotta, you got all these, you have That's all these places, rec center, like right around the corner from me, Turner Roberts. Like it's nothing to drive over there and be like, hey, like where you go to school at? And you know, you have Decker up there too. So where you go to school at? Like what you want to do? Like that's, when I meet students, that's like the first thing I ask. What well, you want to do? And some will be like, oh, I want to do culinary. Hey, I, I know an awesome culinary school, program. Yeah. Like. And I got to tell you, people give me a hard time about this, but but I, it works and y'all should use it if you ever want to. Uh, uh, w when introducing and talking about AISD, you know, family comes to the table. What I say is, have you heard of Austin ISD? And that sounds funny because we're like, what do you mean? But actually that hooks them and then you start the conversation. So if you ever need that, have you heard of Austin ISD? Because mm -hmm. people have generally heard of Austin ISD and that, that grabs them. So anyways, I, I agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Apologies, I forgot where, where it was for a second. Um, any other trustees have questions for us yeah, Trustee Ashi. <laughs> Mr. Telgado, uh, you make me smile the entire time when you're talking because I'm so excited to, to have you to have a, an enrollment uh, department. Uh, this is so wonderful. And um, 
I just wanted to ask, because the last time you were here, I said, what, and you gave us a job, and I so appreciated that. What can we do as trustees to support your work? I, I think that, that long-term play around uh, affordability, I mean, we, we could do everything really well, and we're going to try our hardest to, but if we have fewer kids in the district, that, that, that affects our enrollment. Um, I actually, you know, thank y'all for the the policy changes around out of district transportation. So we're we're starting. Actually, I think Miss Roby from Garcia Sad from Saddle Means told me that she got just like four kids the other day from Maynard. So like that is a policy change that allows for flexibility. So that that helps. But honestly, like continuing to to bring the narrative that that uh, our our families are struggling to afford uh, to live in Austin, and that affects our that affects our district. Sorry, trustees, any other questions? Trustee Boswell. Yeah, I just want to um, express gratitude to, just like Trustee Ashley said, I, I really so appreciate Dr. Elizalde that this position exists um, and that this work is being done and supported. And and um, Mr. Delgado, I really appreciate the relational piece of it, the creativity your team's bringing to it. Uh, so thank you for that. And I also want to say that at the next joint subcommittee meeting, which is a not a decision-making body, but a, a discussion and problem-solving body more than anything uh, of the city, the county, and the district, we will be talking about housing. Great. So uh, the conversation is happening, and I think when we talk about recapture, it is an affordability issue more than a funding issue mm -hmm. because that money doesn't come back to us unless the basic allotment goes up, mm -hmm. and that's an affordability mm -hmm. issue for our community as well. Um, so thank you for putting the focus on that as one of many. Um, you know, I think for a long time it was it was the thing that was blamed, and I think we know it's many other things. Mm -hmm. So thank you for um, fixing that crazy scrambled highway that was hard, made it hard for people to enroll and and everything else that you're doing. Just thank you. Thank you. We're not there yet, but we're working. yeah, but you're working on it, and that's a big step. So thank you for all of this. Trustees, other questions. If not, I, um, the one thing I just want to share with you, like I, I really appreciate you listening to families and parents. I think as we continue to do our own engagement in the community, I will share with you one thing that has just stuck to me with talking to, to uh, some folks that I know that are experiencing poverty, and they, that really just hit me right in the middle, right between the eyes. They said, you know, in Austin, it's really expensive to be poor. Mm. And that irony just hits you when you talk about the facts of housing and all these other issues. And so I really appreciate you all keeping that front and center around all of these things. So thank you. Yeah. Appreciate it. Um, I will say, trustees, I, I was remiss in, um, in, when I introduced uh, Alejandro that I should have talked about our goal being about monitoring and ensuring that our vision meets our reality. So one of the things I want to do now that we're done with questions is to ask you to raise your right hand if you're ready to accept tonight's report. Okay, thank you, uh, trustees, for taking part in this shared commitment to students and student outcomes. Alejandro, thank you for thank being you. here. We're now going to move on to our information reports and updates, and tonight we're joined with our partners at Thompson & Horton and our demographic partners, Zonda Education, We'll also have Dr. Jacob Reach, Chief Officer of Government Relations and Board Services. So Dr. Reach, would you please introduce our partners uh, this evening? I will, thank you so much. Uh, so we are joined here today by uh, Holly McIntosh with Thompson & Horton, who in just a moment will lead us through our presentation. And we also have with us today uh, Rocky Gardner from, from Zonda Education, our demographer, um, who has been helping us with our maps. And so to give a brief update, um, since we last met, we have had two community meetings. We also had our first trustee single district meeting last night, and we're looking at scheduling more of those. And we'll go through a bit of the outreach on a later slide, but for right now, I'd like to turn it over to Holly. I'll share mine. Yeah. Thank you all. Um, I want to just start by... Um, Thank you. Sorry about that. Okay, so we just want to start by going over, um, again, some of the things that we have gone through over the past slides, but just as a good touch point for us to remind everybody why we're here. Um, wait. 
that's not what I was expecting. Okay, well, that's okay. So um, we, we, what I wanna first talk about is what the criteria are for drawing the single member district boundaries um, because we're going to go over the maps, the two, the two maps that we have so far. Um, there's a first map that we had um, drawn based on trying to get to the 10% um, the number, the number, no variation of no more than 10%, and then there's a second map that takes into account some of the comments that we have gotten from you all thus far. So we want to go over both of those with you. Um, but first, I want to talk to you about what the criteria are. So as you look at these maps, you can be thinking to yourself, you know, what are, what are, are these meeting those criteria? So as a reminder, the, the, there are the statutory criteria, the first being that we need to um, keep the total deviation between the largest and smallest single member district at or within 10%. We need to um, make sure that they are as nearly as practicable of equal population, which is, that's the 10% is the more targeted way of judging, is it in fact as close to close to equal population in each district as possible. And remember, again, that's total population. That's the number we're looking at there. Um, and we want to make them compact to the extent possible, and they have to be contiguous. So um, you can't have an area over here and then an island off to the right. It's gotta be all, they've gotta all be touching. Um, and then while we, we need, we need to consider um, racial minority voting rights and make sure that we're not allowing for any um, voter retrogression um, or dilution of minority voting strength, but at the same time, we can't consider it more than necessary to make sure that we comply with that, or else we'll be running afoul of constitutional concerns. We want to avoid splitting county election precincts, um, and, may, and then we want, in other, um, political boundaries, we want to, uh, or we want to consider other political boundaries, we want to maintain communities of interest, and this is a key point where we need your help in helping us identify what those communities of interest are in your neighbor, in your districts, or in, that might be, um, need to, a um, line might need to be drawn to keep them together in a map. And then we want to um, try, we want to do our best to, um, preserve the existing boundaries, and part of this is to make sure that we're complying with the Voting Rights Act, right? Because we know that that last BAP passed muster, and so by starting from that, it helps us with that. And then we want to try to keep each of you in a different district, each of the seven of you who are from a single member district, so that none of you are forced to resign once there's a new map because you no longer represent the district that you live in and and are able to serve out your term and you can phase this this map in rather than having all of you up for re-election at once, or at least seven of you. Um, and where possible, we want to, um, again, as I said, mentioned, as I mentioned before, look at um, other geographic and political boundaries, so. Thank you, Holly. Nope. Good evening, it's a pleasure to be here in person. I think I've just um, just visited via Zoom the last couple times, so it's great to be here. I, I get the next 70 slides, so I'm gonna move, I promise. <laughs> I'm gonna move pretty briskly through these. I think- I'm sure I heard seven. Um, I heard seven. So, and this is, we're going to start with plan one, but keep in mind, I think that y'all have, you've had some time to look at this as well, and we, we've met with some of you, so, so I'm going to move through it pretty briskly, but just know that I'm happy to stop, talk, at, at, as much as, as as much as needed. So plan, plan one, it, well, it was our first attempt, it, it was when we, my colleague and I just kind of scratched out, let's get to 10%. Let's make sure things look as clean as possible and, and give you guys something to, to comment on, which is what's happened. So you, you can see here, just to be clear, the blue outlines represent the way it looked in 2010. And when you see color bleeding un, under those blue outlines, that, that's an area that would be capturing that, that change. So these black circles represent where we see the most change on, on this map. Sometimes you'll see little small changes, that, but those are where census blocks just didn't meld as well from 2010 to 2020. So we, when we started out with this first map, the first thing we did was, we, the first check mark was the 10% criteria. You can see this change has our districts, district four being your smallest district, district five your, your largest, 
that differential is 8%. Again, we're, we're shooting for that 105. We had several districts that were well below, like at 93 and 94,000. And of course, we had di District 6, keep in mind, that was 124,000. So we're trying to ba balance between those districts. So what I want to do now is just share the changes that, that we had by district. So district, single member district one, you can see plan one here. In this first move, you know, we'll see a couple changes. This area here that was moved, we smoothed it down, 35 was the idea there. This is that, that Mueller, Mueller area that we moved there in District 1. And then we also moved an area to the south, this Oak Springs Drive, Weberville. That, just, that was just a, a cleanup where we moved some of District 2 into District 1. Again, gains population from the neighborhood, from, from single member district three, loses population in the, in the southern part to single member district two. And this, this shows that, that change. Again, we were at 94,000. We're focusing here on 2020 change. We got that to 102,000, keeping in mind that 105,000 was kind of that, that round area there. So you can see that we met that criteria. And then so we go to single member district two. This is a, this, this is a little bit different. We, we have the area to the north that we, that we had from single member district one. And then we had this area here on the south. I think that this was, uh, so it's like, was this first street? Possibly where well, we smoothed that out right along that line there. Um, and then, you know, so this, so in this, in this case, the district two gets captured some from di district six. You can see the green. Uh, gives up some to District 6, and then also um, goes over and gets District 6 where it wraps around here as well. So both sides there are District 2 now in, in this plan. So w again, we gain population on the, on the, nor the north end of the di district, and we lose population there on the western side of the district, single member District 6. It was South First Street, so I got, that was a good guess. And single member District 2, again, was another one of our small districts. It was 93,000. We got them up to 105,000 right at, at our average. Strong change there. One, one, one thing I didn't mention on the previous plan was that we also are kind of keeping an eye on our citizen voting age population. We don't want it to change too much if, if it doesn't have to, even though we are having to move a significant amount of po population. Single member district three, you can see here the long and narrow. We, we just have the, the one, well, I guess the, the one change there on single mem member district three in the, in the south. And then, and then we see there two changes, the one on the east, one, one on the west. So of course, this one on the east we looked at was, was single member district one. This, this was that, that Mueller neighborhood. And, and again, we, we moved over here to Bur Burnett Road and uh, Koenig, Koenig Road it is. And, and we, we captured that part of District 4, and it moves into District 3 in this plan. Again, loses po population to, to single member District 1, gains population from number 4. And here's our change. They were already pretty, 3 was pretty clean. We just had to move, move some stuff around in, in order to move po population to other areas. But this changes about 1,000 a, a a thousand persons there. Number 4. On the far side of the district there, you can see we're in number four, the, the main change there was the, the change there with District 3. And then it goes south. You can see some of District 4 bleeds south there into, um, well, we'll start with D District 3. Burnett Road, Co Koenig Road, again, we're moved from, from four into three. And then we have an area four that, that drops down into five now. And you can see that that's Enfield Road. And, and, and Mopac on, on the far east there. Again, loses pop population to single member district three, gains population from single member district five. You can see here we, we, went, we started at 106,000, we ended up at 101,000, so, so still well within tolerance there. And, and we see that our citizen voting age populations are stayed all pretty clean as well. And num number five, we see single member district five here. We, we know what happened there in the north, and then, then we see a, a little bit of change here in the south, in the, I guess that's the far east south side there. With four, this, was the, this is where four came into five there off of Enfield. And then we, we move over here. This, this is South First Street and, and Mar Mary Street, parts of district five there that, that go into district six. So we lose population to District 4 and gain population from single member District 6. Single mem member District 5 went from 109 to, 
to, to still 109. We just, we just shifted some po population around there, but still within tolerance, keep in mind that, that five then became our, one of our larger districts. And single member dis district six. This is the, this, all, all the change occurred in the north here in, in this plan. We, we moved, so do you see the district six gets a little bit, loses population to, to district two, loses population to district five. Again, keep in mind district six was 124,000, so we had some significant moves to make there. A little bit more down, down here in the southern part of South First Street, also all going to district two. So we dropped from 124,000 down to 107,000. So strong, strong change there, but as, as you can see, our citizen voting age population stayed very consistent as we made those changes. And district gains population from two, loses population to five, loses population to, to district two on, the, on one side as well. And district seven, good news, no changes at district seven. So there was n no change there. So the, with the, this District 7 was 107,000 already right in our average, and we were able not to make any changes there on, on District 7. So following District, the Plan 1, we have since met with, I think we've met with just about everybody with, for one-on-one one -on -one meetings, and we got some feedback. So we used that feedback as best we could then to make changes. So I, I, this one, this plan, you might not be as familiar with, some of you have seen it. I, I know it's been in your packet, so you've probably seen it, you know, at least glance through it. I'm taking take a breath here. You ready? Plan two? All right, here we go. Plan two. So you can see in plan two, well, I'm going to go right to this second slide here. The changes are a little bit different. We put some things back where they were, and we, and we, move, and we move some stuff in some, uh, some other areas here. So following some of the comments here, we'll start with, with, district, with district one. Well, we'll start with an overall. This plan, we did lower the percentage that down to 7.1%. So, so everybody, you know, is really a, even a little bit tighter. We didn't see any significant changes to our citizen voting age population at, at, as we did this as well. And so we feel like we made some pretty good improvements here with plan two. We're working our way through it. Uh, beginning with, with single mem member D district one, you can see that we, uh, we moved, we had moved the Muller, the Mueller area um, out of single member district one or into single member district one. In, in this instance, we took it back out, left it in single member district three, and, and we used, we, we used the, the, the eastern edge of three and brought that into one in, instead of the previous move. And then we've also down at the bottom of district one, th this area is a, is a little bit different too, that we captured a little more population there from where District 2 came into District 1 in, the, in this case. That's Rosewood Avenue across the north there. So gain population on the northwest side from single member District 3, and then single member District 1 gains population, in gains and loses population on, on the southern end to single member D District 2. Here's our comparison there. In, in Plan 1, it was, <coughs> District 1 was 102,000. In Plan 2, it gets larger, it gets to 106,000, which is really a little bit closer to that overall average. You can see there that our, our percentages all stayed pretty clean there, and so we were, we were pretty pleased with that, with that change. We're actually pleased with all these changes. District 2, Plan 2, um, you can see here that District 2 gets a little more long on this side, and we removed some, some of the area on the western side that, that we, we, we'd moved previously from 6. We now went to the south. So this area to, to, to the north first that we talked about on the previous slide, and, and we had a little bit of area out here that, that we were able to move into single member district one from two. And then we have this area that was moved previously. We had, moved, we had used, if you remember, we, we, we had moved two way out here. This was now moved, moved from two into six it gets a little confusing there, but then this way we were able to move to south into six a little bit deeper, and so we captured population here that we had um, moved previously in, in single member district one on, on the west side of 35 up there. So gain, we had gains, both gains and losses from single member district one. We had lo losses of population on the western side of single member district six, 
and the western boundary becomes thir 35 between Woodward and Little Texas Lane. And single member district two gains population on the southeastern end, end of the district from SMD six. Let's see, and then, then we've, so, so again, 93,000 in 2020, jumped up to 105,000 with plan one and plan two, that, that num number drops to 100,000. But still within our, keep in mind that we, we still stayed within 7%. Now single member district three, we've actually seen two of these changes with, with, with single member district one, but we did make the, a shift here at the very bottom of single member district three there in, in two places. So this area here, we showed you a single member district one where we came over to the west. That, that was kind of a, the swap with the, the Mueller area. And then we, we do have this area where we went south down to Koenig, Burnett Road. That's very similar to plan one. And then we've added this part of, of single member district three that moved into single member district four. That, that's Guadalupe Street on in third. 35 on the east and west, and I think that's a Keaton Road on the south. So, so single member district three gains population on the southwestern side of the district from single member district four, loses population on the northeast side of the district um, to single member district one, and gains population from single member district five on the southeast side. These numbers here, so we went from 101 to 102 to now 104,000. So again, we stayed well within our our range that we were looking for there. Single member district four on the on the far west side, we made it. We, we made a couple little changes here as well. The first one, this was you know this was the this was in the previous plan. That this is Burnett and Koenig roads there, and and uh, we didn't show. Okay. Single member. This is. We lose population to the east side to single member district three, gain population on the southeastern end of the district from single member district five, and we'll see that on the next slide when we do single member district five. So in, for, for, for district four, 106,000 in 2020, we stayed right back at 106,000 in plan two, again, pretty tight to that 105,000 average. And District 5, so District 5 here, you can see that, that we, we've made some, some different changes from Plan 1 here, mo mostly on this north end. You, this is a little bit different, if you recall, before when we were moving single member District 4 in, into 5, we were on the kind of farther west here, off here in, in this area here. Now we've just brought it down here to 24th Street, um, and, and then we've also moved some of single mem member District 3 as well, this is an area that we moved as well that, that captured some of five. And then five picked up population from six, keeping in mind that six needed to drop some po population. And, and you can see they're, they're in the red. That's, um, what is that, Wolforth Road? On the south? Yeah, Old Torf. Old Torf. Can't pronounce that. West, West Old Torf. West Old, West, uh, that's, that's why that's Woolforth. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Wol Woolforth, if you combine it at 11 o'clock at night, it seems like Woolworth. <laughs> single member district five loses population on the northern end of the district to single member district three and five, and then five gains population on the southeastern end from single member district six. And we'll see district five's numbers here. We get them down to about 103,600. So that, that's, again, that's how we got that tolerance down to that 7% by getting them a little bit smaller than they were in plan one. And uh, district six, again, district six was the one where we had to remove the most po population. We had this, this large share that, we, that moved into di district two from, di from district six, we saw that. And then of course this area up in, up in the, on the farther north area where we moved po population as well from from two into six in, in this picture. And you can see that 124,000 goes from down to 107,000. So it's about the same number in district six both times. It's just the where, where we moved it to and from changed there. And so it gained population from St. Edward's na neighborhood of single member district two, loses population to single member district five, and also loses population to single member district two. And District 7, once again, was not touched. Made no changes. Made no changes. They like that 107,000 number. 
that was, uh, I did that really quick, and I'm sorry if that was too quick, um, but please, please know that this is kind of our process. You know, we, we took in as much information as we could from plan one, used that information to build pl plan two, and this continues to be fluid. So we, we know that we'll continue to have conversations and we're, we're hopefully narrowing in on a, on a plan that works for everybody. I don't know if I want to take questions here before you go to process or keep rolling. Okay, so this is just a reminder of where we are in the process. These are the things we've done so far. Since I've gone over this slide several times, we're just gonna keep on going and focus more on what we need to do still. So where we are now, what we are working on now is we have, we're working on weekly meetings um, between the legal and demographic team and your board president or other members um, and your, who as, as requested or, and the district liaison, Dr. Reach, we are um, working on doing trustee-led community meetings in the districts. We have had one of those meetings um, in in a that is a single member district specific meeting. Um, I went with Trustee Singh to a meeting, um, and then also of the of the Baptist Minister's Union, and then we have a meeting I believe scheduled in District One for I think next week. Um, and so we are working on getting those and we would strongly, strongly, strongly encourage you if you plan to have those meetings to have them as quickly as possible and get them on the books because we do really want to hear from your communities and hear what questions they have and hear what concerns they have about this process and about um, any maps that we are working on. The best way to address their concerns is to know what they are. So um, if you can hold those meetings as quickly as possible, get them on the books. Um, that will help us get this train on schedule and keep it on schedule. Um, so we, um, again, we'll be doing trustee like community meetings. We have had the, um, and then we are having one on, we've had one-on-one -on -one meetings on plan one. We'll begin to have meetings on, if you want a one-on-one -on -one meeting with, on plan two, let us know. We will have a meeting on that. We can discuss other changes you might want to, to um, the map, any concerns you might have about changes that were made between one and two or just that weren't addressed. Um, if, we, if we didn't address your concerns, and then we will, um, so we wanna work on that. So our goal is to present additional map options to you at either the April 12th and I had made or April 28th, or and I have May 12th, but I now know that that meeting is May 5th, and we're moving both those meetings up a week. So we want to be able to present additional maps to you at one of those meetings, um, and so that means we need to have the meet one-on-one -on -one meetings with you, and we need to have we need you to have your trustee meetings. So um, again, broken record. Please schedule those as quickly as possible. Um, and then we then after that at a meeting after that soon as soon as thereafter as we are able to we hope to present you with a proposed final map because again we'll, we're going to have some meetings on whatever maps we present at the next meeting and if if there if we need to keep doing this iteration and we'll keep doing it till we get to something we think is final and has addressed all your concerns. Um, but in order to do that. Um, it, we're hope we're really hopeful that we can do that at the meeting after that, which would be uh, May 5th or May 19th, if not the 26th, or if necessary, June 2nd. Um, and then we hope to adopt it at the next meeting after that. So everything, there's multiple dates on all these because it all depends on how quickly we get to that final map. Um, and then again, if needed, we do have these additional board meetings on June 2nd and June 16th, which are kind of up there built in. Um, and then your the first day to file for a place on the ballot is July 23rd. So we really, really want to get this map adopted before then, and the um, because otherwise people might be filing in a district that they don't end up living in, and that's not helpful to anybody. Um, and then the dead, statutory deadline is August 10th. Um, and the deadline to file for a place on the ballot is August 22nd, ahead of election day on November 8th. Thank you. Okay. Any other? So trustees, any questions? Trustee Anderson and then Trustee Foster. Uh, thank you for this presentation. Um, plan two, uh, you really got a lot of people talking. <laughs> um, my, I, I definitely would like to have a one-on-one -on -one about the plan two because I have some concerns about the diluting of the African-American voice in District One based on that move. And then you captured not one, but two historic campuses 
So uh, you really got people talking. So, uh, yeah, that's my two cents. But I would like to have a one-on-one -on -one about it. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Trustee Anderson. And just for the record, we're also having an exec session conversation where we can expound a little more on what your concerns are. Trustee Foster. Yeah, um, uh, this is a, it's a fascinating process that I've never been a part of before from this angle. So this is really um, interesting. And um, there's a, I have a couple of competing realities, and that's that um, in, in some cases, I mean, it's often the case that these boundaries feel super duper important, and yet we're colleagues here, and our task is to represent the entire city, all of us. And so, you know, to the extent that a boundary is so meaningful, that might be a reflection of our inadequacies as public servants. And so I, 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 I'm a little conflicted when I want to, like, wrestle over a boundary because I, I, you know, I want to serve all. So that's in my mind. Um, at the same time, another thing that's in my mind is that one of the principles is around contiguous boundaries and, and, and sort of elegance in a map. Um, and I, you know, will never forget or, or choose never to forget that not all boundaries are holy which is to say the most powerful enduring boundary in this city is East Avenue, which after the Interstate Highway Act of what, 56 and then a subsequent building of IH-35 in the early 60s became this east-west dividing line. I don't have any need to respect uh, our most unholy moment. And something that happens that's interesting in this map is it starts to, at least in the northern section, um, Trustee Anderson's district, uh, my district one and three, it starts to disrupt this historic segregationist line in, in a way. Yeah, I, I think it would be great if we just worked from your plan to big map and just had that up during the conversation. Yeah, trying to get there. Almost. Almost there. You weren't lying. It's like 40 million mm -hmm. slides there. That's, that's a lot. <laughs> um, so right, so the way, you know, you see that what the blue dividing from the yellow there, we'll just call it the blue and the yellow, um, you've just, where this map disrupts our east-west divide in ways that I think might be interesting and productive. I actually kind of like that, and I'm sure there's other tinkers and stuff to do, but um, that's something good. I am eager for community conversation um, and appreciative of your work. Thank you. Trustees, other comments? So I have a few. So first of all, I just want to make sure that we all understand what our role and responsibility is. One, we're a committee of the whole of the redistricting. We have attorneys who advise us but don't make the decisions for us. I just want to make that extremely clear because the decision ultimately lays with us. And at the end of the day, the question is really about the distribution of power in this community. And so I just want to make sure and, and to highlight, Kevin, your, your recognition that systemic discrimination has happened in the past. So I'm not really interested in these lines as well because I think we all represent Austin ISD. I think the real question for me around all these issues is that we have a deadline that we need to meet. We have to, we have to make a decision on it. And I think that's one of the things that um, I appreciate about the presentation is the, the timeline and process. We have to get to that decision. So one last thing I'll mention just because I, I think we're going to have a, an exec session conversation about it, but I have asked for at least for this discussion that we, we need to have. Um, an alternative map that is really about east to west and trying to disrupt that power distribution. If you've seen voting patterns in, in this community, they are all in one part of town. And I am not interested in perpetuating that particular piece. What I have been advised by our attorneys is that it has to meet the legal criteria, which is fine, but I think we need to have these conversations sooner than later. And I think one of the things that we're encouraging folks is to have these conversations in between the meetings 
so that we're able to find it, an option. Because we really, at the end of the day, if I can just put this in, in one succinct way, you have three options. One, you do nothing and probably someone will be suing us, if that's correct. I'm looking at our legal counsel. Somebody will sue us if we don't do anything. If we tweak with these particular ones, we're in a very safe space of perpetuating what has happened in the past considering voting rights, the Section 5, which is no longer relevant to the state of Texas, but that's unfortunate. Uh, and then third, looking at something completely different. I'm not really interested in advocating for one map or the other. I just want to make sure we're having an informed conversation with the public about what this really is about, a conversation about power and representation on this school district that allows us to continue to try to create a place that has high expectations for every single student here. So I'll stop there because I know we're going to have some other conversations in the exact session, but if there's anyone else that wants to comment, Kevin, sorry. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. And I think um, it's, a, it's a, this is where we need public engagement because even going east to west, um, there's some philosophical presuppositions about so if you create a more integrated single district, there's, there's, there's something that's really beautiful about that. But if you create a fully integrated single district where the voting representation is disproportionate, it's integrated, but in terms of the, for instance, Hispanic population that's eligible to vote, is significantly lower than the Anglo population, that integration will reproduce the power imbalance, hence what the Voting Rights Act of 65 was all about. So it, it's a question of like, is, is 2022 just like 65 in terms of voting? Or are we in a new day when folks vote differently? And I think our community <laughs> needs to weigh in on this even though it's immensely complicated. You have to like take the time to explain what the heck we're even talking about here. Yeah. But it's a really big question. Um, I did have one question for the, the consultants. Is it a fait accompli that trustees like getting districted out like have to give up their seat? Is there not a grandfather thing? Is this, is this like a legislative reality or how does that work? You cannot represent a district you don't live in. So once the district, is, once the new districts are in effect, if you don't live in it, um, you would, you could not. You would either have to move before they go into, you know, you have to move or you have to. Um, okay, so that is like sort of by statute. Somebody said that is. Yeah. The way it is. Yes, sir. Got it. Thank you. You could rent rent an apartment in that district, but yeah, that's the one way. But anyway. Uh, any other questions, trustees? Okay, thank you all so much. I appreciate you. Thank you. Going through the presentations. Um, we are going to move now to our next item of discussion with our internal auditor, Gibson Consulting. And I just want to acknowledge that um, Trustee Lugo um, had an issue that she needed to leave. So I'm going to ask Dr. Reach to. Uh, introduce uh, Gibson Consulting and also just take the opportunity to thank Trustee Lugo for serving as our chair of the audit committee. Dr. Thank you. And, um, thank you. So I, I am uh, pleased to welcome our partners, Gibson Consulting, and we are joined here tonight with uh, Keith Ingram, who has been our lead from Gibson on our risk assessment and on our internal audit work, and also his colleague, Will Hardaway. And uh, we also are thankful to have uh, Greg Gibson, uh, who's also here um, in the audience tonight. But um, so on behalf of the, uh, the, the staff support for the audit committee, thank you. And we'd like to turn it over um, to Kent to provide our presentation tonight. Thank you, Jacob. I'm gonna share a brief presentation with you all. Let me, I think you need to enable me here.
Okay. Um, President R R Rodriguez, trustees, Dr. Elizalde, thank you so much for the, the time and opportunity to present the results of our internal audit risk assessment. Our agenda today is a brief introduction of the project, then we'll go over the objectives and approach of the risk assessment. Um, we'll include a listing of what we refer to as the audit universe of Austin ISD. We'll then do a brief discussion on the risk and scoring methodology we applied. We have some general observations um, through this project and then also specific observations over the five highest scored areas that's included in this uh, presentation. We include our full scoring matrix and then it culminates with a recommended audit plan for you to consider over the next three years. Um, as Dr. Reach mentioned, I'm Ken Ingram, a CPA and senior auditor at Gibson. I served as the project director. Uh, Will Hardaway to my left uh, also was very integral and key in this project. If you recall, um, back in November of 21, we were engaged to perform this risk assessment really with the purpose of kickstarting a new internal audit program uh, for Austin ISD. Um, we're also required to do this by the Institute of Internal Auditors. Um, anytime we have an internal audit program, it must be based on risk-based plans. So that was kind of number one. We needed to do this in order to comply with some standards promulgated by the IIA. We always like to include this disclaimer. This is not an audit. We say this multiple times. You will not find any findings or recommendations for improvement in this report. That was not the objective. This is not an assessment of performance of any one area. This is simply an assessment of risk. We always like to say that because anytime someone sees their department up here, that it's right for them to get a little defensive, but this is just about risk and not performance. Um, this information we include in our report and presentation may or may not reflect actual best practices. We did not go into really deep dives on any areas. We didn't do testing or really super robust data analysis. So we don't have any, anything like that, any definitive statement of fact regarding performance. Okay, now that's out of the way. Um, why did we do this? Um, really it was to determine what should we look at first? What should we audit first for your district? We did that uh, by evaluating multiple risk factors um, across your audit universe, which we'll talk about both of those things in a little bit. We then assigned risk scores to these areas. Then we prioritized an audit plan based on those risk scores for you with some additional considerations that we include as well. Our approach was mainly comprised of three tasks. We requested and analyzed a lot of data. So at this point, I'd like to thank Dr. Reach and his team uh, for all their work. It's a, it's a tough job being our client liaison. Um, he did a lot of wrangling and a lot of organizing and we could not have done it without him and his team. So thank you very much. Um, this data we requested included job descriptions, organization charts, uh, performance measures, um, discipline incidents, uh, kind of a, a whole gamut of, of items. We then analyze this data, use that to inform our interviews, which were our second phase. Um, we were able to speak with each of you during this process. Also spoke with each member of the executive leadership team and many departmental leaders as well. Um, there's a full list of interviewees and an appendix to our report. I think you'll see it was a pretty robust project. We talked to quite a few, quite a few folks and we're very uh, grateful of administration's time as well. Um, we view our interviews as another data collection activity. So we kind of took what we learned in data analysis and our interviews, we combined it together and then performed our risk assessment and scoring, which was kind of the third uh, task of this project. This is that audit universe I was referring to. Um, what I want to point out here is that it does, is not um, solely focused on financial or operational areas. Um, we know that school districts are very complex and obviously the primary objective is educating children. So we also include academic programs within this audit universe. Uh, we believe this is a more holistic way to view your district and um, all the areas where risk resides within AISD. The risk factors that we assessed are included here on this slide. There are nine total. Um, important to note here is that these are not just financial risks. School districts are much more um, complicated than that, more complex. So we include things like um, inefficiency, health and safety risk, 
and also risk of negative public sentiment, which can be great depending on the area. We included a little bit of overview on our risk scoring that we provided or that we applied in this project. We had a couple of weights I want to touch on briefly. Each of those risk factors that I included in the previous slide, those nine risk factors, were assigned a weight of significance. So the best way to describe this is an example, kind of thinking of what could go wrong in an instance. Um, for example, if something were to go wrong within the health and safety um, for a student or staff, that would be a much higher significance than if we had an inefficient process. Um, the, the impact of the district would be far greater, so that was assigned a higher weight. Uh, the second area, the second weight we applied was an audit area weight, and this is kind of best thought of as control or impact on district resources. So another example of this, financial management is an area that touches pretty much every audit area we listed due to its commitment of resources, its, its process and budgeting. That was assigned a higher weight than um, communications, which is important, but does, does commit fewer resources of the district. Um, once we assigned those weights, we then spent the most of our time doing the second bullet, which was the evaluation and scoring of risks. So I'm gonna spend just a tiny bit of time talking here about the two different risk types. There's inherent risk, um, which just exists because we're a school district. We can't do anything, it's there. Um, that's within all of those nine risk factors. So we evaluated and scored the inherent risk. Then through our data analysis and testing, we scored the district specific risk or residual risk. So this is what exists after we take into account all the great controls and processes in place in AISD. We cannot eliminate risk ever, but we can you know, mitigate it. But there's still this little, this, this residual risk that's there. Um, these two aspects, inherent risk and district specific risk, will comprise your kind of risk assessment profile, your risk scoring, along with those weights that I just talked about. Um, we then ran our calculations and then converted it to 100 point scale. And then we um, essentially generated this risk summary matrix that's included um, at the culmination of this presentation. Um, again, these scores are important because in our mind, they determine the priority for the audit area. However, um, something that is very important for you and, and your governance and oversight, this is not set in stone. Um, you have every right to charge us to look into any area. Um, oftentimes, through with multiple, multiple districts and partners we work with, something will come up where the board will say, you know what, actually we're thinking about going out for a bond program. We need to look at this first. That will shoot up the list, that's fine. Or they'll hear patterns from constituents that maybe will indicate something needs to be investigated in a program. They'll bring that up, that will supersede other areas. That's a really critical thing um, for you guys to know. Uh, we want that to happen. This is not a static document, it, it will change and that's, and that's perfectly acceptable. Uh, we included some global themes that we saw during this risk assessment. Um, these should probably not be a shock to you. I don't imagine they are. Um, but what we saw is that uh, many of our leadership positions have new faces in them. There's been a lot of turnover. Um, this transition time always, um, rep always increases risks as people are learning their new roles. And also, to the second bullet point, likely changing existing processes and procedures. Um, that increases risk of training folks on these new procedures. There are also... Um, many uh, departments that are implementing new information systems or upgrading information systems that has a large training and kind of process component as well, um, which can be risky to the district. Um, something that you're well aware of is um, during interviews, we heard a lot about um, the financial constraints, obviously facing AISD, but the pressures that were felt um, to reduce expenditures and really bring on um, increased and <laughs> increased efficiency in every area. Um, anytime there's increased pressure on something, that does increase the risk um, facing that. One thing that was brought up in almost all of our interviews, of course, was the impact of the pandemic on student learning. Um, COVID kind of increased the risk profile in multiple areas, um, not just for AISD, but state, nationwide. That's something we just wanted to point out here that was definitely an impact on the risk assessment. Another thing that we saw was some departments were really good at using performance data and KPIs to kind of 
um, inform their management practices. Other departments were still maybe junior in that and not as uh, sophisticated or far along. So we saw kind of varying KPI use throughout the district. Um, one thing that reduced risk in many areas, there's been a lot of previous internal audit activity that did occur and also um, consulting activity that occurred as well. So what we did is we looked at those uh, reports and scopes of work and saw that it did reduce risk in many of our audit areas. These next few slides will share some observations for our top five risk areas. Highest risk area was special education. This is an area the district has already devoted a number of resources to, consultants, outside vendors, which decreased risk. The um, primary observations that drove the risk scoring here were one, the high inherent risks due to the legal and regulatory environment surrounding special education. Recent RDAs have shown unfavorable performance indicators um, showing potentially lower academic performance. The ongoing federal lawsuit regarding evaluations and the high turnover in leadership in the department. Uh, the second highest area we had was human resources. So you'll see it's similar to um, special education, operates in a highly complex regulatory environment. That's an inherent risk factor that was high. Another high inherent risk factor is just the labor shortage we're facing in education that you guys are all aware of. This is increased pressure, again, on recruitment and onboarding activities. We need to have really efficient, robust processes for identifying talent, quickly getting them and onboarding them and making them uh, valuable human capital for the district. Um, for Austin ISD specifically, um, through interviews we learned that the position control process is highly manual, reliant on spreadsheets to kind of track who's where, um, how positions are moving and, and budgeted vacancies and things of that nature. Um, anytime we have a lot of spreadsheets, they're prone to error and inefficiencies, so that increased the risk in HR. Also through interviews, we heard um, from, from multiple uh, individuals concerns over time and attendance controls. Um, some folks uh, indicated they had a concern over time theft, and so that was something that um, prompted a higher scoring of human resources as well. Next risk area is construction management. The primary observations here were inherent risks associated with a potential bond program public comments and media coverage raising concerns over the equity of facilities updates raised the risk of negative public sentiment here and high management turnover in the department has also increased risk. Next area was academic program management. Primary observations here were the inherent risks related to the fact that all districts ultimately are accountable to TEA for their academic results. New data management software is being implemented in many academic departments, raising risks around data integrity and efficiency. And according to interviews, changes to accountability structures have been inconsistently implemented across the district. Our fifth area was financial management. Um, this is another, another area that has high inherent risk and a relatively low district specific risk, uh, but the inherent risks were quite high. Um, Firstly, due to, again, another very complex regulatory environment we find ourselves in. Um, the impact of financial management is large, as I hinted to earlier. Um, really, they have their kind of fingers in everything that the district is doing through their control of resources. Specific to AISD, obviously our increasing recapture payments combined with some um, stagnating or slightly declining enrollment have made a very tricky financial position uh, that has increased uh, risk system-wide for financial management. And also it's another area that did see some turnover of leadership positions. Um, there's new folks in roles and that's always a transition time that can increase risk to the district. There's that summary matrix that I was referring to earlier. Um, you can see on the left, we include each audible area, and it culminates, if you go down to the right column, you see their point scale. So as we said earlier, special education had the highest um, scaled score, and with research and evaluation receiving the lowest scaled score at 46. Uh, our final slide includes our recommended audit plan based on that um, risk assessment matrix that we just went over with a few caveats. Um, for fiscal year 23, we're recommending performing a human resources audit, a construction management audit, 
an academic program management audit, and a procurement and contracts audit. We've included on this table the risk ranking associated with each area. You'll see procurements and contracts is 11, which is maybe a little confusing since there's other areas that are higher, higher risk ranked <clears throat> below them. However, we think um, this would be a lower level of effort audit to do. The, the three that we've listed before are quite robust. Procurement and contracts would be a little bit smaller, something we could fit in um, within that same time frame, and also is still a top 15 risk area. In fiscal year 24, we're recommending a special education audit. Um, this is not recommended for next year due to the ongoing consulting efforts within special education. We think um, audit fatigue is a very real thing. Um, and also, we don't want to be just a, another cook in the kitchen, so to speak, uh, another voice that could distract that, that department from their uh, current efforts. Also recommending financial management for that year and federal programs. This is another area that would be a um, smaller scope or smaller level of effort audit. And we think, too, if we combine it with financial management, we get some synergies with those projects and maybe some potential savings on the federal program side. Um, we're also recommending a governance audit in fiscal year 24. Um, again, this is another area where I know that you guys have worked with some consultants in recent times, so we don't want to be just another voice kind of distracting there. And you'll see in 25, our last year we've included here, this simply follows the remainder of the top 10 of the risk assessment uh, with transportation, PEAMS and student information systems. Um, if we have bilingual and ESL or emergent uh, bilingual, multilingual students, and then safety and security. So with that, I'd like to open it up to any questions or comments. Thank you. Um, trustees, any questions? Tr Trustee Ash? Um, more of a, a comment, as I think um, with Trustee Lugo and uh, Trustee Zapata not here, I was, I'm the only one that was at the, the um, audit committee meeting that they were kind enough to come and present to, um, and just wanted to kind of give a little bit more information around the robust conversation we even had at the audit committee meeting about the scheduling of it, and um, that this is coming to you supported by the audit committee, the plan and the current layout was, was supported by the audit committee members. Uh, Trustee Wagner. And I did just want to chime in and say I apologize for our reticence. I think you're catching us very late at night, so <laughs> I think we usually be a little bit more um, more energized with questions, but um, I'm, I'm pleased with the plan and where the work um, has gone. And I also know that this is a reflection of many conversations that you've had with individual trustees along the way as well. And so um, thank you for, for bringing forward a plan that I think will go a long way to helping us examine um, our most critical areas. Thank you. Thank you, Trust Trustee Boswell. Yeah, I want to add a thanks to you guys and to the audit committee because it's obviously a vast amount of work um, that's gone into it. So thank you. Trustees, anything else? Any other questions? Thank you all very much for all the work. And, I, and again, thank you to Trustee Zapata, uh, Trustee Ashy, and our chair, Trustee uh, Lugo. Thank you. Thank you. Our last item under information reports and updates is a presentation on fiscal year 2022-2023 preliminary budget. Dr. Elisabeth. Thank you. We'll have our chief financial officer begin this portion and then as necessary, Chief Stevens may be joining him. So I know we've got a lot going and we're working to try to find a variety of ways to continue to try to meet all of the requests knowing that there is still a very limited amount of funds and there is there is simply at this point they're just very difficult decisions and there are going to be a variety of perspectives on why this, not that, why not this, why that, and all of those perspectives are 
certainly valid. We do have a time constraint by law, along with also understanding what all of the operations of this district really require to keep them functioning. So with that, I'll turn it over to Chief Ramos. President Rodriguez, Dr. Lizalde, members of the board. So before you, you have the 22-23 uh, preliminary budget. Keep it in mind that that word preliminary. So these are preliminary projections. Uh, there are still some key uh, data points that we are uh, waiting to receive, the biggest one being our ultimate taxable values. And so we should receive those next week. Uh, I'll go a little bit into those details. Um, but uh, I want to just quickly introduce uh, Katrina Montgomery, our Assistant Superintendent of Financial Services, and Adriana Cedillo, my budget director. Uh, these two ladies and their teams really uh, put a lot of work into uh, assisting me with getting these uh, projections ready, uh, the numbers ready, working with uh, multiple departments, uh, also working very closely with uh, the Human Capital Department to make sure that uh, we provide uh, as accurate projections as we can. So really thank uh, these ladies and their team. Uh, one of the things that uh, we want to start out with, if you go to the next slide, is looking at our overall revenue and uh, expenditures. And so one of the things that uh, you'll see is that we are, once you take into account the amount of local taxes that we are bringing in, uh, which is uh, $1.6 million in revenue, you add our expenditures and we are looking at a net change of $6.6 .6 million shortfall. So we have made huge strides in getting to a, a completely balanced budget as, as we could. Uh, keeping in mind that we also have ESSER dollars to assist us uh, with our uh, overall budget. It was included in our plan to supplant uh, our budget with uh, ESSER dollars. Uh, we have included uh, $31.2 million in that effort. Uh, the big number also to uh, watch in this slide is, of course, our recapture payment. Uh, that payment we are estimating at almost $799 million. And so we are, again, watching that number very closely uh, because uh, I will go over some of our assumptions and we are starting to hear uh, some preliminary projections on our taxable values based on what other uh, districts are hearing from their appraisal districts. Uh, next slide. So again, we, we are projecting a flat enrollment. Uh, uh, Alejandro had some good news for us as far as the younger uh, grade levels. We are seeing uh, an increase in, uh, in enrollment and, and registrations at the pre-K level, kindergarten level. So that's a huge bonus for us, uh, hoping that we uh, maintain our student enrollment at the secondary level. So that would be a huge uh, plus in, in making sure our budget numbers work. Uh, again, looking at a 92% attendance rate, just because it's gonna take time for uh, our students to come back to the district uh, when they're sick. Uh, right now, the, uh, the, the chance of them staying home is, is very likely, and so that's going to reduce our overall uh, attendance uh, for next year. Uh, the number that we're closely watching, of course, is that 8% property value growth, and so we plugged in uh, the highest property value growth that we've seen uh, in, in Austin ISD. However, we are already hearing uh, other districts and their appraisal uh, districts letting them know that to expect property value growth between 15 to 20 percent. And so once, if, if our uh, property value growth is that high, you're going to see our uh, recapture payment continue to climb. So when I've been telling you in three to four years we'll reach a billion, that may change to two to three years. And so we are watching that number very closely. Uh, it will affect uh, our, our recapture payment, our tax collections, of course. Uh, our tax rate will probably be lower than projected. Uh, but again, in, in just looking at the housing values uh, that we are seeing, uh, the Austin Board of Realtors recently uh, published a, a report uh, that the uh, median home value in Austin is, I think, $632,000. So that is huge. Uh, so next week, we do have a, a meeting with the appraisal district, and so we will f have a good number for you at the May meeting as far as what these numbers will look like. Next slide. And so this gives a, uh, a good, good uh, 
big picture summary of the pluses and minuses uh, in our budget. And so you have uh, our operating uh, budget increases, our investments to the budget. And so we've made several investments uh, in our 22-23 budget. Uh, those are a total $25 million. Uh, the biggest one uh, on the campus side is we did increase the, the per pupil allocate. Even though we cut campuses by 5% in their overall budgets, uh, this year we, we did in include an increase in their per pupil allocation. Uh, the biggest one we also this year included a $2, two million dollar investment in what we call the equity allotment. And so uh, what that piece is, is we already um, compensate campuses with uh, higher economically disadvantaged student populations uh, using uh, state comp ed allotments, using Title I allotments. And those additional funds go straight into uh, a campus's instructional expenditure, so in the classroom. Uh, one of the things that we see as a district, however, is that we do have campuses with uh, higher eco-disc student populations that cannot raise funds, uh, have activities outside of the classroom that some of our other campuses uh, have the opportunity uh, to do uh, in, in, throughout the district. And so what this allotment does is it provides uh, those campuses with that opportunity, specifically to be used in co-curricular, extracurricular type activities. So uh, if you have a campus that has a UIL program, they now have uh, funds to uh, supplement that UIL program with additional um, uh, supplies needed, uh, just uh, competition materials needed to prepare the students. Uh, if there's existing clubs, they now have uh, funds to assist with uh, uh, improving those clubs or looking at after school activities that occur at that campus. So the goal is to try to, to, try to have the students become uh, involved and participate in the campus, the campus culture, uh, not only in the, in, in the classroom, but outside of the classroom. Great example is UIL. Uh, you get the kids involved in UIL competitions, uh, that's something they may not be exposed to, now they have that opportunity. You may have a campus that has uh, uniforms that are, are getting uh, kind of outdated, they're not in the rotation schedule, now that campus has an opportunity to potentially purchase uniforms for their student group. So uh, things of that nature, uh, it, it just allows uh, all students to have a, a more equal opportunity than what they've had before uh, in the district. The next big changes, of course, are in our uh, employees. So looking at compensation, uh, we are looking at increasing uh, and prioritizing our hourly employees that are in the NIS, IS, and auxiliary pay grades uh, to $16 an hour uh, minimum uh, pay. And so that is a, at a cost of $8 million. Uh, teacher base pay, we're looking at increasing it by $1,000, uh, all teachers uh, at $5.5 million, and then looking at increasing their salary by 2% of midpoint. When you add the $1,000 teacher base pay and the 2% of midpoint, uh, that averages out to about a 3.7% of midpoint pay raise. So one of the things that you're going to start hearing uh, throughout uh, the news media this month is school districts are going to start passing their compensation increases. You've already heard Pflugerville uh, just passed a 3% pay raise for all employees. And so you're going to start hearing that percentage number come out. So I wanted to make sure that the board was aware when we p uh, put in our two uh, compensation increases for our teachers, it's going to average to about a 3.7% of midpoint pay raise. So that makes it more comparable to what you'll be hearing what other districts are starting to give. And then of course, our bus drivers were uh, another uh, area that we wanted to prioritize in our budget. Uh, we uh, moved their minimum pay to $21 per hour. And so again, the total uh, coming in at $25.4 million. Then we look at the budget decreases. Where did we uh, begin uh, reducing our overall expenditures? So we know that throughout next year we're going to have vacancies. Uh, and those vacancies are going to produce budget savings because it, it's, we're not going to have 100% uh, full employment in the district. And so we, we wanted to build that into our budget projection. So that's a $6 million savings uh, in just knowing that throughout the year we will have vacancies in our payroll. Uh, then we looked at central office operational budget reductions and realignment. And so that was uh, $32 million in overall reductions. Uh, that included a, a reduction of 375 personnel units. Uh, then we looked at campus budget reductions. That included the, the 5%. Uh, 
Uh, much of the reductions at the campus level were because of our shortfall in enrollment. So we, were sh we basically hired for an additional 3,000 students that didn't materialize. And so as vacancies occurred throughout the campus uh, areas, we, we just did not hire for those positions and we collapsed those positions within the budget. So that was about 257 FTEs. One of the comments I heard tonight was about the 632 positions. How did we go from 250 to 632? So if you remember early on uh, in, in August, September, we knew that the enrollment did not materialize. So one of the things that we uh, started doing as a district immediately is we began uh, teacher leveling, collapsing uh, uh, positions. And as vacancies occurred, even uh, early on in the fall, uh, we did not hire for those uh, vacant positions. So we started that work early on in the process. Uh, then we looked at uh, that additional planning period, moving away from that, uh, when it was uh, loud and clear that that was not a direction that the district wanted to uh, move towards, then we knew we had to cut additional positions at the central office and administrative level. So that's where the additional 250 positions came about. So you add the 250 positions uh, that we uh, moved in the direction of because um, we moved away from the uh, extra planning period, and you add what we had already done as a district throughout the year, that's where the total 632 positions come from. And then uh, you look at uh, PPE equipment, much of that is now uh, covered by ESSER funds, so we are not having to cover that with our operating fund. And then travel and cell phones, uh, that also, uh, we, we uh, moved away from paying uh, cell and travel uh, stipends. So that was at a cost of two million. So again, we have reduced the overall budget by $52 million. Uh, which is a huge reduction in, in our overall expenditures. Uh, but again, the bulk of that is coming through uh, personnel. Uh, when you look at payroll, it's 86% of our budget. We knew that in order to make a dent, not only to pay our recapture payment, balance our budget, but also be able to uh, uh, propose a budget to the board that also included targeted compensation increases. So uh, again, as Dr. Elizalde stated, these were some tough decisions that, that we are having to make. Uh, they're not popular, uh, but uh, at the end of the day, we, we do know that we have to uh, bring our budget back in order. We have to balance our budget in order to be able to continue to uh, provide not only for our students, but our employees with compensation increases in the future. And then there has been some questions on the, uh, the proposed budget increases and, and did we tie those into uh, basically our strategic plan and our scorecard. And so uh, in your uh, board update, you will receive uh, uh, that specific, those specific details on the budget increases and how those tie into our strategic plan. Uh, many of those areas uh, that we uh, invested in the district included uh, areas in the equity and needs of students, uh, the fiscal stewardship, and then the teacher and employee well-being as far as on the strategic plan side. Uh, on the scorecard, uh, I think uh, Trustee Boswell uh, caught one of them, the uh, equity allotment for students that, that does fall into goal six uh, in our scorecard as well as goal 13. And so goal six was students participating in co-curricular activities. Uh, goal 13 is student satisfaction. So uh, we have uh, tied uh, these uh, additions to uh, both our strategic plan and our goal uh, scorecard goals. Uh, one of the things that we did different this year than prior uh, budget uh, processes is we did include uh, the um, tying uh, our budgets to the strategic plan uh, as well as uh, to the uh, equity, uh, 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 equitable practices for systematic change. And so that is uh, training that, again, we had uh, throughout the district, uh, so all department heads uh, campuses also tied that in, uh, included that as part of the process, uh, and, and uh, as well as the um, uh, campus improvement plans and how they tie their budgets into the campus improvement plans uh, was included as part of that process. So uh, again, the goal was to try to have uh, department heads and campuses uh, really think about not just uh, wh where is this money going, let's, let's put the exact same dollar amount that we had last year but really having a plan as far as uh, justifying uh, where their budget dollars were allocated. Uh, next slide. 
And so this slide basically shows, um, again, the, the impact that, it, that recapture has in our budget. So uh, in looking at expenditures, uh, recapture is 48.9, almost 49% of our expenditures. Uh, the rest of our budget, of course, uh, the majority is going to go to payroll costs. And so, uh, again, when you look at the, the graph on the right, 86.2% uh, of our 22-23 uh, budget is projected uh, to be in payroll. So when you're looking at reducing overall expenditures uh, as a district, uh, that's one area that we had to look at, and that's where the 632 uh, reduction in, in positions came from. Next slide. And when you look at reducing expenditures, uh, one of the goals that we had is, is, is cut deep enough so that we could take care of our employees. So that was very important. Uh, we prioritized a, uh, a certain group of employees in the budget to make sure that we at least uh, were able to take care of that group. Uh, when you look at teacher salaries, um, one of the things that you'll notice is the uh, light blue, uh, thicker line, that's Austin ISD. Uh, the last time uh, I presented on teacher compensation, uh, you asked for an average that included PPFT, so that's what this slide shows. Uh, one of the interesting things, if you notice, is that when you look at our slide, our, our line, uh, teachers with the zero to five year experience go way above uh, what other districts are paying. And then it averages back out to uh, about the middle competitive area for uh, experiences 10 years through 20 years. And so I thought that was an interesting data point, so I, I dug a little bit deeper into that and uh, talked to Human Capital. Uh, what we discovered was that when we first rolled out PPFT, um, the Professional Pathways for Teachers, it was a voluntary program. And so uh, during that, uh, the first few years, we had our zero to five year teachers jumping onto the program and really embracing it. Uh, our more experienced teachers were slower to take advantage of that program. And so when you look at this graph, it really shows the impact that if you started this program early on, every time you earn points and a base salary, that base salary stays with you. So every year that you stay with Austin <laughs> ISD, your pay is gonna go much higher. So one of the things that uh, we, we began um, starting last year is that 100% of our teachers are now part of this program. And so in, in knowing that and knowing that all teachers can earn points and increase their base pay, uh, we feel that that, that uh, blue line is going to start being very competitive at the experience level as well. Uh, what's going to help us again also is that increase uh, of $1,000 to base pay and then the 2% increase um, uh, to the, the midpoint of all salaries. So right now the graph that you see there mm -hmm. is without the raises and so we feel that once we plug in the raises and, and hear what other districts are doing, we are going to maintain uh, that competitive uh, uh, edge with other districts. The goal again is to, to be uh, ultra competitive and be one of the top paying districts in Central Texas. So that is our goal. Uh, we've got a three year goal to get there. Uh, and we think uh, once we control the budget and, and, and get the, balance, the budget to a balanced uh, point, we can achieve that, that uh, goal as, as a district. Next slide. So recapture, this is the, the word that uh, brings uh, just a, a bad taste to our mouths in, in Austin ISD. Uh, we are in a perfect storm in Austin where uh, as our enrollment uh, continues to decline, uh, property values continue to escalate at a rapid pace, that uh, what, what that causes is your recapture payment to go up incredibly fast. And so, uh, again, this year we're estimating a $761 million recapture payment. Next year, $799 million. And that's assuming an 8% growth. So that number uh, may change once we hear uh, preliminary estimates from our appraisal district. Uh, but again, uh, it, in looking at the recapture program, it, it's... Uh, it, it's just not, not a fair system, and we, we've talked about that before. Uh, when the program first uh, began uh, back in 94, there were 34 districts that participated in recapture. They paid a total of 131 million. Uh, last year, 158 districts qualified. Uh, they paid a total of $3 billion. 
Uh, and, and this year, uh, we are projecting Austin ISD to uh, pay over 26% of recapture payments in the state. Uh, so it, it's a problem that's not going to go away. Um, what, what I like to say is Austin ISD, we believe in paying our fair share. Uh, we believe in the Robin Hood program, but right now our share is not fair. And so what, what we are forced to pay um, um, through the finance formulas, it, it's not fair. You see that when uh, we're having to send a recapture payment, balance our budget, give a compensation increase, and still reduce our overall employees by 632. Um, when you look at the, the recapture program, it was based on property wealth, uh, but not personal wealth, which is a huge difference. And so when you look at the personal wealth in Austin ISD, 52% of our students are economically disadvantaged. So 52% of our families uh, are not at the wealthy level. And so we, we are one of the districts that, that this program was meant to help, but instead we're, we're the highest paying district in the state. Next slide. And so this really breaks it down into uh, what everyone knows, a dollar. So when you look at a dollar, if you tear that dollar almost in half, uh, the 49 cents of that dollar goes to the state of Texas in the form of recapture. We keep 51 cents for expenditures. Uh, and then when you look at the, the part that we keep as a district, 86% of that goes to our employees. And so that does not leave us much wiggle room as far as our remaining uh, budget. So uh, again, puts us in a very difficult situation. Um, what are the fixes to the recapture program? Uh, there's already discussions, and, and uh, Trustee Boswell has been, uh, is probably very familiar with this, as far as enrollment funding, funding uh, the state of, uh, funding the education system through enrollment rather than uh, average daily attendance. And so the, the theory behind that is uh, when you have a teacher teaching in a classroom, if she has 15 students one day, 20 the next day, you don't change her salary based on the number of students that she had uh, that day averaged out for the year. And so that is uh, conversations that are beginning to occur statewide. Uh, one of the things that we have to be careful with, of course, is how that, uh, if they move in that direction, uh, how that is going to be structured. And so the goal is that the, uh, for that to work, the ultimate uh, increase to the basic allotment would have to increase. Uh, so every district would basically have to win. Uh, and if that happens, then our recapture payment would go down as a district. Uh, plus, it would, it would make budgeting uh, uh, much more uh, manageable as a school district. Uh, another area that we are also looking at is the cost of education index. So basically, what we're saying is there are certain areas in the state of Texas where it's more expensive to, to live in. The cost of living is much more expensive uh, than some areas in the state. And so if you put... Uh, a, a funding allocation based on that, that would also help us as a district. And then finally, uh, an easy concept, give us a discount if we pay our recapture payment early or on time. Uh, a 10% discount would, would mean over $76 million, almost $80 million uh, for Austin ISD. So uh, just that small tweak to us would, meet, would, would make a huge stride in, in balancing our budget and taking care of our, our students and our employees. Next slide. And then this graph shows the gap that is beginning to grow uh, uh, with uh, local taxpayers and the state. So what it basically shows is as the state of Texas property values continue to grow statewide, uh, local taxpayers are bearing more of the expense of uh, education than the state. And so that used to be the case uh, before they passed House Bill 3. Uh, so once House Bill 3 passed, it did slow that down, but it slowed that down for a year. Uh, then you have these uh, strong property value growths, not only in, in Austin, but throughout the state. And so that is, is causing that gap to begin to increase. And so every year uh, that goes by, uh, the state will contribute less, uh, a smaller percentage uh, to public education, and local taxpayers will continue to foot more of, of that cost. And then the importance of having <clears throat> strong reserves, a strong unassigned fund balance. So uh, in, in, in our district, we have a, a local board policy at 20%, and we have that for a reason. 
Uh, one, uh, we want to make sure that we maintain our strong uh, bond rating, that AAA bond rating. It's the highest bond rating uh, that any school district can receive. Uh, but also, a strong, strong reserves really help with cash flow. So school districts, especially Austin, we receive our uh, local revenue December, January, February. And so by the time we get to the end of our fiscal year, uh, or, or by the time we get to the months where uh, we're, we're not receiving any funds, which is October, November, uh, without strong reserves, we would not be able to make our payroll. And so we would have to borrow money, which again turns to increased costs. Uh, and so that is one of the reasons that we want to maintain that minimum 20% a threshold to make sure that we are able to pay our employees without having to borrow money. Also, it, it allows us to uh, be prepared during any economic uh, slowdowns, uh, during any natural disasters. Uh, when, you, when we saw Winter Storm Uri, if we didn't have uh, these fund balances and, and these strong reserves, we wouldn't have been able to immediately uh, begin repairs that we needed to, to make throughout the district to get school uh, prepared and ready to go. Uh, if we waited for uh, insurance proceeds because we didn't have strong proceeds, then that would have delayed us by months. And so that would uh, have uh, caused issues throughout the district. So again, strong reserves uh, really uh, help a school district. Uh, it also would cushion us from any unforeseen changes that may come in the future with state funding. Uh, we never know what's going to happen uh, depending on what happens at the legislature. And so we want to make sure that we are prepared uh, to cushion us financially and bear any unforeseen uh, circumstances that may occur with funding. And then finally, our tax rate, again, because of Senate Bill 1 and House Bill 3, uh, because our property values are growing at such a fast pace, uh, you will see our total tax rate continue to decline uh, year over year. And so right now we are projecting a four cent decrease uh, for the 22-23 school year. Uh, over the next four years, we, we are projecting a 10 cent dec decrease. But again, that's at an 8% property value growth. So if, if our property values come in much higher than that, uh, then you'll see uh, our, our tax decrease uh, even uh, uh, much at a much rapid pace. So that being said, I will open it up for questions. Trustees, questions? Uh, could you explain? I just don't understand how, how that works. Why does the tax rate decrease? So the way the property, the, the way the state funding formula system is set up, if your total taxable values grow faster than the statewide average in property value growth, then the state will cover uh, that additional growth by reducing your tax rate. So it, it was an effort by the state to give uh, property tax relief uh, to homeowners. And so the average uh, property value growth in the state of Texas is about 4%. If ours is 8%, then our tax rate would, would go down uh, because of that uh, strong growth. But the state would cover that uh, within the funding system. So we, we don't lose out because we're lowering our tax rate further than what we needed to. Got you. Um, if I can add just a little bit to that from a less expertise than he is, the way he explained it to me. So um, my property values in Austin have gone up 8%, but the average in the state is 4 So I'm going to get a bill that's going to be less in terms of the tax rate. Now, I'm not going to really feel like I'm Oh, look, I got all this money compared to last year because the property value went so much higher that they're trying to keep it so that it's even. I don't see huge spikes in my tax bill. Mm -hmm. So I think the differentiation is too often tax rate and tax payment are sometimes conflated. Conflated. Thank you. I couldn't think of the term at 1152. <laughs> so... <clears throat> So as the tax rates go up in areas like ours at a fast rate, the state said, we want to help property owners feel this. Well, that, if it, that actually did happen, then we wouldn't be getting that money, which at the end of the day, if you look at that other slide that has the dollar bill cut, mm -hmm. slide eight, we actually aren't going to get the money anyway. But 
at least from the standpoint of a citizen, it was to try to keep these high fluctuations from affecting districts. So initially you would think, well, then we're going to get less money, <clears throat> but the state right now, but that's not going to be right now. Isn't that set to expire? Mm -hmm. and, and we don't know if they're going to continue funding that. What's the year that it's going to expire? So in, I believe it's in 20, what was it? I think it's 2024 unless 20, it's renewed. About two years. But, but we don't even know that they have enough money to cover it that long. So they initially put it till 2024. I think that's what I recall. But they set aside money to make up for those. And if they don't have enough money, then they will have to go back to what they had. So I think it was a bait and switch, mm -hmm. my opinion. I've, I've taken enough math classes to do addition and subtraction and some multiplication. I don't think I took enough finance classes, but I do know enough to know that this is a pretty raw deal. Um, the 26% of the recaptured dollars in the state come from Austin Independent <laughs> School District. Is that correct? For this year, yes. 26% of the recaptured dollars collected by the state come from Austin ISD. Last year it was 25%. And last so year it was 25 so it's, it's, it's trending in a certain direction. At the same time, 52% of our students are low eco dis. Correct. Thank you. And if I may, again, the conflation of the property wealthy school district versus student family wealth. Conflating those two, making assumptions that because you are in a property wealthy district, we must be serving all wealthy students and their families. Trustee Boswell and Trustee Wagner. Um, thank you, Mr. Ramos, for this presentation. And I appreciate you um, taking the extra time to wrap, uh, to connect the advocacy piece to the funding piece, because I think it's, it's easy to talk about the budget in a vacuum and then to rally people when it's time to advocate. And I think the more we can pair the what and the why, um, the more helpful it is when it's time for us as a state to advocate. And districts all across the state are facing these challenges right now, recapture or not, um, because Texas school funding is in the lowest quarter of the country. We fund more than $3,000 less than the national average, and we educate about 10% of all kids in the country, so we're not the only district facing this. Correct. Um, we, we do have this special circumstance of the, the big recapture, um, and, and I know we'll be talking more about that Later, I just want to thank you for making that connection for people when we're making these very, very difficult decisions as a district. Yeah. And we continue advocating and bringing awareness. We've made presentations to the Austin Chamber, yes. uh, to the, the city of Austin, to Travis County. And so we continue to do our best to uh, not only uh, bring awareness to our community, but to our close partners in the city. I appreciate it, and um, you're a great translator of it, and it's it's an important message. So I know it's above and beyond your normal work, and I really appreciate it. Um, I have a quick question about Esser, just to clarify. The statesman, I think, didn't get it quite right okay. um, when they said that district officials plan to use a portion of uh, the money the district received from the third round of federal pandemic relief funds to avoid relying on district reserves and that some of it would go into the reserve fund. And, and the legislature right now is um, pushing very hard to prevent districts from keeping reserves right. in any size. And, and I just want to really be really clear on how that's an allowable use, that it's not just saying we're taking it from ESSER and putting it into our reserves. Right. We are paying ourselves back for pandemic Correct. expenses. If you could just explain that, yeah. please, so, so we're so, really very clear. So if a district's intention was to just use ESSER funds and put those in their reserve account, that's not an allowable use of ESSER funds. Uh, but we as a district, in, in our ESSER plans, we did plan to use and, and supplant 
uh, ESSER dollars to assist with our expenditures as a district. So that is an, allow an allowable use as long as you can claim allowable expenditures through that supplanting. And so in the ESSER reports that you see on a monthly basis, you'll see uh, our ESSER expenditures increase uh, on, as a district on the supplanting side, as we have payroll expenditures, as we have utility expenditures, that we're beginning to charge back to those ESSER funds. So it's kind of a, a moving process, a moving target, uh, but, but we cannot claim ESSER dollars without having qualified expenditures to, to attach that to. Thank you for that, I appreciate that. Um, and I want to ask about, we got a lot of calls about library services tonight, and I would love to know more about the plan for that. Sure, so I'll start off, um, and then both Chief Stevens and maybe Chief Gossas, if we're re referring to some of the central positions. So there are, there are no cuts to librarians at campuses, and I think there was some confusion because we put together during the budget exercise that I thought you all had given us some positive feedback on with cards, and we were throwing things out there, all the things that was nothing to do with we're going to do this, but for instance, magnet transportation was one of those cards. And one of the other cards was librarians. Um, and so somehow that got from cards out to that's what we were doing. So that, that, is, that is not part of the proposal now, nor is it something that we're thinking about in the future. Um, the second issue is, um, and I, while I greatly appreciate uh, all of the information about librarians, from a compensation standpoint, librarians don't qualify for PPFT because they aren't in the classroom. The intent of PPFT and any other teacher-based um, salary increases is because of the issue that everybody knew was coming even pre-pandemic, which was a shortage of classroom teachers. So the idea, first and foremost, was to make sure that <coughs> teachers qualified for that particular incentive. So if we were to add librarians to a salary increase and move to equality, then we would need to add counselors and assistant principals and diagnosticians and any of the individuals who provide services to students, which obviously will put our budget in a very different place. So <clears throat> we always want to do what we can for everyone, but from an equity perspective, not an equality perspective, which is why equity work is very, very hard. We wanted to ensure that the market is driving teachers to be the most difficult place for us to staff. Knowing that, then we wanted to ensure that at least for this year, because remember, some of these additional cuts were to fund the salary increases at all, our lowest paid, so that our least should be first, our hourly employees, and then the next was based on who provide the most direct services to students. This isn't a competition or a who's better or a who's worse. It's, it's a recognition that it's the teacher in the classroom that is the most tightly correlated to our student academic success. And are all others tied? Absolutely. Everything I heard is true about librarians. What do we know about strong <clears throat> libraries and librarians are uh, correlated to high reading outcomes? Um, and with limited dollars for this year, we were prioritizing that in our preliminary budget. Of course, we serve at the will of the board. If the board wants us to not have a balanced budget and chooses to go in a different direction, then we can make other adjustments. But in terms of our why and in terms of what the goal was, the goal was to be ensure we had a balanced budget and find a way to fund the teachers and our hourly employees before we did anything else. And I also just wanted to clarify, even of the 632, 32. I want to remind everybody, there weren't 632 people in those positions. 
the vast majority of those were vacant. Another group of them were at campuses whose projections were had been staffed currently and projections are much lower for that for this next school year. And remember that's what leveling is also for. So if we project and our projections are off, then we move teachers from campuses that may have been under projection to campuses that have an overage of projection. But we do have to make assumptions and projections given the constraints. But I, I didn't want anyone to think there were actually 632 people, 32 hmm. people that the position was eliminated. That is not accurate. Um, and so, and any cuts at the campuses at the teacher level for next school year, again, no one right now, but for next school year came as a result of adjustments for enrollment. So what about a teacher that is at a campus and that all allocation isn't there? They will have priority placement, meaning no teacher in this district will not have a job next year because of leveling or budget or prioritization. That is not going to happen. We will have positions. They just may not all be, as is true for every single year. Kids don't come to us in exactly the way their a campus is currently staffed. We, we would like it to be that way, but it, it just isn't always that way. So I don't want any teacher, any contracted employee to think that they don't have a job for the 22-23 school year. It's really important. And I don't want librarians to think that there are any cuts at the campus level or even any thought that that's what we would be doing with librarians. Did we reduce the central support? Yes, I also reduced an assistant superintendent. I redu um, we reduced many layers um, that are at the central office because we did find either redundancy or some specific responsibilities that we can add to a different position. Again, I, there is not one part of any of the decision making that is pleasant. And I don't get to choose which parts of the job I have to do. It is very important long term that we have the quality services our students need and in order for that to happen we have to have a balanced budget long term. We haven't been able to do that. We're committed to doing that and we do serve at the will of the board. Thank you for that. So just to clarify, no library positions will be lost from campuses but the compensation expectation is changing from the way it's been done in the past? There have been no changes in librarian positions on campuses. And, but the way they're compensated is proposed so the way to change? The way they're compensated is not changing. It's not changing. Correct. Okay. So, so from the get-go, you need to understand that library compensation is very different from teacher compensation in the district. The only and it gets a little confusing. <laughs> the only time when it is the same is upon entry into Austin ISD. So we have a step scale, and our comp manual is online, so you can look at it. There is a step scale. When we hire a teacher from a neighboring district from outside of Austin ISD, we use that step scale for initial placement. When we hire a librarian from outside of the district, we use that for initial placement. That From that point forward, their compensation differs. And that is because our teachers are on PPFT. So they earn points and they earn base building compensation and so their trajectory of compensation is very different than a librarian's. A librarian's compensation is the step scale that you're probably all most familiar with, okay? So in that respect, for the coming up year, 22-23, if, if you go back to the slide that um, 
Chief Ramos had up, there was one that says we were adding $1,000 to the teacher's base pay. So that means at this point, we will have a different step scale for those two categories of employment. So the entry points will be different for those because we're trying to fill our teacher positions first. So that's, that's where the difference is. But we're not taking anything away from librarians. It's just that their step scale will remain the same. And, and they so, have generally been given raises in line with teachers. They've generally what? Been given raises at the same way. The general base pay raises have come at the same way as teachers generally in the past. So, so generally, like, um, it, it all depends on what the board has done, like, over time. So, like, last year, you did a 2% of midpoint for everybody. Okay. So that was all employee groups. It was also where we did the adjustment to the AP. Like, we did the whole AP scale last year which that included like your counselors and all that. So we did all the decompression and all that. So we pick out different scales to fix every year, but yes. So in the past we've written it in, in a, different, in a okay. different way because our need right now is really classroom teachers. That's helpful, thank you for clarifying. Um, I have another question. We've gotten a lot of email about instructional coaches. Mm -hmm. um, what is the, are they being eliminated everywhere? What is happening with that? And help me understand so, kind of how that aligns with our values. Yeah, yes. well, so first and foremost, the, the teacher in the classroom is where, again, we're ensuring that that becomes the priority fill. So anytime you create an instructional coach position, you're gonna pull people from a classroom and we're gonna create vacancies. So two of the items we discussed was when we were going to be committed to keeping six out of eight, there are some balancing that we have to do. So we would be looking at instructional coaches um, not being on campuses with six out of eight because the peer collaboration would be coming from the teachers that are involved in their planning time together. There are at schools from an equity perspective um, that receive Title I dollars that they can put together a plan that says because of their school performance and the needs of their students, they could present a plan to Dr. Mays saying, can I use my Title I money in a way that would have instructional coaches for the purposes of being equitable? Um, but by and far, um, the whole focus is on every time we create a position that isn't making, that isn't an assistant principal, that isn't a counselor, that the pay scale isn't different from what the classroom teacher is, we're gonna be pulling talent from the classroom. And so six out of eight created a $22 million um, continuous, that's a recurring cost when we do six out of eight. We know we're committed to keeping that. And so there's some other areas that we needed to ensure we stay focused on the classroom. But we didn't want to take that away from campuses that have access to additional funds in a title setting, which would then go back to an equity perspective. Now they could also choose, and that's why I say I give it, it's what does the campus want to do? A campus could select, we want lower class sizes, so we want more teachers in our title to use our title funds in that way. So we're going to allow them to put forth whatever data analysis from their needs assessment to present that. But yes, we did say that we would work on ensuring that the six out of eight was maintained and that we would reduce the instructional coaches that are not providing direct services to students. supports teacher well-being and so there will be some gaps because right now teachers have six of eight at secondary and instructional coaches on campus so how do we expect that to impact their efficiency their well-being the success of new teachers who might need that support more well new teachers would be assigned a mentor teacher we're revamping yeah. the mentor program um, we also don't have instructional coaches equitably placed throughout the district. Some schools had them, some schools didn't. In each of those cases, a campus replaced, they didn't get an additional FTE. They took a teacher out of a classroom 
and reclassified them as an instructional coach. Therefore, your classroom sizes go up. Then we hear from parents, why does this school have a much higher student to teacher ratio? Well, because the teacher allocation from a classroom was converted to an instructional coach position. So where's the student centeredness with regard to if we're going to do that, how do we know that the, everybody on the campus was involved in that decision making process and knowing how difficult it's been with regard to, you know, what's, our, where, what's our fill rate right now? Uh, right now we have a 97% fill rate. And so even at a 97.2% fill rate, it depends, again, I'm a parent, 97.2% doesn't really mean a whole lot to me if it's my child who isn't having the AP biology class teacher, right? And so we felt that it was necessary to stay in alignment with the more we pull teachers from the classroom, the impact that's going to have on the student to teacher ratio. And we already had gone back to what existed before. Because last year we lowered that to 28 to 1 in the classroom and in the guidelines. The previous year it had been 29 to 1. Given our constraints, we had to go back to 29 to 1. If we remove teachers from the classroom, then that 29 to 1 is going to go up. Also, thank you. And I have a question about um, funding for mental health, SEL, behavioral supports in the budget, um, central office and campus, multi-tiered systems of support and all the ways that we're addressing um, just all those needs we're hearing about from campuses, which I think is a student well-being issue, a teacher well-being issue, a teacher retention issue an academic issue, kind of how are we supporting that and, and what changes should we expect to see? And I'll let Ms. Casas talk about the student component on the employee side. Um, all of our employees have access through, yes, yeah, start yeah, all, with the all EAP. Of our employees, yeah, all of our employees have access to EAP. And so that is a service that they can call and get a scheduled appointment with a mental health professional. In addition, this year for the first time, we have a mental health professional on site that we actually have sent out, depending upon the situation. And she's available for anybody at central office or any employee in the district. And I think she's probably been at, I want to say over, I think it's been over 200 individuals that she has actually provided services for. But I could get the exact number and give you an update on what she's provided. So there's okay. two, for employees, there's two ways. It's the EAP system and then the actual person who can, so for instance, um, our very unfortunate circumstance at Bailey Middle School, um, she was at Bailey on Monday. Dr. Mays was there as well, um, but she was there helping individuals there. Mm -hmm. And there have been some others even just this week that she checked in on to see. So there is, it's a, a, a person who can actually go out in addition to if you need regular ongoing services. So it's almost like we have a crisis counselor is the way I would um, um, categorize her along with regular mental health through our EAP. So that would be for staff and that's available for all staff. And we do communication um, about the services, but it's another one that Trustee Anderson is always asking us, we need to do more so that more people know about it, and we agree we need to talk more about how, how, does, how does a staff member know that that's available? I don't think we've, we've got that communication piece down just yet. With regard to students. Thank you for that, and also with regard to students in ways that support our teachers who are dealing with these big crises and have the support they need. I would love to know more. Just to clarify, the EAP means Employee Assistance Program. It's a national, yes. like I think you all are connected nationally to those services that are available to all employees. Yeah, thank That's you right. for that. Yeah. So as we looked at every department, we tried to make sure that positions that had direct contact with students, that we were very careful about those positions. So in terms of our SEL specialist, we didn't cut any of those positions. Most of them are grant funded. But what we did do is within the, um, the social and emotional wellness and systems of support department, which was really big, is we tried to look at 
um, overlap and inefficiency. So we did cut several of the supervisor and coordinator positions and redistributed the, the, the work amongst the people that were left. The other big bucket was our MTSS coaches, our curriculum designers, and the academic leadership specialist. So our curriculum designers were in the academics, the MTSS were under the systems of support, and the academic leadership specialists were under school leadership. So we did put those all into one bucket, and all of those positions were eliminated, and we created a one position that was combined. And so these positions, because the goal is to finish writing the curriculum at the end of this year, so next year we'll be out of the writing uh, writing curriculum business and we're shifting into the coaching. So the positions that will let, that are left will do the revisions to the curriculum and they'll be assigned to the service teams with the school leadership. So they will be responsible for understanding curriculum implementation, interventions, coaching, um, so that we're supporting the schools directly. So we went from 46 positions to 23 positions um, between those three roles. So that's where the biggest one. So you hear we cut the MTSS positions, but we didn't cut the function. So between the positions that are left, they will be serving the district. Okay, and I hear coaching, but I hear, I'm hearing less about mental health support for students and behavior support in the classroom that goes with that. And so the coaching will be coaching teachers on having the skills on how to deal with the the events that are happening within the classroom. So not just academically, but also Correct. behaviorally. Yes. Okay, thank you for that. And then um, I, I got the message in the tracker about the college advisors would still love, this may or may not be the year, but would still love on my personal wish list is a dedicated college and career advisor at every high school that does solely that work. And I know Dr. Elizalde, you've talked about that interest as well. Um, so I just don't want that to fall off our radar, although the, I re recognize this year may not be the year. Um, and then I would love to really consider um, whether there may, may be some sources of income, particularly renting space in this building with the positions that have been eliminated, whether there may be, I don't know if anyone needs office space, but there are people who know more about real estate than I do, and if there's a source of income we might look into from vacant space in this building. Um, at this point, I would love to strongly consider that and just see how we might turn some of that back into services for our students. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee. Uh, trustees, other questions? Tr that you have? Yeah. Trustee Wagner. Um, I think you're already smiling. You know what I'm going to ask. <laughs> <laughs> I do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, Ms. Stevens, thank you for indulging my questions um, about librarians this week. Um, and Dr. Elizalde, I really appreciate the additional context you provided around the decision making. That was very helpful to understand how we came to this place. Um, with that, though, and weighing all of that, I think I'm still having a hard time reconciling the fact that our librarians are certified as well. They do serve a teaching function. Well, although it is not a classroom function, they still serve an instructional function within the student's day. And they serve all of our students on the campus. So there still is a large volume of students coming before them, even if it's not a dedicated group of 22 that they're with every single day. So with all of that in mind, it's it's hard for me to reconcile the fact that our teachers are able to avail themselves of the PPFT program as well as the $1,000 pay increase. Um, and I can see for our librarians and the discussions I've been having and hearing from them that I think in not moving forward with a $1,000 pay increase for our librarians as well as part of our team, including them within our teaching staff, um, since they don't have the opportunity to access PPFT, that we are in turn creating, we're sending a signal to our librarians that they're not as valuable to the instructional day. And um, I think what we are going to see as a result is, is an exodus of librarians um, when there are other opportunities in other districts available to them. And it seems like in terms of an overall budget impact, adding that $1,000 per librarian is probably not a sizable enough impact to our budget 
for the impact that we would then be having as a result, which would be trying to staff and source librarians and having a shortage in our district as a result. And that is this the situation I don't want to get into. I also want to make sure that our librarians um, feel that they are recognized and valued in our district. And I think by excluding them from that $1,000 bump, that that sentiment is there that they're not. And um, so I, I, I do want to ask if um, it would be possible to get cost um, for what it, we would be looking at to add them to that $1,000 increase. Um, and I'm not sure where that fits in terms of our budget drafting cycles and everything else, but if it would be possible just to see maybe in a, a board update what that additional cost would look like, I would very much appreciate that so we can review it for more consideration in our final budget. Trustee Wagner, we could certainly do that if you would also allow us to do a comparison of librarian pay structure with surrounding districts um, because maybe that would also even help um, just with a, an illumination of comparing where are our librarians with others and then and then we can bring what would it cost then to do uh, along with that comparison. Sure, I would very much appreciate that. And, and one last little footnote to that is in, in hearing from a couple of librarians, I'm realizing that there is the rumor mill is spinning fast um, amongst that group. And I think, and this is also something I know we discussed with Stevens, but just um, saying it for Dr. Elizalde's benefit is that um, the more I think we could get some accurate facts to them about as far as you know your pay scale is not changing, um, no, we're not replacing you with clerks, you know, those types of things I think are, are rumors that are are spinning up and I would really hate for somebody to choose to resign because they start to believe that that's truth um, rather than fiction. And I do appreciate that because mm -hmm. we've heard the same things on our end and, and we've seen the posts of, you know, replacing librarians and all of that kind of thing. So we can work on, we can work on that and do a direct communication to them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Trustee Wagner. Um, trustees, other questions? Uh, just a comment um, that as we're having this difficult conversation, or these, as we're trying to balance our books, do right by our folk, and get everything done, um, it will bear constant repeating. Um, I am steadfastly in favor of a balanced budget and understand that that is going to create challenges. And I guess as the superintendent has mentioned and others have recognized as well, um, we will have hard choices to make and they won't all feel very good. But if we have our vision clear and we're doing the best we can with the dollars that we have, um, I won't be happy but I will be satisfied. But a balanced budget, we, we, we cannot proceed without a balanced budget is, is a principle that I want to adhere to. Thank you, Trustee Foster. I, I have one, uh, trustees, any other questions? I have one comment and two questions. I guess first I should say good morning. <laughs> uh, my one comment is that all of these difficult conversations, including the fact that I think, and I'll just say, as, as an individual trustee, I do believe that we need to have that balanced budget and, and it is gonna be difficult in those choices, but, uh, but we need to make them. I, I just wanna comment that you see the alignment with a lot of the conversations and, and the difficult choices that, are, that you all have to make to make recommendations to us and why it's so important to have position control not be an Excel spreadsheet anymore. Because that's how you're gonna find efficiencies, that's how you're gonna make sure that you're not impacting human beings, but you're that impacting positions. And we can't forget that our, um, our students are how we grow the budget. And that's so important to make sure that they feel invited, included, and that they're a cent the center of this. And that position control is really, really key to that and so I appreciate you all working on that I appreciate our auditors recognizing that position <coughs> controls is really important because that's the only way we're going to make sure that we we get it right um, or, or closer to being right the two questions are pretty uh, quick um, and they're really for you Chief Ramos uh, 
uh, could you just illuminate for the board the, the cash days on hand? Because I think that's another indicator of a, of a good stewardship and financial management. And just wondering what the cash days on hand was. So TA does rate us based on the cash on hand that we have in reserves. Uh, to reach the maximum points in our first rating, which is our financial rating, uh, that would require 90 days of cash on hand. Uh, with the 20% uh, uh, board, local board policy that we have, uh, that translates to about 67 days that we currently have right now. That's just on the reserves. On the reserves. On our reserve, 20%. Okay. And that also affects our bond rating as well. Correct. And then um, you were talking earlier about tax rates and, and lowering of tax rates. I don't want to get back into that conversation. But, but I do just want to... The, our public to understand that when we're dealing with another related issue, which is our bonds, our potential bond elections in the future, our current bonds, that our interest in sinking or what's called the INS of the tax rate, as opposed to the MNO, the maintenance and operations tax rate, what's the percentage that we get to keep for the INS tax rate? So, as far as fund balance, or in, in other words. It, I'll say it in a different way. Is it, is it tr isn't it true that we get to keep 100% of the INS tax rate, which stays in our community, that goes to paying for bonds when we invest in our, uh, as compared to the maintenance and operation, which is where the recapture uh, requirements are? Correct. At. So we, we get to keep 100% of our INS tax rate revenue that comes in. Uh, any bonds that a district passes, 100% of those funds stay with the district. Uh, none of that goes back to the state. Yeah, thank you for making sure that our public understands that. And I think you will continue to educate them on the difference between the, the interest and in sinking tax rate portion and the maintenance and operations tax, tax rate. Uh, it's really important for our community to understand how much of that we get to keep and what, what we're required to give to the state. Um, trustees, are there any other questions? I think we're done. Thank you very much for being here. Thank so this ends the section on information reports from the administration, and at this time, we will now move into the preview of the upcoming regular board agendas. This will, this will allow the public and trustees the opportunity to review the agenda items that will be considered for a vote at the next regular board meeting. And AIC staff is available to answer any questions for tonight, I mean this morning's preview. We will begin this morning with item seven, which is the agenda preview for upcoming academics and curriculum items. Trustees, are there any questions on these items, including an MOU between UT Austin, the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board, at Austin ISD for advice, Texas College Advising Corp program, TEAK certification, any questions? If not, I'm gonna move to section uh, in item eight, business and finance. And please note that the administration is pulling item 8.4, which will be moved to May's board meeting. meeting. Uh, and that would be the interlocal agreement with the city of Austin for early childhood American rescue plan um, ARPA program. So trustees, are there any questions on the remainder of the items on the TASB risk management, fleet equipment? the annual financial audit or monthly financial reports? Okay, if not, I'm gonna to move to section, to the next section, which is item nine, community engagement. And trustees, are there any questions on the one item for naming processes for the new middle school in Northeast Austin? Trustee Foss? Questions? No, okay. All right, trustees, and then I'm gonna to move to the next section, which is item 10, facilities. Any questions on that interlocal agreement between AISD and the Travis County Healthcare District, otherwise known as Central Health? Okay, if not, I'm gonna to move to section 11, human resources. So trustees, are there any questions on Item 11 of the agenda preview for proposed trust, trustee Ashy and then trustee saying, sorry, I keep it's on the saying. Same. <laughs> it's the same question. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm so sad I'm raising my hand. I'm so sad, um, but so happy. So it's an honor to be able to raise my hand and ask a question. Um, 
Um, my question is on the um, 11.4 on the employee health plans um, for the 2023 plan year. And um, I was just wondering if somebody could explain, and I apologize for not having the um, definition of the word banded. Um, if you look at the, the when it, when I was looking through the pieces and it talks about the plans under the employee only, when you go across and it says current rates and it says banded, I just didn't know what that meant. Right. Which one are you on? I'm sorry. I'm looking at the AISD health plan option rates. Um, which one is that? Agenda preview item 11.4. Yes. Thank you. And it's, um, I think it's option. It was oh. The, Oh, banded. Okay. Yes. I see where you're looking at now. Thank so, you. yeah. So what we do is, um, there are certain scales based on income. And so if you like on that, it's salary band one. So if you make under 40,000, then, then that's what your proposed rate would be. Am I making sense? And so each question. band is based on a salary band, okay. a salary range of the employee. Okay. And um, is that that is that what the individual pays per, over the year? Yes. Yeah, so like, so if you look at your proposed rates, mm -hmm. so those are your monthly rates. So if I was if I was an employee that was. Um, let me get, just take the top one. I'm a Seton only PPO, and I am covering my myself and my spouse, and I make under forty thousand. See where that's right now? We have thirteen people in that group. If you go straight across, then you will see under that what their monthly amount is to cover their spouse, because we we pay for the employee side of it. Okay, can you say that one more time? Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I really think if you could just I'll almost say it one more time again, I think I got you, but I just. Okay, so, so okay, Jacob's gonna put it up on the screen because that might be easier to follow because I'm, I'm following it with my finger on oh, the paper. Right, okay. Yeah. So the where it says proposed rates, that's right, the that's dollar your amount. monthly amount. So if you look down this chart, on the far left side, those are the different insurance options available to our employees. And the and the numbers that are over here are the num the number of employees that are currently enrolled in that plan. That is correct. Okay. And then we band we salary band our employees. So depending on your salary, then the rates, the vary. rate differs. Mm -hmm. And so the top for the employee only, that's what the district pays. Correct. And then when, but when you move down and add a spouse, that's when the employee that would come out of their paycheck. Right. So those would become employee costs. So employee and child is like $444 a month just to cover like my children. So then employee and family, and that's in Seton only plan. So as you move down, the nationwide high deductible plan is the next one. And then the bottom one, if you look at the very bottom one, that is the totally free option for our employees. It's the HSA Seton plan. So if I'm an employee, and you'll see we have 3,910 employees in that plan, every month there is no cost to them and their health care is covered. Got it. That makes so sense to me. That is the plan that is totally zero cost for the employee. Understood. Thank you. I appreciate that explanation at um, twelve thirty in the morning. Okay. Yeah, and it just yeah, it's kinda like it's a little weird on the chart, but Yes. It's just that it was. I just couldn't quite fake, figure it out in my head. So but, thank you for that. But I, I want to go back up to the first one just to clarify for you. In Seton only in PPO, if I'm an employee and that's the one I'm enrolled in, I pay 
thirty-five dollars a month if I'm under the forty thousand. That's what I was got it. Uh, yes. yes. So that part isn't. So it's the only the very bottom plan that is of no cost. Right. The zero 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 uh -huh. cost for an employee is this very bottom plan, and then, like, there where Jacob has it highlighted, those are the monthly amounts by the different salary bands. Got the it. total. Yes. The total table there is continuous. So what we're showing in the portion on the left-hand side is how many folks are in each of those bands, but the cost, if I'm just for me under Seton only PPO and I make less than 40,000, I'm gonna pay $35, $35 a, month. a month. Got it. That's what I'm gonna pay as the employee. Right, yeah. The district's going to pick up the additional cost. If I'm an employee only and I make between 40,000 and right under 55,000, I'm gonna pay 55,000. I'm 50, okay, never mind yeah, that. Yeah, 55. $55 a month. Got it. And then from 55,000 to 74,999, it's $80, and anyone above 75,000 pays 115. Got it. And so the same is true for you, we have to go all the way over to the right to actually look at what is that person paying mm -hmm. because those first numbers confused me. These are just number of individuals. So right. like if we wanted to know, well, how many people do we have in a particular category? Plan. Which I did not understand those were people. Those are, yes. those are people. Yes, and that was what was confusing me. But yes, now so I understand. Are, those are the actual number of our employees. Got it. And then I'm going to ask one very random question that I'm a little sad that I actually know this question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Are we still on a self-funded plan? Yes, we are. Okay. Um, we are currently on a self-funded plan, and the district is does a $500 contribution per employee per month. Got it. Thank you. You're welcome. Tr trustee, okay. you, you, you sure? It was a similar question. Similar. <laughs> Thank you. We'll work on the chart. <laughs> Trustees, any other questions? Okay, so this will end our regular agenda preview. We will now recess the open meeting at 12.40 a.m. and move to executive session. I'm sorry. We will now recess the open meeting at 12.40 a.m. on Friday, April 15th and move to executive session pursuant to Texas Government Code sections 551 551.074, 551.072, 551.073, 551.087, 551.076, and 551.071. For our viewers at home, this concludes our live broadcast, and when we're finished with the executive session, we will briefly return to open session to formally adjourn the meeting. The adjournment will be re Re I'm sorry, the adjournment will be recorded and be included in all replays of tonight's meeting. Again, thank you for joining us and have a good, e a good uh, morning. Thank you. <laughs>